Gerbo, escúchale, pero. Gerbo. Ya queda, ya pesa su hijo. Από το λάπτοπ δεν πέσει ο ήχο. Όχι, από το λάπτο δεν παίζει προς τα έξω, δεν παίζει τα ηχεία. Έλα λίγο. Σπίκερ. Πού δεν παίζει, κάτω, κάνω τέστη έξω. Δεν ακούγεται κάτι. Τα έχει. Βάζει προς ένα. Ένα, δύο, τρία, τέσσερα. Δεν μπορεί να σταθεί αυτό. Θα πάμε το πάει. Τεστ, καλησπέρα σας. Ναι, αλλά δεν το δίνει. Δεν το δίνει στο ζούμο. Το φέρνει στο ζούμο, αφού έρχεται. Τεστ, ένα, δύο, τρία, τέσσερα. Καλησπέρα σας. Το κάνεις το πόδι. Ναι. So good morning, everybody. Can you hear me well? I guess I hope. Uh, welcome again. Yesterday we were missing two persons. If they arrived late, please contact uh, someone from the lock, Mirella Harsula, over there to get your badges and uh, bag and all that stuff. So we can start. Uh, there will be two welcoming addresses. Uh, we are honored to have with us the president of the Academy of Athens, Professor Stamatis Krimizis, who will be the first one to address a welcoming address. Good morning. Uh, it's a Great pleasure to welcome you to the European Astronomical Society's conference, The Nature and Dynamics of Structures Observed in Galactic Discs, organized by the Research Center for Astronomy and Applied Mathematics of the Academy of Athens, a center that uh, we Academy is very proud of. We are particularly pleased that the workshop is part of the HERA series supported by the Wilhelm and Elsie Heraus Foundation, which aims to provide a platform for early career scientists to engage in collaborative interactions, devise research projects, gain a comprehensive perspective, and initiate international partnerships. We are particularly pleased that this workshop um, is, uh, is intended to transfer the knowledge of one generation of research to the next 
And it's a fundamental process that ensures the advancement of science. In this respect, uh, understanding the state of the art in a field is essential as it serves as the foundation for expanding humanity's knowledge to new horizons. The Academy of Athens is, uh, symbolizes the continuity of scientific knowledge from antiquity to the modern era, as we all know. And we are pleased to host this uh, important activity uh, in the knowledge transmission of uh, galactic dynamics within our historic building. As you know, the supervisor of the research center of astronomy, uh, Professor Kodopoulos, is one of the pioneers in this research area, having introduced orbital theory in the 60s and linking the, its results to the observed structures of spiral galaxies. You, the young researchers, have been chosen from many applications to participate in this workshop due to the impressive results that you have, your research has already produced. This is the perfect opportunity for you to learn from experienced lecturers to, who share your current research, form collaborations, form collaborations and exchange methodologies with your peers. I wish you a highly productive uh, conference and much success in your research, leading to the next breakthroughs in the field. You're the future uh, experts of galactic dynamics in Europe. Welcome again, and thank you very much. Now, Professor Kontopoulos will also welcome you to this conference. I am happy to welcome you to this conference organized by the Academy of Athens on the dynamics of galaxies in conjunction with the observations of galactic disks. Our research center for astronomy has a long tradition in this field. I could say that this topic started many years ago when I visited for the first time Stockholm in 1956. In Stockholm, there was Professor Bertil Lindblad, who was a pioneer in galactic dynamics, in particular, he was the first to propose a density wave theory for explaining the spiral arms of the galaxies. My own interest was in three-dimensional orbits of stars in a galaxy. This topic was not developed at that time. There was very, very little work. So I used the computer of the Stockholm University to calculate just two orbits in the vertical direction, perpendicularly to the plane of symmetry of the galaxy. And these calculations were very, very astonishing. In fact, people at that time expected that the orbits of stars were chaotic and ergodic. But instead of that, we saw that the orbits filled like least as you figures with curvilinear boundaries. And this observation 
led later to the development of the theory of the third integral. He, the work continued in Greece and the, a group of people worked with me for many years on topics related to dynamic, dynamics of galaxies. And there were many hundreds of papers on this subject. Uh, but nevertheless, although such work has been done, there are still many problems to be solved and many new observations require theoretical explanations in this field. We want to, to work and we have worked in the systems from elementary particles where we use quantum mechanics to stars, to galaxies, and to the universe, the whole universe that uh, is uh, uh, considered as a dynamical system that is expanding forever. I'm happy that uh, there are many young people that are interested in this field. And I'm glad to see in the program of the present uh, conference, many interesting topics that I hope will provide new impetus in th this field. Uh, Besides the young people, there are also established older scientists that will give review talks and provide their expertise to the younger people. And I'm happy that many people from many countries of the world, in particular from Europe, have shown interest and continue to work on topics of this kind. So I hope and I wish that this conference will provide new interactions and new uh, collaborations between the various people. And that reminds me of the very, very first conference in dynamical astronomy that was organized in Greece by the International Astronomical Union 1974 and uh, combined the expertise of people working on mathematics, celestial mechanics, and stellar dynamics at that time. With these thoughts in mind, I welcome you to this meeting of the Academy of Athens, and I wish you every success in the meeting and every continue, successful continuation of their research work. Thank you. very much, Professor Kontopoulos. Uh, then uh, we can uh, start with uh, the regular program. So Andy, 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 you should take, yeah, yeah, please come here. You will be the chair of the first session. <laughs> <laughs> okay, okay, well, uh, well, of course we start with a review talk now. We start with a review talk now, so it is not much to, to do with that, but, uh, just after the coffee break, let me tell you that uh, uh, we will take the picture or the conference picture at the end of uh, Leah's talk. So before the coffee break, just outside here, the stairs at the entrance of the academy. So when Leah finishes, we go outside, we, uh, take the photo, the picture of the conference, and then we 
uh, continue with uh, the coffee. So, okay. The idea is that you first hear a lecture or a summary of something exciting by our senior scientists. And then you tell us the really exciting, fresh new work what, on which you are working. And so the first one, I'm really happy that Elia Anatanasula is here. As she arrived yesterday and then finally she made it to the hotel. Um, it was already late, so you couldn't see her yesterday, but she's now here. And she will tell us a little bit about n-body simulations of this galaxy. So, Leah. Το μικρόφωνο εδώ είναι. Το μικρόφωνο στο χέρι. Θέλετε να μιλήσετε σε αυτό. Ένα, δύο. Ένα, δύο. Τι, ακούγεται. You want to use this one or you want to sit on the podium? You just put it there and I'll decide and it might change. Okay. Okay, well, hello everybody. I'm Lia Tanasula. It says E, I know. I know it says E, but it's Lia Tanasula. Can you hear me like that? That's better? Here is still no. Oh la la. Yes. Okay, well, I'll do my best. Yes. Okay, I'll do my best. Anyway, what I will talk about is end body simulations and what they can teach us about disk galaxies, what can they show us, what, where can they lead to. So this is my uh, Okay, well, this is my name. This is where I work. And these are my close collaborators for the work that I will be talking about here. Um, so before I start, I'm going to talk about aber an, an aberration. That is, okay, is that better? Thank you, thank you, panel. So there is one thing and that is called bulges. Bulge, well, we all know from English simply that bulge means something that protrudes. I mean, that's, and then uh, the bulges, they, they can, one can see them well in galaxies, but there is more than one type and that's what starts all the mess. They, they, there's what you call classical bulges, what is, you call boxy peanut or an X bulges, what you can call disky pseudo bulges. Once you've said all that, the beginning of the mess is really clear. So I need definitions to know which one is what is which. And I also need to try and uh, get the some in one way and some in the other. So what is, uh oh, 
sorry. Yes. Okay, so one possible thing, one possible well-known bulge is that of what we call the Sombrero Galaxy. Now that is, ah, this thing is really something, I can't get it to, ah, there it is. So this is the Sombrero Galaxy and this is the disk and this is the bulge. Now this is a nice clear bulge, it's like a ball and you see that there is, here you are at the centered, it's centered. Now, this is the, as I said, there are many more than one types of bulges. There is this one. If you look at this one, it is more interesting. It, well, I, I'm not against the other one, but this is even more interesting. And you've got here a Nix. And that is this part, this part. And it is, people will call it boxy peanut X uh, bulge. Well, it isn't a bulge. If you looked at this, how the, yes, there we are. So the, uh, this, it is this. And if I take it, which I can do in the simulations, and turn it around, you immediately will see that it is simply the bar seen the wrong way. Well, the wrong way, seen in a different way. And if you look at the, this for our galaxy and look into another again, then all you see is a box. So all this is one name. Now, the, the definition, it, there are many definitions, and there is one definition which is the other one, this one. Yes. Okay, thank you. Sorry? Oh. So this thing. Do you hear me better now? Or? Yes, well, thank you. So the other kind, the other definition is simply here. We have, here's photometry. I'm doing photometry of an object. And this is the magnitude. And this is the radius. And what you see is if you plot it, as a, so the magnitude as a function of radius, you see something like that, but it doesn't do, go nicely away. All it does, it moves up. So the easy way again of... Okay, so this thing is the main body and this one is an extrapolation of this thing, of this part. And this one we can then call a bulge. So already yet, an, already yet another uh, definition for bulges. And see here in the same thing. Right, now with all that, I do remember there was a third type which we could still call a bulge. And yes, and so the idea is the boxy peanut bulges, now we know what they are. Yes, I count any less than that panel. Um, the boxy peanut bulges are parts of bar, so away they can go. And, um, there is still the disc-like bulges. Now, what's the disc-like bulges? There is material that is in some, very near the center in, in something which is like the, in this area. So very, very, very small. This is the bar. So this is small. And if you come, this is my very old work in 92. 
If you come to the something like that hydrodynamics with this kind of uh, morphology, then you will see that this thing makes holes here and there. And there, they're very interesting nowadays. I can't open uh, a, a journal without finding something about these, these things. So, so much for that. And now let's go to disks. We saw some things about those bulges. Uh, I, you were forewarned now that you shouldn't be that you should try and find out what bulges that you're looking at before doing anything else. And then the next thing I'm going to do now is to talk about disks because all the perturbations, fine, we can look, understand them in the one way or another, there are perturbations of the disk. So there has to be a disk, it's necessary. So there we are. So there are two types of simulation. I, I think n-body simulations are really a very, very strong tool and practically 99% of what I'll be talking about has been obtained with this tool. So there is two possibilities, two types of n-body simulations. So there's the cosmological simulations and the dynamical simulations. There are some very good advantages for the cosmological and some, I would say perhaps I'm biased, but, but the, uh, they're equally good from the dynamical point of view. So for the cosmological, we can get advantages. Well, they have, they can tell us about the environment. And so you put the galaxy in the environment and you get a result. That can never be done for dynamical simulations. So unless you make a model of the, of the surroundings and then use that to do the rest of your work, but it is not trivial. Anyway, so these cosmological simulations have this big advantage, which is that they can say something about the environment before starting the, the, the actual work. And then the other very important um, advantage of the cosmological simulations is that they are number, there are a number of large high quality and body simulations already publicly available. There are many of them. So all you have to do is say, I want that one, I'll take it. Well, more or less, but I mean, it is, you don't have to do all the work to get all the galaxies and get the calculations you want. You go right away to the, to the calculations. So this is a big advantage. Now, dynamical simulations also has advantages. Some of the advantages are here. You can build the initial conditions so as to better understand a specific question. Now, all of us will have a question to answer, that's why we're here. Ah, we've got perhaps many, many, many questions to answer, but this is a, the way to, to get information from the end body simulations is to get the proper initial conditions. That is, you find something which, when it works, will give you an answer to your problem and not to the neighbor's problem. Okay, then the other is that there is, I believe, I believe that you can very easily couple the, the, um, the, a better resolution to a very large number of simulations. I will show you when it comes to what I've done. Uh, Yes, so, so now we want to look at one thing, I'll bet you whatever you want that, and I, now I know the answer, so it, it's not fair to say I bet, but when I started the whole thing, I bet it with the whole world that you can take two galaxies, throw them in the, at each other and get wonders. So let's see it a little bit. So 
I will take the most difficult case, which is non-minors, because minors, any way you can make, you just put them under the carpet and that's it. But this is not what I want. And so I will just do the most difficult thing, the non-minor ones. <laughs> the non-minor ones. And indeed, uh, the tumorist, Aller and uh, whoever, so it is tumor in tumor in 1972, and then the first tumor in 1977 made models, and they made these models. So you have galaxies like this, or like this, or whatever other you can find and enjoy doing. So they went to a conference like here, and they were all happy, and they said, well, look what I found. And Gerard de Vaucouleur raised his hand and said, oh, no, after a collision, a car is a wreck, not a new type of car. So what you're doing is a wreck, not a car. Oh, well, of course they weren't happy, but that was life. They realized that they realized that they needed gas because gas is one of the most important elements. Of course, what work was done before gas got into the business is still very important, but I, without putting in the gas, I think you're more or less out of the game. So if we take two galaxies, two spiral galaxies with gas, and bang them around each other, then what can happen is this. And you have observations and simulations. And here is the, the S, the, the S means spiral with gas and spiral with gas. And what comes out is a galaxy with a small disk component, or at best a lenticular, small lenticular, of course, or just an extra inhabitant to the Green Valley. We're not there, that is not it. That's not what we want. What I want to show you is how much you can do for the whole thing. Yes, there we are. So in order to do, to get something which the previous people didn't do, it means I have to add something new. Otherwise, what's the point? Everybody would have done it already. So the improvements we gradually included was to include gas. That was important, but then other people had done it already. Change the self-formation as function of that and get feedback and cooling appropriate recipes. Whether that is really true, I'm not going to put my hand in the fire, but yes, that, that, that's the idea, that's what we want. Uh, so you will get with that the age of the stars and the gas flow. Now there's initial conditions to be had from this. Uh, no pre-existence of a fully developed disk with disk structures. That is the initial condition that I get. That is, you don't have a disk because I want to show that the mess I will make by throwing two things together will not be a mess, will be a nice, clean disk. Now, if I start with a nice, clean disk, you'll lose all interest. You say, oh, I started with this uh, disk and you found and you refound it and thank you very much go back home and so it is not true i want to start with as little disk as possible actually with no disk if i could if i can and this is the case here i am doing it without that then i included chemical evolution so that this work is based on chemodynamics and the reason is because they can give us extra constraints and they will give, I will use 12 chemical elements, but I could very easily come up with more. It's trivial. There's just simply loops to be done over and over again. Nothing difficult about it. But 
the whole thing gets more and more, um, makes the thing slower and slower and slower. So we can't have too much because then you know, there's nothing to be done. You don't finish. Uh, so, okay, you conclude this kind of AGN. That's the other improvement. And then I have what could be called very high resolution. The number of, par of particles is between 5 million and 30 million per galaxy. And I have, uh, well, uh, what you see here. So it is not trivial to do that kind of stuff. A more complete comparison of simulations results with observed galaxy properties. So what I do, I look into the literature. Well, I do. We do. It's a group, as you saw in the beginning. Um, I, I looked at the, at the literature and found information for all these things. And also, I look at the cosmological simulation. Please, what do I can, I can do? So, and that is one thing which actually do give a boost because you, you want to compare and make these correctly. Now comes the big point. I did one thing, one important thing, if only this, and that is in, I include a hot gaseous halo. We know now this hot gaseous halos exist. We have been fa they have been found. I'm very happy about it because I spent two years hoping for them. And that was before this actually came out so well. And, um, and that is essential for everything you, I'm, I'm going to do. And more information you can find in these three papers. Yes. So uh, before going into the bang of the two galaxies, let me take a, an easier point, and that is just one galaxy. So I'll, I'll simulate a proto galaxy, and I, it's, which has been grown in isolation. And for example, that galaxy, but here I have other numbers. Here I have. MDF is simply my catalog. That is, uh, what in which catalog I'll take this particular initial conditions and make it. And one 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 is the parameters, the free parameters. So it's what kind of um, galaxies I'm going to make with these simulations. So this is what they come out like. So it is those two galaxies, 732 and 778, that bang into each other, the green line and the red line. And then here, once they are near each other, they spend the time nicely quarreling. Sorry, they spend their time nicely quarreling. And, uh, and then you see them here. Now, I also look at the same time into the density as a function of radius. And this is what I find, and you'll, those of you that are observers and know these things, I know that it is a fair reproduction of what is the observations. Now, there also is, uh, oh, uh, this is the, uh, this is the, the part the, for the halo. Then there is, the, sorry, this is the, the rotation curve. Uh, so to simplify, you hear a lot about rotation curves, you become, uh, rotation expert after this afternoon, but here what I will do is the circular velocity, so it's the rotation curves as a function of radius, and I will take a, a model with a halo with stars, this is the red lines, and then I will take um, the halo, which we said with the blue, and then the gas, which is this line here, the black line, so I shift it just to see what's going on, and I put it here and add this, this, and this, and lo and behold, what I find is the total velocity, which is quite nicely flat to with what we can get. I mean, it's not uh, uh, more uh, flatter, I think, would be technical. So 
I noticed this, I have about 600 simulations now for this game. And I did it for all of them. And I found that indeed they did, they are flat. So flat as one would have wanted. Yes. Uh, now we continue and we look at the properties of the simulated Propto galaxy, the one which was born in the previous slide, and look at it in simulation, in, uh, sorry, in isolation. And this is the density, or rather the log density, as a function of radius. And we find that the galaxy starts from, so we start with a dark matter halo and a hot gas halo per galaxy. So you start with, a, the galaxy is simply a sphe two spheres, one full of dark matter and the other one full of hot gas. And later on, we will take that for another galaxy, but this time is one galaxy only. And so I, this is the center of that galaxy, which, I, which will happen. And you see that the, uh, the, the, uh, the log density, you have first this, then this, then this, then this, then this. And what you see here is the, the in, you start from the centers outwards. So it is inside out formation, which is rather pleasant. And then, uh, it becomes uh, gas rich and it becomes more settled. That is, it doesn't make, uh, I mean, what you have to do, this is in 2D only, but what you can do is go back to your to 3D, which is much nicer, and go around the center, and then you'd still grow inside out, but it will be making something much more interesting to compare with. Anyway, here it is because I haven't got all that stuff here. So we all go in this way. We go half a giga year, one, two, five, and 10 giga years. Uh, so they become also at each of these uh, times, they become less gas rich in the beginning than in, than in the beginning. So you have a very gas rich to poorly gas uh, non rich. And then more settled as you go from inside out. So you don't have any difficulties uh, to, uh, to, to do that. So now, the key feature to all I did was the hot gas. Yes, thank you. So, so the um, now we will try and see the effect of the hot gas in the halo. Because as I told you, this was my main, my main playing card, my main work, my main input. I we get one initial conditions, and I will get the same exactly initial conditions with one difference. The rest of it is a copy. Exactly. I just took from the computer the file and put it there. And then what I did, the one case I have with a gaseous halo, and sorry, without a gaseous halo, and the other one with gaseous halo. So I'm going to try those two with the hot gas in the halo, and the, uh, and the hot gas without the halo. We try it, let's go. 
Without the halo, this is what the disk does. It's here, the disk, and this is the XY view, and this is the vertical view. And you see very well that it is confined to a very narrow region. That is, if this were true, then the galaxies would be all measly small things. And it's not the case. So this was very nice for my theory. And this is the other way. And you will notice also that edge on, there are some galaxies out there. See, I was told that there are some galaxies like that, but they're very rare. Okay, now let's do ex this thing with exactly the same model, exactly the same thing, no changes except for the gaseous halo. So I try that and I find the XY view and the, uh, the Z part. And now it starts getting interesting because this is a very normal um, uh, extent for, for, for galaxies. And indeed, you can get from here to about here. I stopped here because otherwise it wouldn't be very nice comparing. But it can get to from very small to very big, which is very nice. Like I stopped at the size of the real galaxies, which we see. And then, uh, so this is it, it's big. And then you notice here, there is something like a fat oval which if you were really very brave, you would be taking them as a bar. So you would tell me, oh, look at this bar. Well, no, sorry, it's, it's, an, it's, 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 it's a bolt, it's a little thing, whatever you want to call it, but it's not a bar. Right. Okay. On the other hand, this one, you can look at it here. It has an inner part, it has an outer part, it has a ring around it. This one is the uh, ANSI, and there's another ANSI here. So what would you like more? This is life. And then you've got spirals here and spirals there. And if you go further out, there is um, such also spirals here in the outer parts. Now you look also at this thing. And this is the edge on view, of course. And you will see that the, uh, this looks like a pretty clear edge on galaxy observed. And I want to show you one thing only. Yes, this thing, probably not a terribly good thing, but any, here it is. And this is the uh, observation. And you can see that this is this and not this. It doesn't go like this. Right. So back again. Yes. And now look at this. Look at this. Here, if you looked at, the, if you Fourier transformed this area, you would find a huge M equals two. Now you go, get on outwards and you continue here and here, and you still have a glorious M equals two. And you continue, you continue and get into the green part. And now, well, it's not really M equals two. It's got an M equals two component, yes. But you've got an here, part here, a part here, a part here, a part here. And then you can get some more out of these, but I haven't plotted them. So the interesting part out of this one is that there is spiral structure in the, uh, in, there is a reasonable bar, I'd say more than reasonable, a good bar, and much better than this, you get a re, uh, a, um, also a, a ring, you get the spirals, you get a lot of things which you wanted to starting with. And you, but you notice also one other thing. This was an M equals two if you fully analyzed it. This was still an M equals two, but with a better M equals four here. And then here you get with a one, two, three, four, three and four. And if I went further out, you would find a bit more than four. 
So further out you go, more the number of arms. That is very nice. I hope you saw that this thing, the, the reason it has this possibility is that the spirals are swing amplified. If they're swing amplified, this M's go up and you will do it, uh, at, well, I don't know, I, I'll show you in the end how it goes, but it is swing amplified. And that's, I think it's the first clear M equals increasing um, in, in, in for the galaxies. Okay. Um, then another thing. Uh, the um, so so far it's coming out with really good results. Uh, I also calculated the bulge to total, and by bulge I mean classical bulge. That's why I want I wanted to draw you through all the other different kinds of bulges so that you don't get into here a bar. And so we have, we have the classical bulge and we get the ratio of it to the total baryonic mass, uh, not baryonic, stellar mass. And you see that it gets numbers which are here, which were very much appreciated by people doing cosmological simulations because they're rather nice numbers. That's roughly what we would like. Okay. Right. Now this is a mess. So I'll take you slowly through the mess. Okay. So let's think of the evolution. Things evolved in astronomy, particularly in the galaxies part. And I will very, very simply see that as the galaxy moving. Yes. So you will, we will start from this the kind of thing. Ah, by the way, I hear you hear you will notice a grid. The grid is one kiloparsec by one kiloparsec size. It's for, in order for you to get an idea how big one thing is or how small one thing is. So here you are, you start like this with a very small, you wouldn't say it like if you looked at it, but look at this. It's just a couple of, couple of kiloparsec and not even. Uh, then this is a little bit later, which has also been smaller here, therefore bigger here, and that continues. We come here later on and later on. Now, how did I get those pieces? Why did I, did I take an axe and go point? No, I didn't. And so what I did, in fact, was to look at the physics of each state. That is, we go from here to here to here, not randomly, but because of what happened in that time bracket. So I play back the story and I look at the things as a function of time and say, the two galaxies coming, at some point they start interacting. So that is something interesting, I say T1. Then they continue and they merge. T merge. And they go out to each other because 
have emerged completely, and then you call it another team. And so you have the whole stories. There is, I, I calculate this by looking very carefully every step. So I have one, two, three, four, five steps. And do the calculations for each one of those. And therefore it's clean. It's not something where I cry and cram things in. This thing is clean because I've taken the right part of the history to down here. And you will look here, for example, uh, the, here is the last one. It's youngest of all. It is gas rich and it is, and it got secular revolution and it got all those things to evolve with. So it makes the thin disc, it makes the bar, it makes the spirals, the rings, and the disc is suitable. All the beauties we looked at at the very beginning. And here you are. You also get this one. So you go like this, each kind relatively clean. You move from this, which is non-existent in, in astronomy, basically, in observations, I mean. And then you go this way, and that way, and that way. So what happens this, in this part is the oldest stars. It is, they are gas for those stars. They went through what Donald Lyndon Bell called violent relaxation. And it was very nice calculations. If you want to have a great afternoon, take this and, and read it. And so this thing on top of it is merger driven. So you've had the merging and you go to somehow, I don't give a word about this. It could have been here, it could have been here. I can't tell. And so these are the oldest stars, they're gas poor, the classical bulge. Of, they come to a classical bulge. There's a violent relaxation and two proto galaxies by doing the two proto galaxies. As we saw the proto galaxies before. Now there is, let's forget for the moment this and go to this end. Now here, we will of course have the youngest stars that then their uh, growing will be secular. There will be this, uh, so that we have the slow secular revolution. They are gas rich and you've got all these goodies to think about. So this is, if you look at it carefully, it's more or less the result of everything. Yes. So what are we doing this to this? From this scenario, which I've showed you so far, the thick disk forms earlier and it's considerably shorter time scale. And this is a good point. It should have been that way. Then there's a distinction between the star formation in in the parts before the merging and that afterwards, as required by chemistry. So it fulfills that thing from chemistry. And that is, for example, the methods of Chapini, Matteucci and Graton. Sorry for the pronunciation, I don't know how to do it. Um, but there is a continuous sequence, not a sum of separate entities. Now, what I will do, I will take the previous picture, now I'll be Yes, remember there were five of those and I will take these five now and calculate, do some photometry and calculate the density as a function of radius for each one of the five bins. For example, what I can say here is that the first bin um, has a the Cersic profile with one single uh, value, not second one. So this is one single value case. And then as you go on, you notice there's a bend, 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 and in the end, this thing. Now, why in the end, this thing? That is now pretty obvious. These things are the spirals, and therefore there's got bumps to go through for things. And so we have this kind of thing, and here it is what the average would be. So we can now 
uh, look at things not only from one side, which is the the uh, the mass, but the velocity as well. And we're more or less there because the next thing you would like to know, or if you don't like to know, I do, it's circularity. That is, are these, I, how, I, I have a simulation, I pull out a particle, look at it and say, oh, how circular was this, this particular case? How circular was this galaxy? Well, that will give a, the value of the circularity it's a very convenient but pretty messy case. And it was actually not my finding, unfortunately. It was um, uh, Simon White and somebody else who now I forget. And uh, Almer. Almer is the second part. And you want to check its circularity. And for that, you check the angular momentum of this point, of this mass, point mass, and you normalize it by using the circular, the, the circular orbit with the energy of the first one. So you have this, uh, you fulfill all this, and you look at this, and you can find a way of cutting again, so you'll be sure with yourself. So far, I've already found four or five different ways of doing it, and I guess they're different from each other and interesting. So you have here, and that goes into here, and then la la la, until you come to here, and you've done, you can easily say what is here and what is there. So this is finally it. Yes. Oh, no. It's not so very Next, my daughter. The catastrophe. Okay. So... Now we're going to look at the, uh, well, no, go, go ahead. Just so forward one, please. So we have now the main components are two, the disc and the halo. And then you've got the bar, which you might or you might not take into account. But it is very interesting because it's got dynamics and evolution. And it is the most important of the components the components, not the main components. The main components, there are two. And okay, so that is it. Now, the bar, therefore, becomes a very interesting object in the sense that what used to be a fat ellipsoid or a thin ellipsoid or anything like that is not interesting anymore. You've got something like this one here. So next one? No, I want to show the upper left one. <laughs> yes, I hear. I've got it. I've got it. And so this you one is, is the way of having an interesting thing. And I tried and I did a lot of work. This is really the yes, uh, because I calculated the orbit of each one. I didn't look at any other thing, which is five seconds, and off it goes. I did all the order. Okay, so here we are. Okay. Yes, please keep it going. It's more confusing than anything else, you know. Thank you. I, I understand. It's, so, it's more so you just tell me when I have to go on and uh, yes, to just go back. Be fine. Thank Good. you. So okay. I actually did the orbits of Come all on. those. And I looked at them one by one. And then I could really tell whether it was a bar orbit or non bar orbit. Right. So now I can get to a something more interesting yet. So this is the bar formation and evolution. So what happens 
initially the bar is, and, and here I have the bar strength, the factor A2, the value A2, and we start here, this is time, and so here is A2, as you've learned, it, bar strength, and then this thing is nearly flat, I can say, well, it's not really, uh, it, it's not really into bar formation, but very nearly so. It's in this kind of thing. So you go very abruptly, go up. It's not this kind of low thing. It's not this kind of secular thing. It is this thing, boing, up there. Now this is this last part, which it has a secular evolution, which is nicely that, and that you goes for longer time, so this is four and six, and this is another eight here, so you've got, you've got quite a lot of uh, time range into which the secular evolution will go. Now, we have looked at not only the uh, in the previous plot, the bar strength as a function of time, but we will also here's the bar strength as a function of time. We have the peanut strength as a function of time, and the buckling uh, as a function of time. Because when we see the peanut by now, you probably have, well, how does that come here? Well, how does that come here? Uh, sorry. Here it is, and what happens? That's it. And that is, and that is the buckling. So now you will see exactly the same what you had before. This is the first part where nothing happens. This is the bar strength, but nothing, it's not really making a bar. Nothing here and nothing here. Now, this part which follows is uh, you have it, the bar strength here, so you have it decreases. And on the other hand, the peanut increases. And there we have also the buckling again, that thing. And so on and so forth. So with these few numbers, you can get, a, you can reduce the galaxy to three or five numbers here and look at the at the fact you don't you of course you don't get all this information but we do get enough information to write the paper so this was gas okay and so now let's get at we, we looked at the um how the bar formed and the analytical predictions about it uh, these predictions where the angular momentum exchanges drive the dynamical evolution of bar galaxies. And the, what happens is that the inner disk is, the, of course, the bar region, so the inner disk uh, gives away angular momentum to the outer part, which is the outer disk and the halo. Now, nearly everybody up to there, were in the case where they didn't care much about the, uh, the halo. Big mistake, never forget the halo. So what happens here is that it's an outer disk. So they said a lot of those, inner disk goes to outer disk, hip, hip, hurrah, we made it. You didn't, basically because this, the outer disk is far out, and we all know by looking at galaxies simply, or photometry of these things, you will see that that thing, as you go out, it decreases in density. We, we saw that, we saw in that in all, I'm sorry, in this way. And uh, so, so that it is, the inner disk, they said, goes to the outer disk. And after a while, this thing, there was no more to do, to take, and it was finished. So there is a, another way of doing it, that is take the halo and add it. And as I remember, uh, I am a halo fan. I 
immediately thought of my friend the halo. And so I told the halo, well, why don't you take some of all this, which I don't know what to do with. And the halo took the idea of the mountain very nicely. And with that, you can say also very nice things. Ah, there is my plot, which is one of my favorite plots. This is the strength of the bar, and this is the change of angular momentum, normalized by the total angular momentum. And you see that you come into a beautiful straight line. These points are a whole simulation each. So with, lit with differences in everything you may wish to put in, they, they don't go further than just on this. So more angular momentum redistribution should lead to stronger bars because more angular momentum redistribution that would give bigger. So if you have the, the point here, you will have a larger SB. So bar strength. And similar things for the pattern speed, but we'll talk, talk about later. Uh, indeed, simulations show that the strength of the bar correlates well. Blah, blah, you can see it. Right, now, angular momentum lost by the bar. How did the angular momentum manage to, to lose its bar? What did it do? Well, uh, the schematically, there are three ways. The first one is the pattern speed decreases. It's, it's the easiest one, of course. The first thing you think about is that the angular momentum should stop. So the pattern speed decreases and the bar will rotate slowly. Slower, sorry. Now there is another way, thing, the orbits become thinner. So here you are, the orbits have form like this and they become like this. So this is the, what happens is this forms, they become thinner, they become closer and then the angular momentum, of course, uh, will be less. So you get thinner bar and, uh, and thinner orbits and thinner bar. Now, the third and last, uh, you already you have a thing like this. You have a galaxy which is simply shown as a package, whose bar is simply shown as like a package of such um, bars. And you put it there, and then on the outside, of course, well, it's free to come. That's a circular orbit. And so what happens is that this pulls all this, and you come, you have around this one. And so you get a more extended galaxy. So you can get a thinner galaxy, a more extended galaxy, many things, all simply for that angular momentum redistribution. Now, this is what I was talking about, about the exchange of angular momentum here. Yes. So what I do here, I will work um, separately for the disk and for the spheroid. And this 800, don't bother about it. It's just the last time in some absurd units because when they were numerical units, you know that. You've been in front of a computer. So, you know, they, they, these things uh, are the, sim so just forget those things. So the disk and the spheroid, this you have the mass, and this is as a function of omega minus omega p over kappa, which is how far am I from a resonance? And here, lo and behold, I look where the resonances are, and the resonance would be at 1 over 2. 1 over 2 is 0 0.5, so I'm here. And what do I hear? You see here? I see a lot of mass coming up. It is the inner limblet resonance. Then here, there is a much smaller one, this one here, and this is corrotation. And then, so those of you have, have good eyes, you see this little fellow here? This one. And this little thing is at the very position of the outer limbic resonance. So there is at the resonance as peaks, 
but they're very, very small. And the, you can't build a galaxy over things like that, but you can build a galaxy. Over things like that. Now, the spheroids can also, these plots show us that this maxima here are at omega minus omega p over kappa, therefore another resonance, which is called corotation resonance. A corotation resonance, you know, does anybody doesn't know what a corotation resonance is? Okay, uh, so uh, corotation resonance. This is the star. So we got some residue. Don't have seen the circle all the Maybe those are the residues. This range. <laughs> right. Right. So the effect of the head. So the effect of hello mass on bar formation and evolution, well, this can be done. This I have here two different uh, simulations, which I call maps of the M halo. That's, that's a lot I want to call them. And mass disk. And you see that here is what we had. This marks first. So this part is first, sorry. This part first. And then, so we have that part. And in that part, the halo does a lot. In this part, it's the disc that does a lot. So don't spit on the bit disc. Uh, I'll be a little bit faster because we never finish. There is also possibilities about how hot. So we have, uh, we are living in a, in a, in a time, in a, in a galaxy, in which the, um, there are many, many, many parameters. Many, many parameters, too many parameters. But you have to add to something. So you make a list of all the parameters, and then you start one by one, take it and throw it together. Yes? Oh. Could you pass me? Okay, so what can I have as things? Well, we can, I, first of all, there are parameters for the halo. The mass of the halo, uh, the uh, motion of the, of the inner parts, of the distribution function with which uh, you make the halo work. And that is quite numerous, in fact, because making a distribution function may have many extra parameters. Before I'm finished, which we come to 20 or 30 parameters. If we come to 20 or 30 parameters, that means something very important. Looking at one, any one you want, be it the gas, be it the anything, any one of the, that you want, this um, is not enough to stop or to do something, because the others can get together and do the opposite, and all your nice calculations are lost. It is a bit messy, but it's easy to understand. I don't know, is it clear? Oh, yes. The 
point is, for example, you have all the effects of the halo, all the effects of the remaining disk, and you try and get some. But if you say it is the gas on the disk that does it, I'll tell you no, because indeed the gas on the halo is not much. But if you do the other ones and add them all together, all the other means, all the other things, the hot, how hot the galaxy is, how, uh, I don't know, so you just name them. And all that stuff will perhaps work in the, in the, in the opposite way. So it is, one has to be very careful with those things. So the halo mass, here we are, this is another parameters. I, you know, this is the, um, this is the how hot or cold the disk is. By the way, hot and cold in a disk means how much dispersion there is. So how much the whole thing has moved. If there's anything I don't say, don't hesitate to raise your hands, please. I can't think of anything that if one of you doesn't know, then otherwise I'm lost. Right. So I now look at some cases and I look, I had before, remember? No, this one not. So I had before the strong bars, the strongest bars, and the, the, these stronger bars are longer, thinner, and more massive, or one of those. And they often have ANSI. So longer or and or thinner and or more massive. And you made a stronger bar. How else do I make a stronger bar? Often ANSI. Flat radial density profiles, that was done by, uh, for the observations by Elmer Green, I'm not sure it was Elmer Green and Elmer Green or simply one of the Elmer Greens. And then the simulations, which is uh, myself and Angelus Masiriotis. Uh, they can have rectangular-like isodensity contoured PNAX or X when seen, they drawn here. You've got, this is the X, this is the box, this is, the, so don't look at it yet. This is the X and this is the, uh, the, the, the X when you see it like this. And the less strong bar now, we have fatter, no ANSI, elliptical-like isodensity contours, and boxy edge-on shape. Right. So there's one thing to make, to be very, very, very careful about. This was made this was made, um, this was a problem that was made. Now, the, the first thing to know, to notice, is that the halos should be adequately modeled. All the um, simulations, uh, till, uh, well, not 2000, but still very, very old, uh, very recent, relatively. And, we have these two cases. What we do here, we take exactly the same simulation, the same x values, the same v x values, the v y values, the y values, the same simulation exactly. I take the same file. And then I run the simulation in the way it was done initially. So with the rigid halo, in fact, at the time, it was already quite difficult to, to find a lot of CPU time. So the easiest thing was, oh, come on, I'm not going to, to lose my good time uh, looking at simply um, the, 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 the halo. If I look only at the halo, well, you know, there's, a, there's just a halo, uh, not very exciting, nothing to write home about. And so that, that is not good. This is the rigid, rigid halo. And then I do exactly the same thing. I told you, don't change anything, nothing at all. And then you have a live halo, 
and you run the same simulation. You just put the different things. And this is the result now. So you would have said, this is the result if you did it with a rigid halo, and you would have said, this is a live result from this. That is, you would have done 100% error. And so the rigid halo, all this happens because the halo cannot receive angular momentum and no bar develops. And here there's a live halo, the halo can receive angular momentum, a bar develops and forms, and it's great. So beware of one thing, of the old simulations before the years, well, I mean, five years, no, before 2000, I'd say, just to be safe, perhaps. And look at everything, and whether it was a rigid halo for the calculation or the uh, live halo for the calculation. Because you may have been getting totally wrong results. Yes, of course. Anything to start? It is actually, yes, I would say it's particles with this dark matter. Really, not gas up there yet. No gas up there yet. It is the dark matter particles in the simulation of particles and the. Uh, that's all right. Yes, and, and, and the dark matter ones. And then, then you've got two types of things which are just particles. I treat them as just particles. Right. Uh, well, I'll skip this. And different core radii, how you can do uh, effect on the sparse strength. Let's skip it. Yes. No. Now, I've shown you all the, well, not all of it, but one tenth of what was possible before without your gas. Now, I will add gas to the simulation. And to do that, I have these. I add what is gas in the, in, the, in the code and put this, so this is gas. This is the, uh, the stars which are older than 60 years and the south. And the, the one is the larger and the other is smaller. And you can see that here the bar is very strong. And as you go down, uh, what is down? Here you have, of course, 0% gas, 20% gas, 50% gas, and 75% gas. So 0% gas, 20% gas, 50% gas, and 75% gas. And this thing is three models of the halo just to change the, the dynamics totally. I have three models of the halo, halo one, halo two, halo three. So all these are halo one, halo two, and halo three. And simply what I do now is look at the simulation about six giga years after that. And you can see it right away. There is not much to say. This is much stronger than this little measly thing. It's, it's, it's a bar. If you look very carefully, it's a bar. And same thing here. But this is much better. This is much stronger. Now you've got something to talk about. So this is the kind of work we were doing with. Um, So this is what I said before, we cannot set constraints on any given quantity from the strength of the bar and only. And here you are. So I will, show, I will try and look at what, this is about a way of putting everything together. This is A2, so this is the bar strength, low bar strength, high bar strength, time in giga years, so 0 to 10, 0 to 10, 0 to 10. 
And we've got Halo 1, Halo 2, Halo 3. As I said, I get two totally different um, Halo masses. And um, there you are. And what fraction was gas initially, initially, um, uh, initially was their color. So this is zero gas, then you have 20% gas, 50, 75, and 100% gas. Right, so now what? Well, there's a lot to be seen here. I won't so show them all because you never get out of here. Um, this one is the strongest bar there is the, in the Halo 1, which Halo 1, we said, is a spherical, well, I don't know if I said it, is the spherical halo. This is elongated halos and very elongated halos. So this is a spherical halo, and the black is 0% gas, and this is the strongest gas this, this kind of configuration can give. Then I have the uh, red line, which is 20% gas. This is a, a little bit lower. And then you have 50% gas, you go there, down, and then 75 and 100% gas, as you can see. And then you've got halo two and halo three. So gas can slow down bar formation in more than in, two, in one way, and this is in two ways. I have also other possibilities. So you see that this, it's getting incredibly difficult to say, this is how it all started. It is a lot of ways of going about it. You can go like this, or like that, or whatever you want. So here we have the halo bar length strength, sorry, halo bar strength, you can read it. Halo bar strength is a function of disk bar strength. At the end of the, the, end of the simulation, my computer was 10 giga years and the circle squares and triangles are for the halo one halo two and halo three and the colors will give which the gas content and so you see these values so the uh, red line is disc and blue line is halo and you see as we hoped that the disc is much stronger and then the, the ambient to goes to in the bit disc is as should have done stronger than the halo one. And you can see it even in the lower parts. And the, in the lower parts, of course, the difference is less, uh, less screening, but it is also clear. It's anyway clear. Uh, now, this is a short list of the uh, of a summary of early bar formation, what makes a bar form fast. Remember, it's the first part, this the first fast uh, uphill thing. And that is four different ways. And then what makes bar stronger, it's these ones again. And I am now adding more to these catalogs. And it's interesting because this is exactly what we want. I mean, I'm in a little group, um, uh, to do, trying to do things like that. And then they, they always come, Leah, what should we do to have a, 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 a strong bar? Leah, what should we do to have to, a weak bar? Well, you just take that and have a look. So. Uh, now this is uh, the input from simulations to orbital structure theory and vice versa, because there are lots of um, people for with orbital structure working here. And uh, the way input from simulation to orbital structure theory is simply when you take a, simul a, a simulation and you take the best parts of it, the ones you want most, and make a model out of them. That is, make initial conditions out of them. You make a series expansion, for example, there are good uh, examples of why and how you take what kind, and you take those, and then, then it's, uh, depending on the amount of time you want to put, you can find um, an analytic way of showing this thing. 
and therefore of calculating these orbits. These orbits are m equals two, means that they have need they are periodic orbit. Is there anybody in this house not knowing what a periodic orbit is? Good, because Professor Pontopoulos will have a, would have had a fit. And then, um, so this is this is it. And well, yes, these are the, 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 the these difference. Sorry, it doesn't want to be. And there's uh, ten periodic families, as you can see up there. And the people for the paper where we calculated those things are just given in green. The thin and the thick disk, I don't think I will do. And then defined by stellar ages. I, I saw, you wanted to finish? Yes. Okay, thank you, Monsieur. Uh, yes, now I'll have a little glimpse, I'll give you a little glimpse of chemodynamics, because I've said a lot of dynamics, and at least it needed three times more, but okay, that's that much time. Heartless, I reckon, people would, uh, yes, so here you are. Now I will try and get some chemodynamics in. Do I have any... Uh, no. So this is the this is the Fe over H and the alpha element over Fe, whichever alpha element is your favorite one. There is not much difference. The plots look more or less the same. You get some blobs and it's nice to see that you got blobs which are know where this line is, where I cut the FEH and AFE space into two parts, low and, and, and high, and you will have a part here, also blob here, a blob here, a blob here, and so on and so forth. Now, I ran a simulation because I wanted to see how these things would go. And so this is from my simulation. It is magnesium over iron uh, as a function of the, um, uh, the, uh, the, the metallicities. And we will f you see here one blob, two blobs, three blobs. That's what you want. And this is chemistry, pure chemistry. Now, the, I, I uh, compared with Ben C. et al. from 2014 and 2017. Actually, I found the old ones much more telling than the new ones. And they, of course, their observations, so they do whatever they can. This is one thing, this is the other thing. And then there would be here, but of course, there isn't much. So this thing is this thing. This thing is this thing here. And then you've got this here, which is this part here. Right, so this is what you have, and this is one full extra parameter. So what I did, I now cut position. I cut by position on the diagram, a magnesium over iron versus Fe plane. It's a plane, you just say from here is much there and there. You, it's more or less like it was for the observers before. And I have now uh, two, this ones, for example, I have uh, now wait a minute because this is I'll do it like this. Yes, it's the simple. I cut as observers do in two in, in two parts of the uh, of the space, and the lower and uh, the lower mag magnesium over iron and higher if you over age makes a galaxy which is vertically thin, thin disk kinematics, 
higher V10 and lower velocity dispersion. The morphology is a thin bar, well-developed spirals and in a ring. And of course, the other way around for the other one, higher magnesium over iron, lower V over H, vertically thin, thin, thick, blah, 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 you can read it. So we get out of my simulations, one of the things I hoped I would get and got is, the, is this kind of values. And so there I cut again by metallicity, and you see that if a few of H is between minus one and minus a half, there is something like that. I don't know if you see it, there's too much light, but there's something here. Now, here from minus a half to a few of H and then zero, you have this. Here, you have this. And then this is nothing, this is what it was. So the exact explanation of how these things came, um, it is, uh, it, they were made to do the, to explain the population of Melissa Ness, Ken Freeman and myself. And we managed, yes, we did. And we have this, uh, this uh, work, which is from these people here. The morphology depends strongly on the metallicity. That is an interesting point because the metallicity is something purely chemical and the morphology is something, so it is something, we, we can't expect better. If there is a split between two things which are for, could have been stars in the central region will be distributed in an X or a peanut shape. Uh, they can have, they can be several metallicities and many components cohabitate in the central region because there was an, um, a long time ago some, um, some discussion of, of somebody was looking into this area somehow and he said, hey, look at that. I find all this different, but also that and that. And that. What's going on? That's why some of it is integrated along the wider side. You find different things. This is simulations, how we go with the observation, with my simulation observations. And actually, it's pretty good, as you can see. That being red and then it's uh, I think I would yes, I do. Thank you, sir. Thank you very much. <laughs> So I know this is fighting with the mic, but you all, you all have to fight with the mic later on. So just spit into the mic. That's what you have to do. Then it should work. So I think, Leah, it would be nice if you have some time for discussion. And I suggest you go all the way here. Yeah, drink as much as you need. And, and then, so we open the discussion. You have a mic also? Oh, that's good. OK, so you go around like I did last, last night. Uh, so are there some panel? Okay. So many, many thanks, uh, Leah, for the very nice review. All of that is really very interesting and very useful for our young colleagues. One question about the cosmological simulations. About the which? The simulation? cosmological the simulations. Simulation. Oh, How much can we, we have, a cosm we have a cosmological simulation and then we have a disk form. How much can we trust this disk as initial condition? And yeah, exactly. And uh, okay, if we have it, we have to, to, to see if bars, etc., are formed. Uh, if we start with a very controlled initial condition disk, we know where we go. When we start from that one, from the cosmological simulation, can we trust it? Yes, well, yeah, 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 yeah. 
Well, um, these things, the cosmological ones, well, they have a number of advantages, but the problem is that they rely on the background they put. And that you just accept because otherwise it's not self-consistent, the, the, the thing was self-consistently growing. So, well, it depends. You, you pray well, you don't pray well, I don't know. But, but the point is that, well, look, I'll, I'll answer in a, in a minute, but I'll give you first another one. A number of years ago, a long time ago, I was just about starting and all that stuff. Uh, the, um, Simon White and collaborators got CDM case. So that is CDM. Now, the C stands for cold. Now, about a few months after that, uh, perhaps less, a few weeks, I don't remember, came out another simulation, which was HDM, hot dark matter. And everybody jumped on that, was very happy. And they, they tried to get to something with all that. And I got a question very similar to yours when I was giving a talk at the time. And I said, well, um, look, if you believe, if you're a good believer and you believe to cold dark matter, perfect, you made your life. Otherwise, if you're a good believer of the hot dark matter, nice and warm and everything, that is also your happy person. But it doesn't mean there's all sorts of, I can find an, a huge number of parameters which would make these things possible. Now, I'm sure that, look, let's put it also another one. They, one of the, oh dear, I'm going to lose my best friends, but anyway, um, the, um, how can I put it? The, there is this catalog that, for example, um, some of those things have given out publicly all the values for this, that, that, and the other. And I can tell you from my own experience, for, from my own simulations, that's the simulation part and what comes with it is about 99.99 .99 times the work. And it's not little, it's a lot. So when I work on that part, I, I also am in a very bad mood and everything, I mean, it's sort of difficult part. So for that reason, um, for the other one, it depends on what you believe in a way. I mean, I'm sure that they have better ways of doing it and, and everything. I am not a fan of this thing and therefore I have not, given any time, because I, look, we all have a limited amount of times, and therefore I, I, pref I want to put my, my uh, roulette thing in the part that I think will come. I don't do it in any other thing. I, mean, it's, I, I do what I think is the right thing, and my right thing is not that, but I may be wrong. I mean, don't, uh, I hope I get back those friends of mine. And uh, I, I think that I can, it, it's not, it, it's not right and wrong. And also the other thing, there was a paper of mine with um, Scanapieco. And we compared different, the, the cases. And well, we were a bit optimistic, but the difference was not in that particular case very good, very small. Sorry, very big. And okay, uh, that could have been done, but we never got, we, the only thing I think we got out of that is try a difference, and if it is not to be, be happy. Now, it doesn't mean much because it was one parameter, not Yeah.
No, there was one there. And one there. Thank you for an interesting talk. Okay. Okay. Uh, I can't hear them. Uh, <laughs> okay. Uh, okay. 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 Nice. I would like to ask uh, the following question. Is it correct to say that the angular momentum exchange between the, uh, between the halo and the disk is required now to explain, for example, the lambda CDM? And it's basically, I, I know that it's an old question, like. <laughs> I don't think you need to. I mean, lambda CDM, lambda CDM is something very far. Uh, the case which I have with the previous one, it's something very near. We just, I mean, it's just one galaxy. But can you form the galaxies in lambda CDM without angular momentum exchange? Well, that's your next assignment. How do you do it? <laughs> I'm sure you. Do it. No, I'm really happy to to discuss it, but I've never taken it anywhere. Yeah. It's just an interesting it. question. Sometimes when you are speaking about the galaxies, some <laughs> there is some guy who is. Naively asking you about why uh, there should be angular momentum exchange and why we represent the dark, the dark, the dark halo uh, by particles and not just some, I don't know, liquid or something that doesn't uh, allow one to exchange the angular momentum. And <laughs> well, the angular momentum change is physics. I knew it. You knew it perhaps from the moment we, th we had read the word angular momentum. I said, hey, wait a minute, that's it. So, you know, it was a matter of uh, 30 seconds or so. Okay, okay. Thank, you. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much, Leah. For this okay, Dimitri, okay, he would kill me otherwise and not. So okay. okay. Uh, um, at some at some point you mentioned uh, that you measure in the simulations the Bausch to total fraction. Yes. And how does this compare with other things? And and so my question. So you said that you referred to the classical Bausch. Yes. My question is how how did you make this measurement in the simulations? What what parameter did you use to say this is the classical Bausch fraction? Well, you just looked at it and looked at their trajectories. The orbits. Or the orbits. Trajectory is, uh, yes. Okay, the so orbit. Did, did you use circularity, for example? Or? So you use circularity, for example. Although circularity, it's it's Simon White that did it. I know. So, you know, he's a great man and everything. And uh, then, yes, um, it, it is not, sorry, what was I going to say with uh, the story? Sorry, what so, was so, so the So the question is, how do you define how, how which which parameter and, and how do you know that this is the way, right way to define this is the classical bulge, this is formed with scrambling of the orbits and not just a heated disk, for example. If you want little work, beam. if you want little work, you do decomposition so as you know how to do them. Right. So that is the one way and that allows you to say, I, I, I will go further, it's worth it from what I see, or oh, I don't see anything, so I'm not going to lose my time. So your, your way is the first step. Mm. Now, there is a second step you should go, because for example, for anything, um, you can have an orbit that goes through and out of the way. Now, what do you do? Where do you place it? So what you do is well described. You can simply follow the orbits and take all the coordinates and velocities. And from that, calculate the amount of their time they take into the area which you would, for the best of conditions, call um, whatever you, uh, I mean, whatever you're looking at. I, in those cases, it's the ratio with the, 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 the bulge, bulge to total. So you look at it like that, and from that, and you just take out, and that's it. Now, if you want to do even better than that, is you follow that over through the whole simulation. And, well, you can do several at one time, I mean, because otherwise you're, <laughs> you're doing 100,000 or a few million uh, simulations, but, that's not easy. So, but how, how you avoid confusion of like the, the particle being at the center uh, region where the bulge from is, or being from the velocity. From the velocities. And how do you define the threshold in velocity where you tell this is a disk, this is a classical bulge? 
I would have said that the, I actually do it a little bit more, not like this. Yeah. I take a weight infection. And so there was a, if you just stay long in the, in the, in the, in the part of the center, then you uh, have the, um, that it's, it's, you can give a weight, which is important. If you have something which goes zoom and out, well, you know, so you, you could give it a low weight. So I have some equations which tell me in a, not too unreasonable uh, cases to, to, to see them that way. Yeah, I guess, I mean, just to conclude, I guess there is a bit of uh, flexibility. Yes. Oh, and, yes. And we need to understand how to justify physically better. Yes, this. Yes. So. yes, 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 yes. And I have those things in a way, of course. So. Thank you. Thank you. did a great job okay. with all this. So right now we take the conference picture just outside at the entrance. Then there is coffee break. Please, the uh, speakers of the next session, be sure that uh, they have uh, arranged the presentation uh, details with the technicians. And this uh, holds for all the sessions. Just before the session, the speakers should be in contact with the technical staff so that everything with their presentation is set up. So let's go at the entrance right now and then we have coffee break and we convene at uh, 1130. Yeah. Thank you. So we now have a series of uh, talks about projects going on, and we start with Daria Sagarova on kinematic features of galaxies with bars. So, Daria. Yeah. Hi, everyone. My name is Daria, and I'm uh, I'm just about to finish my PhD in the University of Padua, and today I want to talk about my. Uh, work about kinematic features of uh, galaxies with bars uh, and also I would like to thank organizers of this conference it's really a nice opportunity to present my work thank you yeah and uh, the motivation of my work uh, were related to different morphologies of, of these galaxies with bars which also view we can uh, observe from different uh, angles uh, but uh, it's uh, hard to connect different future uh, features of the face on and age on galaxies. Right. I can't hear you. So oh. Either you go closer or we take the headphone. Okay. You know, whatever. Is that better? Yeah, you need to really. Okay. <laughs> Just, if you, otherwise, we take the headphone. What is better for you? You know, maybe this one is. Uh, then you don't have to worry. And then you okay. can go around. Yeah, let's try it. Sorry. No. Yeah, let's say something. Ta -da. Is that better? No, can we you have... hear? No, oh. perfect. Thank you. Now you can look at it. So, the motivation of this work for uh, this uh, process is to Uh, based on the same structure or not, 
And we decided to waste our analysis on diplomatic because it's a good opportunity uh, for studying not, also, not only the morphological uh, but also the dynamical side of the analysis. And uh, to do so, we did. Uh, we did four models uh, with DPS uh, models, which is on all of our four models, and DPS uh, is structured on the H uh, on you. And uh, our models are um, distinguished uh, uh, from variants, uh, which is the model, and the second is uh, also a model with variants, uh, but that is very different variants. And uh, the two other models just uh, you post in the vouchers uh, is uh, is really really very good vouch and so without vouch at all. And we did the body models uh, in the bottom of the slide you see the settings of our body model and to compare uh, with oscillations and to suggest the uh, devices our model. So this in case is if you that to mean this observation which done by the person in uh uh paper. And then using this uh, data set, uh, we analyze our if you data as it's done in observational data. So for the pixel we uh uh calculate the those components uh, by this uh, a uh, thousand series uh, where we can obtain uh, from an EQ group uh, by mass and this is especially H3 and H4 parameters where each three basically responsible for orbital features, for example, when we have disk uh, almost uh, circular orbits uh, with a combination of bar uh, elongated orbits, we will see. Uh, H3 parameter, um, H4 parameter, uh, responsible for, for the density features of the distribution. And so uh, for all for all of all four models, we uh, calculate the series of H4 and H3 maps. And I'm going to start from H4 map for all our uh, for models uh, for place of position, uh, each one maps is differently uh, for each model. So the each model of uh, each one parameter reflects morphology and specific morphology of central part of the And we also did count uh, the each one against the minimum among the major axis of the galaxy uh, as it is expected for bigger galaxies. So Structure, uh, but then, uh, despite of that, they in this model, despite their rise and rise, they uh, show the different H1 map, which also highlights that uh, some more complicated uh, connections between H4 and the uh, models can be found. Uh, I, I have to say that each one does not reflect the vertical thickness, but uh, even though uh, we may see a problem with uh, the vertical thickness shown in the, the bottom part of minima corresponds to each one minima, but uh, for other models, we do not find the same correlation. So, uh, each, and uh, this result was shown in the previous. Work, for example, in the Batista 2005, uh, this was uh, shown that uh, the H4 parameter uh, responsible for the vertical density that H4 reflects the, the features of vertical density distribution. And so the vertical exponential velocity of these classes reflects the vertical distribution of that. Uh, and uh, this is uh, in this case in uh, the parameter is which is now for each parameter but not for distribution of velocity, so the distribution of density. And we show that the H4 model does not make this D4 model, but not the vertical thickness of our models. 
And uh, we also would like to understand what the, what the difference between our model and uh, why our models distinguish between each from us and if we could uh, distinguish the different problems of each for the model exactly. So we did a previous analysis of orbits to distinguish the main models of groups constitute the issue of our, our model. And we check if uh, these uh, exact orbits uh, are responsible for H4 or different features. To do so, uh, our original analysis uh, was related to previous analysis. We distinguish four or five main uh, groups, uh, orbital groups, which are X1 or and X2 orbits, which are related to the last part. Most part should uh, constitute the place on Venus structure, uh, which should be part of this model. Uh, it's uh, two families uh, which are grade two and grade four, and these uh, orbits are specifically related to Rayleigh in our way uh, and Rayleigh model. And uh, then we are subsequently released one of the group from our uh, this model, one by one, and we will do our analysis to see how uh, a mass of our model and each form mass will be changed. And uh, here you can see how it's doing its way into this model, and on the bottom of each one, you can see the percentage of each uh, group which contributes the uh, total number of particles uh, in this new part. It's for this model on the bottom of the bottom is quite easy because it's near uh, also in the watch and works with for the space institute the entire part. So these in them are really uh, completely completely compact and the format does not does not mean it to anymore because they need this first five percent But for brain model it's not so obvious and uh, as you can see. The H1 minima, which are the weighted for uh, thickness of uh, which relate to the bar, that is only percent, responsible for 10% of uh, H1, but the minima of the pressure axis for H4 parameters. And the second group, which are quite bigger, is one carbon very long, but are. Uh, also, it's changed the morphology of the or the density of these orbits also changes the density uh, of the uh, H4. Uh, so, uh, the main principle here is the dominance of one parameter of the group by determines uh, the principal morphology of galaxy and also the features of each H4 map. And uh, the next question which we would like to understand if uh, this uh, analysis of each operator is reasonable if we see dogs not only in space or position because it's almost not perfect in the situation and we did the map uh, uh, we rotate our brain model of, uh, for, 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 for our whole model which I will show on the brain model to see how uh, H4, uh, which are either partners or small partners in this D4, uh, connected to each other, and uh, until uh, we have a uh, low inclination of galaxy, it's perfectly agree, but uh, after we have inclination bigger than 20 degree, it's a uh, real analysis, and this is because on the line of sight shown on the left panel. Uh, how our line of sight uh, intersect with galaxy and uh, how the simulation of different particles on our line of sight can be made for analysis. So, uh, the, the main conclusion here, and this was shown also in other words, that each four uh, parameter uh, relates uh, relate to analyze only in case of uh, low point galaxies. In uh, the best cases, below the 20 degree inclination.
Which were described uh, in previous talk. 
And here is uh, my conclusion, which is more or less related that each uh, core diagnostic doesn't sort of work as a combination uh, above uh, 20 degree. And uh, but uh, each preparameter shows some different features of the galaxies. And uh, the BS vouchers can be detected using uh, each core parameter as we show in different previous. Good, so we have time for, thank you, well, it was a great, great talk, I learned a lot, um, so now we can go around and... Hello, thank you for the very interesting talk. Um, so, could you go back to some of your H, the H4 maps for the models? Which one? Um, where, where you show all the four models together in the face-on projection for the H4 maps. Uh, yes, for example, or sorry, no, for H3 actually is the one I want to see. Yeah, so am I right in understanding that you, you don't have gas in these simulations, right? So this is just n body. So it seems that you have a feature in the central region, for example, in this model here, which looks like some kind of rotating nuclear disk structure. Um, so, if can you say a little bit more about why you get this, if the, or how you get this, if there is no gas to form the nuclear disk? That's very interesting. Yeah. So this, so this system, so this simulation here has a classical bulge in it as well, and a disk as well that forms the yes. bar. Okay, and this H, this, this feature in the center is caused by what you tag as the bulge or by what you tag as the disk. Okay, so it's formed from the disk material that forms the bar and then the bar lens. Yes, okay, all right. Interesting. Thank you, very nice talk. Uh, let me ask something, I didn't get it correctly. The H4 analysis indicate the boxings of the balls, the presence of the peanuts, and the X, or what are all of these three? So it gets also, let's say, if we look at the edge on, side on view, it also uh, understands the local minimum of the center. So that is a peanut. If it is a box, would you have the same number? So. Okay, thank you. Very, very nice work. Um, the one question that just occurred to me now, do, do you, maybe that can help separate the bar lens and the nuclear disk question that Francesca asked. Did you look at the uh, velocity dispersion map? Uh, oh.
Because the nuclear disk will have low velocity dispersion, and and at this point, I, I don't know what the bar lens will have, but maybe not as cold as, as the nuclear disk. And then you can kind of try to separate what is what. Yeah. Okay. Thanks. Well, you should try it again, uh, Daniel. It's um, a bit of a more theoretical question. Um, this decomposition lets you have a negative values for these H3 parameter uh, functions, or A4, they can be negative. So what we could wish is a decomposition in positive, positive functions. So we, we could ascribe some degree of physics to the object, could be light or mass, should be positive. So, it's it's. Uh, do 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 you have any seen any discussion about this? Um, if we can decompose the light in positive function, no, it could be a good idea because because uh, otherwise we don't know if the A three or A four is physical. You, know, you see, if it's negative, it's probably not. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Will be for the future. <laughs> That's it. So we still have um, time for one or two questions. If not, thanks for keeping in time and for a nice discussion. So the next speaker is um, Anna Mitrasinovic. I hope I got it right. Well, <laughs> okay, maybe you can tell us the right pronunciation. And we do again the headset. I think the headset would be good. No, the headset. Headset, where's the headset uh, disappear? Uh, you know. And Anna will tell us about double bars in the aftermath of a galaxy flyby. Okay. Okay, so uh yeah, it's pronounced Mitrosinovich. Okay. Okay. Uh so um uh, I'm gonna be talking uh, mostly uh, about double bars in the aftermath of uh, galaxy, galactic flyby, galaxy flyby. But um, uh, double bars is actually um, uh, one of the interesting results that we got from a more general study. And for context, I'm gonna go briefly uh, uh, about the, the general motivation and how we got this unexpected but um, interesting uh, result. So um, first, I need to uh, introduce the concept of galaxy flyby. And to do so, um, we need to uh, basically recognize that any galaxy interaction, uh, the most fundamental classification of any interaction is based on the outcome. Uh, are those galaxies going to merge into uh, forming uh, one single ga galaxy, or are they going to uh, stay separate galaxies after the encounter, meaning uh, the classification into mergers and non-mergers? And in standard cosmological model, uh, uh, structure formation is thought to be hierarchical, meaning that mergers play a major role in the formation of galaxies as they exist in the uh, present day universe. And that's why uh, mergers were um, uh, studied at such extensive lengths. And um, 
when it comes to mergers, uh, uh, classifications of mergers are pretty common and standard in the field. And one of the most common is based on uh, mass ratio, based on mass ratio of uh, galaxies uh, that are uh, interacting. Uh, and that actually uh, influenced uh, some, some of the previous researchers to use that kind of a classification for uh, non-mergers. Um, specifically, I worked with flybys that, that is just one class of um, non-merger interaction. Uh, those are really close interaction that are really, uh, that are also uh, really fast, but uh, they're thought to be uh, really frequent on high redshift, but also on low redshift. <laughs> And cosmological simulations show that they, uh, they can uh, probably be as frequent as, as mergers in present day universe, and maybe uh, their frequency can be even higher for low mass galaxies. And cosmological simulations also showed that typical uh, flyby has a mass ratio of point, point 0.1 or even lower. Uh, and that uh, interacting galaxies uh, have um, pericentric distances or uh, impact parameters really low. Uh, in most cases, lower than half mass radius of the primary galaxy. Uh, some of the studies that, actually, that explored the possibility that flybys can actually induce bars in primary galaxies um, uh, used a merger-based classification and you, um, classified flybys into major or minor based on mass ratio. And uh, they concluded that only major flybys can uh, induce uh, bars in primary galaxies. However, we were skeptical of that and we weren't really sure if that's the case. And I'll uh, continue to explain why. Uh, in non-mergers, when galaxies don't form single galaxy after the interaction, uh, it's not just the mass ratio that, that determines outcomes and, and the final uh, structures that can form uh, in disks, uh, but we also have to take into account other parameters, such as, uh, for example, uh, um, uh, percentric distance, uh, minimum uh, distance between galaxies during the interaction, uh, interaction time, time scale as well, since if, if, um, if interaction is slower, then it will, uh, it will leave a longer lasting impact on, on a primary galaxy. And if we take all of those uh, things into account, uh, we can uh, simply um, describe the uh, interaction with uh, interaction strength parameter. In this case, we used uh, Almagrin parameter, which is uh, one of the most complete ones since it includes also uh, mass ratio and interacting galaxies, uh, impact parameter or pericentric distance, interaction time scale. And uh, knowing all this, when we uh, you know, use uh, typical values for uh, major or minor flybys from cosmological simulations and calculate interaction strength based on typical values, we actually come to the estimate that uh, interaction strengths are comparable because equal mass fly, uh, flybys are actually really, really rare, extremely rare, and they're exclusively distant. And it affects, obviously, uh, interaction strength but uh, minor flybys, even though they, uh, they have really low, uh, the, the first part of the equation, the, the low uh, mass ratio, they, um, they happen at much um, closer distances. And, uh, and since you know, uh, interaction strength is really sensitive to uh, impact, param to impact parameter, um, we end up with comparable interaction strengths. So that implies that those two classes of uh, flybys, minor and mer uh, major, uh, in you know, merger classification terms, are actually indistinguishable when we want to um, 
uh, study, uh, for example, bar formation or spiral formation. So that was our initial premise, and uh, we wanted to prove that by realizing a series of uh, isolated uh, uh, pure body simulations. Unfortunately, we didn't have gas. So our uh, initial setup was that we had uh, some typical disk uh, galaxy with a dark matter halo and with a classical bulge that kind of resembles uh, Milky Way or the Andromeda galaxy uh, in a way. Um, and when, when I say it resembles uh, Milky Way Andromeda, uh, I mean by um, total mass of the component and not the morphological structure of the disk. Initially, uh, our uh, primary model is uh, axisymmetric. And for simplicity, we included uh, spherical perturber, perturber uh, that is secondary galaxy, and we kept mass ratio at 0.1. And uh, for simplicity, we, uh, we, uh, uh, we um, in order to induce, to possibly um, get um, those uh, spiral arms and bars to, uh, in, uh, in primary galaxy, we performed the uh, initial interaction setup was that uh, uh, encounter was uh, prograd uh, and uh, planar, uh, meaning that the um, velocity and uh, the um, velocity plane of a secondary galaxy aligns with the disk of a, of a primary. And we uh, explored a certain uh, range of interaction sense from really uh, weak ones to well, somewhat uh, strong ones, because after point 0.25 or something like that, the disk is supposed to be destroyed. So we didn't go uh, higher. And most of the values we took for initial uh, setup of interaction were taken from uh, cosmological uh, simulations. And we focused mostly on, uh, you know, exploring those, uh, and, um, those series of simulation in a general man manner. So we, um, we explored the tidal stripping of the secondary galaxy, we explored we explore the spiral and bar formation in the primary. We managed to confirm our uh, initial assumption about the bar formation in the primary, and uh, we confirmed that uh, it happens mostly in a stronger or, uh, I, I don't know, maybe medium, moderate uh, interactions, spiral arm form in all, which is kind of expected. Uh, and yeah, what I'm gonna continue, we actually, in one of the simulations, noticed uh, interesting feature, double bars, meaning um, two uh, uh, misaligned bars, like uh, I think the other term is nested bars. And I found that particularly interesting, even though uh, we didn't mm, highlight that result that much in our general work. And that's why I uh, wanted to present it here. So it looks something like this, just for, for the reference. Uh, the main bar, uh, uh, inner bar is, uh, its major axis is marked with, um, with a solid line and dashed line is for the outer bar. And evidently outer bar isn't really I mean, it's kind of stretch, a stretch to call it a bar early on, because it's evident that it's, it's some kind of a winded up feature, uh, remnant of the spiral structure. Um, this is how, it's, uh, how it looks in a three randomly selected uh, moments during, simula during the simulations. And for the reference, uh, interaction ends uh, at uh, 1.08 uh, uh, giga years, and pericenter is early on. So this is late after the interaction. Uh, and to, to, uh, 
to actually uh, quantify it, we use the st standard procedure of uh, Fourier uh, transformation. I included for the completeness uh, the formulas, but I think it's well known. Uh, and uh, if we look at the maps, uh, these are evolution maps, uh, meaning we can we can see how um, Fourier uh, uh, amplitude and phase changes along um, uh, radius uh, in uh, disk, but also during time. And um, bars are uh, recognized as regions with uh, high enough amplitude. Uh, and almost constant fa constant phase, but spiral alarms are, are also uh, recognized uh, as regions with high enough amplitude, but their phase is uniformly changing. So we can distinguish between bars and and spiral arms uh, using um, a complete a complete uh, set of uh, Fourier uh, um, parameters, meaning if we look at the uh, phase. And interestingly, uh, we can see that for quite quite some time we have multiple features existing uh, from around I think one or one point something giga years, and almost until three point five. Uh, that's the time when the two stru structures sync. That's uh, I think it's more evident and visible from the phase uh, map. And at that point, uh, the two structures uh, actually uh, kind of sync, align, and they're mistaken uh, uh, for a single bar. They misalign again, but only briefly. And they finally sync later on, forming a, a single, single bar. Uh, in other... <laughs> Uh, this is the evolution of um, of those uh, parameters, A2 meaning the bar strength. And uh, inner bar is denoted as main bar, uh, while the that secondary, I denoted that, that as a secondary structure because uh, early on it's a stretch to call it a bar. And we see that generally uh, strengths are kind of comparable. Uh, but the strength when the bar, bars are aligned uh, peaks. And yeah, obviously the outer structures that, that secondary structure uh, is uh, much, much longer than the inner one and can reach pretty high values like eight kiloparsecs briefly though. Uh, we, um, uh, estimated uh, um, pattern speed roughly based on uh, um, changes between the phase and successive snapshots. So it's a really crude estimate of the pattern speed, but it kind of gave us a, some insight in, into what's happening. And we could see that inner structure, uh, inner bar generally uh, has a higher pattern speed. The, the, uh, which is consistent with the previous works that uh, concluded that when uh, in cases of double bars, inner bars uh, rotate uh, faster. So we suppose that the long lasting nature of this particular uh, structure as a, as a whole is due to different rotation patterns. Uh, I didn't really go into a detailed analysis. I plan to, but somehow I'm <laughs> never finding enough time for that. Uh, and I would like to uh, point out the recent uh, study that I found really interesting and highly recommend it that um, argued for um, the tidal formation scenario of double bars uh, and uh, presented two examples from cosmological simulations illustrates um, the next generation. And one of the examples actually uh, had um, 
looked uh, really similar to what we were seeing in our simulations, meaning that before the um, two uh, double bars formed, they, um, they saw that um, the disk had a single bar and also spiral structures. So there's a pos possibility that, um, that in that case, uh, spiral structure kind of winded up and around that early formed bar. Uh, and to conclude and kind of summarize everything, um, so we started uh, with the assumption that, uh, and with the you know, <laughs> will to explore the galaxy flybys and to uh, point out that, you know, for a non-mergers interaction strength needs to be used to classify interactions and we, we successfully demonstrated that bars can form in minor flybys, but uh, uh, we got this unexpected result, uh, formation of double bar. And in our particular case, it formed, uh, it formed in a single event, obviously. Uh, it formed due to uh, that uh, specific, uh, that inner bar uh, not growing in size, um, fast enough at least, and spiral structure um, that, that formed due to the same interaction winding up in their parts at least, forming a, sort of a ring, but more of an ellipse around the early formed bar, and then the material uh, transformed into something that resembles an outer bar. And we suppose that it's, uh, long lived because of different rotation patterns, but we, we definitely need to check that more and to analyze it properly in more detail. Uh, good thing is that um, this, uh, this particular scenario that we observed is uh, in a good agreement with other studies. So, uh, but uh, there are still many open questions when it comes to double bars and when it comes to this, uh, scenario that we observed as well. Like, for example, um, is this interaction strength that we had that that formed uh, this the, the, this um, double uh, the, this combined structure? Is it a sufficient condition uh, to form a, a double 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 bar or not? And what other conditions should be explored? Like uh, specific host properties, maybe. Uh, uh, specific properties of a halo, of the disk, uh, or interaction geometry maybe. Uh, and of course, one of my <laughs> favorites, uh, the presence in the state of gas, because gas complicates things a lot. And these were just pure um, and body simulations. So um, yeah, um, thank you for your attention. <laughs> Thank you for a very interesting talk. And now we can have a couple of questions if you want. Yes, let's start over there. Hi, uh, very nice talk. I, you may mention it, but maybe I lost it. Are these two bars coplanar? So they're misaligned. I understood this, but are they on the same plane? Uh, yeah. Okay. Yeah, we didn't, we didn't include that in... Uh, in our paper, I think, uh, but I did some analysis on um, uh, vertical, uh, on edge on view specifically. And we didn't really notice any uh, you know, misalignment or anything. And unfortunately, I expected to, to see some buckling maybe, but we didn't observe that as well, so. Okay, thank you. Yep. Uh, over here, okay. Thank you for the talk. Um, um, maybe you mentioned it and I missed it, but um, do these two bars have um, similar pattern speeds? And in general, in the study that you that you did with here, do you find that the bars that are formed from interactions are tend to be slower than bars that are formed secularly? What is their uh, correlation ratio? 
radius over the bar length, for example? Uh, no, we didn't really go into the uh, calculation of that and we didn't really uh, explore that. That was on my to-do list, but I never got to do it, actually. So that would be interesting. So. Uh, yeah. yeah. Well, thanks, Francesca. I had a question, why does it have to be a flyby? What is special about a flyby? If you have a, a satellite that is bound but on an eccentric orbit, could you also generate double bars? Or what is, is it because it goes away again? Or wh why should uh, there the, only... Yeah, I think it's, uh, it was named, uh, I mean, for non-merger, inter for interactions that don't end up merging, there's a lot of different uh, names for some reason, even though those are, I mean, some people call uh, interactions that don't, don't end up uh, yeah, but if you have a as, bound, as mergers, if you have a bound some call, yeah, some call them, them, I don't know, flybys, or uh, or there's also you know uh, close uh, close passages, close interactions. I saw many different you yeah. know phrases used for for the type of interaction. Mm -hmm. But uh, this uh, specific, we adopted this one because we were basing it on. Um, uh, statistical analysis of cosmological simulations, mm -hmm. and they defined flybys as really close interactions. Yeah. But I assume that it can work. I mean, if we're classifying interactions based on their um, interaction strength, it can it can also it can also be some distant, maybe some distant. It doesn't have to be close, but mm -hmm. if it's a distant interaction, it's, it needs to be slower in order to be stronger yeah. and uh, of higher mass ratio higher it could also be a satellite yeah. and, which is um, bound i isn't think it? Uh, yeah I, yeah I think i need to add uh, one more thing uh, yeah it's uh, i think it's uh, it's called uh, it's named flyby because it's um, for uh, two specific galaxies uh, it's a one in a lifetime event mm -hmm. so yeah, but it's not necessarily only because it's a one in a lifetime event that you get double bars. You could also in a bound satellite if, uh, situation uh, get double bars, I assume or maybe not. I, I, Leah looks at me, I don't know, but probably not. No, no, no. I, I, think, I'm not I think sure. it, 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 it can't really form because uh, uh -huh. Why? This, this, uh, this specific case is just uh, inner parts of spiral arms winding up and forming a bar. But mm. uh, if we would have, uh, for example, a satellite, mm. it would, um, it would constantly uh, affect the disk. Yep. And we know that, for example, um, spiral arms that, that form um, from tidal interactions mm -hmm. from satellites are um, constantly revitalized. I think that's mm -hmm. the term. Uh, so so uh, they yeah. wouldn't have enough time to wind up. Mm -hmm. they OK. Well, thank you. So it, okay. Very good. So yeah, but no. Uh, okay. Yeah. So when the two bars are synchronized at the end, their major axes are from that point on fixed. Um, can you repeat? So uh, you have when at the, the end. You said that they are synchronized. Yeah. Then the two major axes of the two bars. Yeah, their major axes are aligned. The, are aligned. Yeah, yeah. So uh, then. In this final bar, do you find a kind of X2 flow, uh, perpendicular, let's say, bar-like feature at the end? Or can we say that in flybys, this feature does not exist? Let me check that out. Because there's another A2 component over there, but it's perpendicular to the main one. But if it is washed out because of this interaction, it would be good yeah, to know. That it, it, it exists like... Um, I mean, if you have finally a bar, yeah. then it evolves like a single object. Yeah. Then, depending on the pattern speed, of course, but it can develop an X2 flow and then will it somehow be traced like as an some, um, A2 component. Uh, yeah, it can develop some, I think, um, like a certain warping maybe at the edges that uh, 
look like they're 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 going to make um, spiral structures like look... in, in, at the center of the object, of course, at the, the central region of the object. If there is in the central, it, in the center, like an X two flow. No, 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 no. no we within. don't find well, that's the right guess, but okay, thank you. Okay. We didn't yeah. really look into it. Yeah. Honestly. Very good, Daniel. Uh, just to <laughs> precise, uh, the new bar is uh, inside the big bar, the first bar, or outside? After, after the interaction, yeah, you you see a new bar arriving. Is it inside the previous bar or outside? No, no, no. Initially, we don't have any bar, and any uh, bar. yeah, and after the Paris Center, uh, we have just a you know. Uh, as expected, a tail, mm -hmm. and then Im immediately after we get a short bar that forms and uh, um, and a spiral structure that basically starts uh, from the end of the bars. So, mm -hmm. so like a grand design, spirals, and yeah, that early that later on evolves to uh, wind up and wrap around the the early form of the bar. Mm -hmm. So uh, both bar uh that that bar and uh and spiral structure uh are formed due to this event in mm -hmm. isolation however our model remains axisymmetric at all times oh oh or for i think four giga years or something so there, there's mild instability we get some weak bar at the end mm -hmm. okay. yeah so Oh, yeah, sure. Thank you for an interesting talk. Uh, just uh, a small question. Have you tried to compare uh, your simulations with the case when there is no flyby? What is forming if you consider only a single galaxy, isolated galaxy? What is forming? What is forming in the central area of your simulations? Oh, you, you mean is in uh, isolated in a model? Yes. In the, uh, you just uh, yeah, the first yeah. thing you probably should do is to compare and check. Yeah, yeah, we had that as a control simulation, obviously. To to and, uh, and yeah, yeah, the model the model remains axis symmetric for as I said for I think four and a half uh, giga years. Or so, so it's. Uh, so there is also a bar. It, yeah, that's. That, yeah. But how different its parameters from the parameters of the bar you obtain in your simulations with flybys? Have you checked? No. <laughs> I didn't. No, I didn't hear you properly. I'm oh, sorry. Okay. okay. Uh, thank you very much. I, I just asked. It's a very, very good question. You need to discuss it. Yeah. Yeah. So what 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 is the initial condition leading to, and what is the flyby leading to? So that's basically the the question. So what what did you put in, and what do you get out? But you can discuss maybe during lunch. It's a good question. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Um, if there are no other questions, thank you very much for a nice discussion. <clears throat> nice. And so now we have Charles Sakunas. And he talks about a major merger model for Andromeda, recent accretion event in direct comparison with chemodynamical observations. Do you have a laser? Yeah. Thank you. 
Okay, hello, uh, my name is Karl Chakonas. Yes, I am a PhD student in the University of Athens. So my uh, PhD thesis um, utilizes a major learning simulation to describe, to explain the evolution of Andromeda Galaxy 1031. So uh, on the bottom left, there are my collaborators with the first three of them being my PhD uh, supervisors. So it's Nathan Nabolvi from ESO, Francois Hammer from uh, Paris Observatory, and Justin Nakamitri from uh, University of Athens. So the title of my talk today would be A Major Merger as the Origin of the Giant Stream and Einer Hello Substructures in the Andromeda Galaxy. Here I'm putting uh, into scale uh, M31's disk and a more uh, familiar celestial side, the moon, just to comprehend or to convey the huge angular extent that M31 spans on the sky. And of course, we will discuss what challenges this poses uh, to uh, observations of especially the Einer Hello the halo of the stellar series of M31. Okay, the abstract of my talk, the synopsis of my talk would be, uh, first of all, I will put into context the Milky Way galaxy, our own Milky Way, and M31. Uh, mainly focusing on how can we explain the, uh, some of the properties based on the, of the, on the epoch of the last significant, uh, essentially the last major galaxy. Then I will uh, discuss the principal properties of M31, all of them suggestive of uh, recent major measures in, uh, in M31. And then I will turn to the simulation at some point where we introduce our next representation, which is the mass ratio between the two disk projectors of one and four. And then I will uh, discuss the recent study. So we can assess the dynamical properties of the remnant disk in the model of the simulated disk and compare with different observations. Now, we wanted in the study to extend the parameter space of the model in order to include LCD in order to do uh, comparisons with a lot of observations in MCAT1, both in the disk and the stellar table. Now, we uh, will present this chemodynamical comparison with uh, recent observations. Uh, some of them are really important in terms of MCAT1 studies. And I will end up with our main conclusions and a future outlook. Okay, uh, Andromeda versus our own Milky Way. Uh, both of which galaxies are those cornerstones of galaxy evolution study. Uh, they share the same morphological type, they're both spirals, more or less they have the same mass, so you have a billion mass, but M31 is the ideal laboratory for galaxy factor studies. Why? Because First of all, we're not hampered by being inside the disk of the one. We are outside, so we have a very side view of the stellar halo, which you can see that there is a number of substructures. Yeah, in the stellar halo of the one. Now, it is also relatively nearby, so we can do some interaction between the individual stars, both in the disk and the iron halo. Now, if we want to put into context the stellar scale of the properties of the stellar scale of the galaxies, what we see is that they actually lie on the opposite sides of this diagram. Where I'm plotting on the, they are plotting the, on the x-axis the stellar mass of the halo and on the, um, the y-axis the mechanism of the stellar halo. So M31 is essentially approximately 10, the stellar scale of M31 is approximately 10, 10 times more metal rich and approximately 20 times more massive. So if we use cosmology, sorry, and body simulations to explain uh, the features of this halo, we uh, assess that um, it is the time of the, the last significant uh, major, uh, major event that actually uh, creates this difference in the halo. With Milky Way's last major measure probably be at around 8 to 10 giga years, Whereas um, um, the last major addition in one was very recently, probably two to three million years ago. Okay, what are the observational evidence uh, of a major merger in MPT1? I will start by discussing the disk of MPT1, and then on the next slide, I will discuss um, the properties of the halo. So, first of all, <clears throat> we have a very start formation two to three giga years ago, widespread all over the disk of MPT1. This we know from um, deep HST observations in the northeast quadrant of the disk of the galaxy, where uh, isochronic heating actually resulted in uh, a peak of star formation rate 
two to three years ago. Then uh, we have a steep age velocity dispersion in the disk of M31. Uh, just to give an example, let me say for the giant grand stars, for that's not 40 years old, we have more or less three times the velocity dispersion of uh, the equivalent age population in the Milky Way. So the disk of M31 is significantly kinematically hot. Then we have two distinct disk structures, uh, kinematically and chemically distinct thin and thick disks. So this we know by a widespread uh, white field survey of planetary nebula in the disk, where we saw that uh, there were essentially two families of planetary nebula, one of, one of them associated with the cold uh, thin disk, one of them associated with the uh, hot thick disk. Uh, now, from the same study, when uh, when there was uh, chemical evolution models were utilized to explain the abundances of planetary nebula, these models required uh, secondary info of metal cooler gas in the disk in order to be explained. Now, if we go to the stellar scale of M31, first of all, we see a lot of substructures, namely the giant stream. This is the most prominent stream in any galaxy. Uh, the local group, we see two cells, the western cell and the northeast cell, and we see the northern clump and the G1 clump. I will mainly discuss one, two, three structures, but what we, okay, so from analysis of the global magnetic diagram of stars within these substructures, and also by analysis of the plan of uh, the planetary nebular luminosity functions of uh, the PME, people saw that we can distinguish, uh, we can group some of the substructures, or I mean, we can group some of the substructures together. Uh, one category being disk like uh, cell populations, and the other one stream like cell populations. So, in a sense, we can infer that maybe one, two, three uh, substructures in the end of the one share the same progenitor, they are of the same origin. Now, uh, what is particularly interesting in terms of the uh, substructures in the end of one? Here we have the G1 clump. This is categorized as a disk like cellular population. Uh, so, initially, people thought that this is um, uh, from a dwarf progenitor. Uh, but then, when we saw the metallicity of this structure, we saw that it is particularly metal rich. So, it cannot have a dwarf progenitor. And it's actually rotating with the disk, it is kinematically cold. Now, this structure actually emerges in a major major simulation because actually the perturbation from, from, the, from the secondary galaxy wraps the disk in a sense, creating their stellar over density, which we observe as the G1 clump. Again, this is suggestive of the mass of the secondary galaxy that came in merge with M31. Okay, just to put things into context in terms of the two disks of the galaxy. So, for the Milky Way, we can say that this is mostly the secular evolution of the kinematica that makes uh, two distinct thing, disk structures. Whereas in M31, with the steep age velocity dispersion, we need a merger to produce it. We cannot produce such a kinematically hot disk without a major merger. It cannot be secularly induced. We cannot reach this high uh, values of velocity dispersion in all stars. Now, we have different uh, arrangement of structures uh, of the two disks. So, the thin disk of M31 is essentially less extended than the thick disk, whereas it is the opposite for M31, for sorry, the Milky Way. Again, this is also suggestive about the formation history of the two disks. And finally, we have a more or less stable star formation rate for the past 88 years uh, for the Milky Way, whereas we, we see the best of star formation in the disk of M31. So what we wanted to suggest is that, again, it is the time of the last significant merger event in the two galaxies that actually results in these differences uh, in terms of their disk properties. With uh, gas potential largest being further in the past for, for the Milky Way, whereas probably the last major merger of M31 is relatively recent. Okay, then, uh, having discussed the traditional properties, let's turn to the simulation report. We utilize a major merger uh, simulation to model the uh, last significant event. We have two disk progenitors, essentially two thin disks, which have stars and gas, with the gas disk being more extended than the stellar disk. 
we need gas because we have significant uh, observational suggestions that this, we need a wet vector. We cannot have a dry vector in non uh, one And we end up with distinct thin and thick disks, and we don't reproduce the morphology of the angular subtractions. Okay, here I have uh, highlighted in the model the giant tree and the two cells. Essentially, these are the three subtractions that we're going to use uh, to make comparisons. Now, I can also segregate in the model particles that are coming from the main progenitor, the more massive galaxy, and particles that are coming from the secondary progenitor, the four times less massive galaxy. So we can see that, uh, as expected, the secondary, secondary particles comprise the substructures in the halo of N31. And, okay, uh, fortunately, uh, some speakers saw this before. So we can see the galaxy. Okay, first of all, we can see it as it is on the sky, but then I can see it also from the side. Essentially, plot our line of sight um, view of the galaxy. So what is particularly interesting here is that if you see on the um, left-hand uh, left side panel, we see that a secondary galaxy actually uh, feeds these loops, which are actually collapsing when we see the galaxy from our viewpoint. So it is this intricate morphology that results from different perispheric passages of the secondary, and it is actually pointing to the region of the giant stream because for y values below zero, we have essentially the region of the time stream. So this is going to be used when we want to decipher the properties of the giant stream in terms of the metallicity and their kinematics, etc. Okay, uh, we want to add the metallicity to the major measure model. Now, what we had to do initially is that we have to set the initial metallicity distribution in the two progenitors. Why? Because in the model, this is a free parameter. The only thing that the model gives us is the enrichment during its course. So we need to set the initial metallicity, add the enrichment, and end up with one single value for every star and gas in the simulation. So how do we do this? We leverage two constraints. First of all, we have the stellar mass metallicity relationship at a redshift approximately equal to one. This is where the simulation begins, more or less 7.5 years ago. We have a relationship that constrains the, the average metallicity, the average oxygen abundance within the effective radius of galaxies uh, compared with the uh, according to their stellar mass. More or less, the more massive the galaxy is, the more metal is. And then uh, we um, take an assumption that is consistent with the stellar mass metallicity relationship, and then we add the enrichment and in order to check the consistency of our assumption, we compare the final metallicity with the two families of planetary nebula with oxygen abundance of the two families of planetary nebula from uh, a particular survey. And we end up consistent. So now we can actually do comparisons with observations. Now to assess uh, the relevant properties of the disk, we can probe uh, the metallicity gradient along the galactosecity gradients. So we have grouped uh, the model stars into two families in the model, and we have reasons based on the star formation history of M31, if anyone wants to can discuss this. And what we essentially see is that uh, the model gradient, the gradient in the model in the disk, actually brackets uh, observed metallicity gradients from different probes and different stellar populations. Okay, now in terms of uh, M31 observations, you remember the first slide, I showed you that uh, the huge angular extent that M31 spans on the sky. So we have, in a sense, ground dated observations uh, on M31, and this is with the dark energy spectroscopic instrument, DESI. So we need a, a wide field of view, and this is what DESI gave us. They gave us a wide field of view coverage of the standard field of M31. So we will probe three different regions. First of all, we have the observations that uh, encompasses the giant stream region. So here what we're plotting is uh, the phase space from observed stars by this. Phase space meaning we have the arc projected in the x-axis and uh, m at one centric velocity in the y-axis. So what we saw is coherent regions in the phase space. These are kinematically, uh, this is a group of stars coherently moving essentially in this uh, 
extend in this uh, region or, uh, of the stellar failure. Now, can we use the model to explain these uh, features of the space phase? And the answer is yes, because on the right hand side, I'm showing you the same region in the model. Again, I'm plotting the phase phase. You can see that actually these uh, regions also emerge in, in the model. In a sense, we would not explain this if we assume a minor threat scenario, because if you have a situation of being just one from uh, the structure, like a thing is uh, it will not have multiple components in the same region. And this is actually the presence of these multiple components in the phase space. We already knew this from pencil beam spectroscopy in the same regions. But now it is like from this white coverage, this uniform coverage of Desi, uh, we see it more clearly. So this region can be explained as these successive loops uh, in the giant stream that actually have their actual different components collapsing along the line of sight, building these regions. Okay, uh, same idea, but for the north cell, again, we see this time we see two wedge patterns in the north cell. This is the observed region of the line of halo. Now, these are typical signatures of radial mergers. What the sensor is now, like the secondary galaxy, here is the gravitational potential of the main. It goes to an apost stars are going to an apost center, they return to the gravitational potential of the main. So this actually builds a cell-like feature in morphological terms and something like a chevron or a wedge pattern in the phase space. Again, these features are also emerge in our uh, major matter simulation, uh, where we see two wedge patterns in the same angular region. What's particularly interesting is that the angular wedge, okay, I have segregated again particles, all particles in the region, main gender particles, and secondary gender particles. So, what we see is that uh, the angular wedge is actually produced by main gender particles. Again, this is kind of suggested for the main for the mass of the secondary because you need a sufficiently massive object to drag particles from the main galaxy and create a secondary wedge in this region. Okay, uh, then we have the western cell again, a different region observed by Desi. They are blocking their phase space. We are doing the same for the same region in the model. Again, we have a wedge pattern, this cell. We reproduce it in the model. So again, uh, it is somehow the data are somehow echoed in model stars. Okay, we have the, the metallicity and distances uh, along the giant stream. So again, here I'm plotting only the region of the giant stream. And on the left side panel, the blue points are uh, stars in the model. Everything else is observations. So we, again, we see these uh, successive loops. Of course, we do not see them uh, as uh, the galaxy project from the sky, this will be collapsed along like, the line of sight. But again, <clears throat> uh, photometric studies show that if they wanted to plot the distribution function of Milky Way distances, even for photometry alone, they saw uh, double peak distributions. Again, this is a hint for the multi component nature, let's say, of the time stream, which is actually um, favored in the model. If you want to compare the metallicity, let, the right hand side. Record uh, panel, we see that <clears throat> the metallicity along the giant stream is not like a linear function of distance, of perspective distance. What we see is that it features a kink in the metallicity in the middle parts. It means that the giant stream is actually more metal rich in the middle parts of it. And again, this uh, trend actually emerges in the model, naturally emerging actually from this uh, multi component nature of the giant stream. Okay, I, I will wrap up with uh, my conclusions. So, uh, we established the metallistic framework within the context of a major metric model. We have reasons to assume that the last significant case design of the uh, M31 is a major merger. Uh, <clears throat> we uh, conducted an examination of the chemodynamical properties of the remnant disk, the metallistic gradient compared with observations. We saw that these coherent kinematic features that emerge in the phase space of stars by Desi, which is a result of spectroscopy, uh, are actually echoed in model stars. And more importantly, the reproduction of some of them, they further corroborate in a sense, they further meet 
a major merger scenario to account for that. You cannot account for the multiple breaches in the phase space of the giant stream if uh, the giant stream is coming from a minor merger where you have just a single component structure. And again, uh, the two wedge patterns the north and south, again, the axis of the of the mass of the second galaxy. And also the simulated set of one analog, we saw that it predicted the trend, this kink of the metallicity in the central parts of the giant stream, naturally merging in this scenario. And just a forward outlook, so we want to investigate the two orbital families of globular clusters in the hail of M31. So what we have seen is that we have two families of globular clusters rotating in the M31 halo with a relevant angle uh, with them. So it's like two families of globular clusters that may be associated with the last major merger in M31. Now, I haven't, we haven't even investigated just the INF properties of uh, the radial distributions of stars within the context of uh, the major merger. We want to assess radial migration. We want to uh, investigate where are the gas particles that are actually reforming the thing is where are they coming from? And are they coming preferentially from the outskirts of their progenitors? So where are they coming from? And we have a recent collaboration with Ivana Scala from Space Telescope Science Institute, where they have recent observations around M32. M32 is a, a satellite of, of M31. We can use the model to, to make direct comparisons with the observations. So thank you very much. Really very interesting, thank you. So we have time for a couple of questions. Ah, yeah, let's, let's go to the, that's your, that's yours. Hi, great talk. Um, just since you mentioned M32, um, do you have any opinions at the moment whether or not that could be say like the nuclear remnant of the major merger or not? Because I know. Yes, like I guess in your simulations it gets totally disrupted, yeah. but I've heard theories that M32 is like the like the nucleus of whatever yeah. the major merger is. Do you have any ideas at okay, the moment on that? Great question. Uh, so there were some recent observations, not observations, simulations. Actually, they took some uh, simulations from TNG. Are you familiar with the Susan Bell paper? Yeah. Okay. So what we think is that uh, the kinematics are not consistent in a sense because the, in these simulations, M32 is actually red shifted, whereas we know that it is blue shifted in this particular uh, area. I mean, the stars are blue shifted there. So, uh, okay, in this simulation, the rem the, there is no remnant. I mean, the, the, the secondary galaxy completely dissolves in the last recent passages. Um, we cannot say for sure that this M32 how it uh, comes into play, but uh, we have certain reasons to believe that uh, the PNG analogs have some inconsistencies, kinematic, kinematic inconsistencies with what we observe for, for M31. Great, thanks. Yeah. Wonderful, yeah. That's... <clears throat> Thank you for the very interesting talk. Um, I'm just trying to understand your methodology a little bit better in terms of how the model and the, and the simulation work. You, you start with two individual um, disks. Okay, so, so how are you starting a certain amount back in time and then you evolve in time of the interaction happening or am I misunderstanding? Yeah, so uh, the simulation starts at about seven, let's say that it runs for 7.5. Okay, it doesn't run. We select a snapshot. Okay, you have to select a snapshot in the simulation. So we start with two disks. The, the two disks are relaxed for one giga year in more or less isolation. And, and you make some assumption about the initial... Um, stellar like. disk, exponential, two exponential disks. Uh, yeah. Stellar disk and the three times more extended gas disk and the dark matter phase, that's all. Okay, and they're physically separated. And then, yeah, they're physically separated. Yeah, yeah, exactly. The star formation rate and everything else is separated. Yeah. yeah. And, then, and then the interaction occurs. And then they, you have the first patient passage, uh -huh. and then the two galaxies... I mean, they lie in uh, large distances, and then second patient passage of merger. Ah, okay. And okay. lot of patient passage of merger. Yeah. I see. Okay, thank you. Maybe you should show an animation. I have it, but oh, yeah, why don't you show it? I mean, this is interesting. In the meantime, of course, Francesca. 
Yeah, yeah, show it now. Right. Let it run while we discuss. Because that makes things very clear. Ah, wow. Oh, not bad. Okay, okay. Yeah, no, no, that's okay. We have four billion years, we can wait. Uh, uh, ah, yeah, good. <clears throat> oh, yeah. Okay, okay so Francesca. Okay, very cool movie. Um, so, yeah, really interesting talk. I have a lot of questions, but we can chat later. But I, so one question was, um, so you show this kink in the metallicity, which I'm guessing is coming from the metallicity gradient that's assumed for the galaxy, exactly. the initial galaxies. So is that something you've played around with to change the metallicity gradient and see how that will affect the kink? And does it give you some constraint on the initial metallicity gradients? Okay, very nice question. So the production of, of this kink in the giant stream, of course, depends on the assumed gradient, especially in the secondary galaxy, because it's mostly the secondary galaxy that builds the giant stream. We assume a gradient of minus 0 0.1 dex per kpc, which is pretty reasonable in terms of comparing observations. Of course, it plays a role, but since we have assumed something that it is reasonable enough with the MZR, and it's also consistent with the final metallicity that we get when we compare with uh, abundances in the disk, we are more or less okay. We think that we are more or less okay, but of course it's highly dependent on the initial gradient. Yes. It would be interesting to play around a bit with that and see how much it yes, changes. Yes, but it depends on how much do you want to play around. I mean, you need to have something that is actually observed in galaxies. Yeah, I, I mean, I guess if you show that it's not realistic, then it rules out some metallistic gradients, which is, an, which is already interesting. Well, I think that the, the, um, so the constraints that we have in the MZR from the MZR in terms of the gradient back in 7.5 years ago are not so constraining, but you can take like say minus 0 0.3 dex per KPC. And you may reproduce it. I mean, there are papers that actually do this. We think that it is somehow a good result of the model that we can take something that it is reasonable enough, minus 0 0.1, and uh, get this gene just from this multi-component structure that emerges in the major model simulation. But we can discuss more on this, of course. Okay, I think we need to continue the last talk before the lunch break. Thank you. It will be by Camilla Desafreitas, deriving bar formation epoch in nearby galaxies, first insights on secular evolution. Thank you. Uh, oh, wait, we are. No. This is not going to work. Is this okay? Okay. No, the, the uh, that's not going to work. Can I do the? the... <laughs> yeah, can I do that? Can I? Yeah. Very close. I'm going to behave. Okay. Uh, this is not working. Okay. So not going to hold it. No, that's fine. Thank you. Oh. Thank you, everyone. It's the last talk before lunch, so I'm also hungry, so let's get to it. I'm going to be talking about my work on timey bar formation epoch in nearby galaxies and a little bit on secular evolution. And here by secular evolution, I'm talking more about internal evolution, which is not always interchangeable. But here we're going to be talking more about internal evolution. I thought of starting um, a little bit of why we care about bars, because this is a disk dynamical workshop so i thought it would be nice to emphasize why we care about them so the first reason is that bars uh, many works they associate them with disk settling in the universe so if we think about a general picture of galaxy evolution we have in the early universe this messy morphological galaxies 
Then in intermediate redshift, we start seeing disks, but they are still quite turbulent. And by intermediate, take whatever range you prefer, because with James Webb, this is in debate right now. Uh, and then in the local universe, we start having something more ordered, uh, these galaxies like. And when we think about a general picture, we can see that there is an evolution of the processes itself, where in the early universe, we have external processes play an important role in the evolution of the galaxy. But in the local universe, we start seeing some internal evolution as well. And one question is when this starts to transition in general in the universe. So when do we have this internal evolution kicking in in the galaxies? One way of looking at that is looking at the bars in the galaxies, mainly because some studies find that the bar formation uh, takes place shortly after the disk settles. So after you have a disk with cold dynamics, you're very prone to form the bar. So the moment of the formation of the bar can be associated with this settling in the universe. So that's reason number one. Reason number two is that the bar will affect the host galaxy in many different ways. Uh, some examples are it will redistribute material, gas, stars, angular momentum. Re it can cause a global quenching. So the idea is that if you're pushing the gas from the disk to the inner part of the galaxy, then the disk itself declines the star formation rate. And you also have structure formations. You have pseudo bulges in your disks. You have the bulge, uh, the pox binet bulge. You have many structures that are formed because of the presence of the bar. And reason number three is that more than half of the galaxies in the lo local universe have bars. So when we start looking at bar fractions for different uh, redshifts in the local universe, if you consider both strong and weak bars, we have more than half of the galaxies, of these galaxies having bars. So just to summarize why we care about bars, they are associated with the dissettling in the universe. They affect the host galaxy. More than half of the these galaxies in the local universe have bars. And also some studies found that they are robust and long-lived structures. So in summary, once they form, they affect the galaxy for a long time. And this has been happening with more than half of the galaxies in the local universe. So if we want to understand the evolution of these galaxies, we need to consider bars. And then the question I'm more interested now is when these bars formed, which is not very trivial to understand. So when did bars form? When we look in nearby galaxies, we, have, we can find the, the bars very easily. And then you can maybe think, well, let's study the stellar population of these bars and we can understand how old they are. The problem is that when we're talking about bar formation, we're talking about a dynamical formation, which means that the stellar population of the bar does not correspond to the bar formation itself, mainly because the bar will be formed by stars that are already present in the disk. So a lot of times when we're looking to the stellar population of the bar, uh, they are gonna be older than the dynamical formation of the bar. So that's the problem here. What we can do is um, use bar build structures. Yes, so as I said, once the bar forms, uh, it shocks the gas in the disk, it pushes the gas inwards. So we can see here this shock and the bar lay in the dust lanes. Um, and then it builds a structure that we call nuclear disk. Uh, it also has been called as Zelda bulge, disk bulge, and other names. I'll be naming it as nuclear disk during this talk, okay? So it's a secondary disk in the center of the galaxy uh, that forms because of the presence of the bar. So the idea here is that we use bar built structures to time when the bar formed. Just very briefly how we can find these nuclear disks. Um, and here it's very obvious because the nuclear disk in NGC, I think 1097, it's star forming, so it's easy to find them. But we don't need them to be star forming to find them. We can look into the kinematics. So in this spatial map and also the radio map, I'm showing the V over sigma of this case. And what happens is that the structure has low dispersion, so the V over sigma peaks, and then we can easily identify them kinematically. But there is a catch, and the catch is that we have unresolved stellar populations. So what happens is that the gas will be funneled in or words by the bar, we're gonna form the nuclear disk, but there was already some stars there, right? So it's not an empty space. We already had stars from the main disk in that region. So when we look into the solar population of these galaxies, especially of the nuclear disk region, 
we're not looking only the stars that belong to the nuclear disk, but also stars that were already present when the nuclear disk formed. And this is where we enter with a methodology to distinguish them. So very briefly, how can we time the bar formation in nearby galaxies? Um, in this scheme, we have a bar and how we observe the nuclear disk in red. And just a comment, in this case, we've been using MUSE data cubes. So what we do is that we select a region around the nuclear disk, and we consider this region to be representative of the stars that were already present before the nuclear disk was formed. So that's the idea. It's very similar to what has been done with exoplanet atmospheres when they remove the stellar light and what is left is considered the, uh, the exoplanet atmosphere. So with this uh, spectra, we model the main disk in the nuclear disk region here in green, and then we subtract it from the original data and we have the nuclear disk uh, in blue and the contrast is very bad, I'm sorry. But the idea is that whatever is left belongs to the nuclear disk itself. So once we have this separate structures, each one of them a different data cube, uh, what we can do is derive independent star formation histories. So in red is the star formation history uh, as we observe, and then in blue is the star formation history just of the nuclear disk, and in green, the star formation history that was already present before the formation of the nuclear disk. Of course, this is a very ideal case, uh, and we were interested to understand if this approach would be valid to understand when bars formed. So what we did is that we tested this approach in simulated galaxies. What we found after many tests is that the disentanglement of the star formation histories is not that perfect. We still have contamination, but a good proxy to the moment of the bar formation is to use the ratio of the star formation history of the nuclear disk over the main disk. So we're gonna do the ratio of these two. And when this is above one for the first time is when we have the bar age. Again, this is all, is schematic, so let's look into how this actually looks into the data, right? We applied this for one galaxy in our pilot study, NGC 1433, and this is how the results look like. So again, the same color scheme, in blue we have the nuclear disk, in green the main disk, and when this ratio is above one is when we find the bar age. In this case, more or less 7.5. We have some errors for schematic, sorry, for systematics and also for um, the noise on the data. And this is the methodology in a nutshell. There are a lot of steps I didn't mention here, but just to make it uh, simplified for this talk. Okay, now that we have a methodology that is broadly applicable, in principle, if you have a nuclear disk that you can detect and you have good enough data, then you can apply this methodology. So what we do now, we apply for a larger sample so we can have some insights on the evolution of galaxies, internal evolution, right? What we did was to apply the, the same methodology to the timer sample. The timer sample was tailored with this purpose. So we're talking about 20 galaxies that have the Muse field of view, as you can see, in the center of the galaxy. So we have a good observation of the nuclear disk or whatever nuclear structure you have there. And then from that, we can apply our methodology. I'm not going to go into individual results because here I'm more interested in the general picture. But just to exemplify, we have the same individual results for all the 20 galaxies. And 20 might not sound like a lot, but it is the largest sample we have to the present with measured bar ages. So the first pressing question, question is how old are bars? This is the bar age distribution for our sample. So I think the first very obvious thing that we find is that we have a range of ages here. Bars are not only old or not only young. We find that this process of bar formation started in the early universe around Redshift 6 for our case, and it's ongoing, so we still have very young bars with ages of more or less one giga year old. But it's the first time we have this kind of results, and so we have, we can, um, we can, also push results and investigate different things for different galaxies, right? So what we did next was to understand how the bar age depends on the star formation rate of the nuclear disk, okay? So the idea is the bar is pushing gas inwards and you're forming stars. But this gas at some point will exhaust, will not be there anymore, so the star formation rate will decrease. So the next thing we did was to separate this um, between high and low star formation rate in the nuclear disk. 
So in purple here, we have the highest star formation uh, subsample, and they are hosted by younger bars. And then the lowest star formation rate are hosted by older bars, which is expected as you keep pushing gas inwards and this gas is not infinite. We also looked into the star formation rate with bar age. So we have a very nice anti-correlation uh, showing this to us that the nuclear disk itself will also eventually quench. So after the bar forms, the gas is pushed inwards, this gas will exhaust, and then you start decreasing the star formation rate in the nuclear disk. But if we think further, the quenching of the nuclear disk can be just a reflection of the quenching of the galaxy itself, because the gas in the main disk is just not there anymore. So another thing we looked into was the bar age with the distance to the main sequence. So the distance to the main sequence is telling us whether or not the galaxy is quenching, basically. So what we find is that negative values means that the galaxy is quenching. And we also find a very nice anti-correlation, which means the older the bar, the more quenched the galaxy is. So this is an indication that the bar is acting to quench the host galaxy. But again, it's the first time we have this kind of results and we can start doing a lot of fun things. So one that I really liked is how to connect this work with high redshift. So as I said, we have bar fractions for different redshifts, right? And now what we do have is bar ages and these bars, they were formed at some point in the universe. So what I wanted to do is to connect my work with bar fractions with different uh, redshifts. How can we do that? We can go from the bar age distribution and build a cumulative bar age distribution. So this becomes a proxy for bar fraction in different moments of the universe. But of course, all my galaxies are barred. So in the local universe, we have a bar fraction of 100%, which is not true. So what we did, we um, normalized this distribution to the current bar fraction we know that is 70%. And then this looks more or less like this in this curve in green. So again, is a bar fraction derived from the bar ages in the local universe. And how did they compare to the observations is like this. So when we look into different works, they actually agree very well with different bar fractions of the universe, starting from a completely different, uh, sorry, from a complete, completely different starting point. So this is also very interesting and including to, to works into higher redshifts. shifts. Okay, I still have some time, so I'm gonna talk about other results. So what's the role of downsizing? The idea of downsizing is that the most massive galaxies today were the first to assemble their mass in a very simplified way. So what does that mean? It means that maybe the most massive galaxies were the first ones to form bars. The idea here is that, as I said, with uh, the, sorry, as I didn't say, but I, I should have said, with the evolution of the galaxy, it starts assembling enough mass to form the disk. So the idea is that maybe these more, more massive galaxies, they formed the disk before. So it's very easy to test this now. What we need to do is just compare the stellar mass with bar age. And in our case, for these 20 galaxies, we don't see any correlation. So what does that mean? It can be due to many different things. Uh, one thing that we think it can be true is that the massive galaxies today probably had a more active assembly history in the sense that they had more mergers and they, it took longer for them to settle in a cold dynamic. So maybe even though they are massive galaxies, they didn't form the bar first. And the idea here is that, well, having enough mass, it's necessary, but it's not the only thing that will allow the galaxy to form a bar or not. So this is also one, one of the results we can only test now from observations. And I'm looking forward to expand the sample to understand how this reflects in other bar uh, mass ranges. Uh, what else we can look now, for example, it's if bars grow or not. So we have different bars, we have bars with different ages, and we can understand are older bars bigger or not. For this, we consider the normalized uh, bar size. So it's the bar divided by the size of the entire disk of the galaxy, okay? So what we find is that um, when you look at the normalized bar length with bar age, you do have a correlation. So older bars tend to be bigger and younger bars tend to be smaller compared to the host galaxy in general. Um, this could be an indication that bars grow, but at the same time, when we compare to simulation work, it's not necessarily the case. So 
uh, in Fraguchi this, this year, 2024, they did the same analysis. So that plot is exactly the same, but it's inverted. And they do find as well that the size of the, the bar grow, sorry, the older bars tend to be bigger. But when they check individually, because you can do this in simulations, when they check individually if the bar grew or not, what they find is that bars in higher redshifts, they form big, so they don't change a lot their sizes. In the intermediate redshifts, they grow, and then the young bars didn't have time to grow. So in this scenario, our results, they do agree with the scenario that bars can grow, but it's still not clear if all of them will grow or not. This depends also on the formation mechanism. So this is, until, this is still something we're looking into to understand if we can disentangle the formation mechanism or not. And one last thing uh, that I wanted to talk is if nuclear disks grow. It's the same idea, so we look into the normalized size of the nuclear disk. Uh, the scenario of the growth of the nuclear disk is a little bit different. The idea here is that the gas is pushed inwards and the position of this gas, the place of this gas, will move outwards. So you will be building the nuclear disk inside out. And what we do find is that, again, you do have a correlation, but we can go a bit further in the nuclear disk and we can investigate the star formation histories inside the nuclear disk over time. So this is more or less like how it looks like. It's a bit confusing, so to give some explanation. I looked into the star formation history inside the nuclear disk for different rings. Purple is the innermost and then yellow is the outermost uh, ring. And in the upper part, you have the mean ages of the star formation, sorry, of the nuclear disk. So what we find here is that the outer part of the nuclear disk is also young. And the idea is that it does look like the, the nuclear disk, they grow inside out. This is the case for most galaxies. It's also something I'm still looking into if it's the case for all the galaxies. And maybe this is a way we can disentangle whether or not these disks are formed bigger or not, right? Okay, so I talked a lot. I'm gonna leave some takeaway messages. The first, I think everybody agrees is that bars are important in galaxy evolution, at least more than half of the local disk galaxies. We developed the first broadly applicable methodology to time how old these nearby bars are. We find that the bar formation is an ongoing process that first took place in an early universe, but it's still happening. Uh, we find evidence of quenching in the galaxy related to the bar age. We don't find a correlation with downsizing, which means that the, the scenario is probably more complex than simply having enough mass. And we also measure an independent bar fraction over time. So that's it. Thank you. That was a very nice talk. Thank, Thank you very much. So we have time for a couple of questions. Thank you very much for the talk. I really enjoyed it. Um, this method works for bar galaxies that has a nuclear disk. Uh, do you have an alternative approach for bar galaxies that doesn't have a nuclear disk? No. no. So for now, no, because we so we expect the nuclear disk to form less than one giga year after the bar itself. So this is something some constraint we have for the nuclear disk. I believe we could use other structures that are caused by the bar, but we don't have an approach yet. But it's also not clear which percentage of bars do or do not have nuclear disks. So it's something open. Thank you. Let's see, and then not there. Yeah. Hi, Camilla. Thank you for the very nice talk. Um, now that you've got some understanding of when bars are forming, it, do you have any thoughts on why? they form at those times? Like what physical parameters are contributing to a bar forming quickly? How does it compare to the age of the galaxies themselves? Is it always sort of after the same amount of time or is it, you know, some form bars really early in their life and some form bars really late? Actually, no, there are some studies that find what can delay the bar formation. So first, well, we expected mass would be um, the limiting factor in the sense that you need enough mass to form the bar, right. but we don't really see any correlation there. Uh, there are some studies that find that it could be the bar fraction, sorry, the gas fraction. It can be the baryonic fraction and the dark metal halo. It can be, you have many different reasons to delay the bar formation. And I think now we can start testing these reasons with the sample, but I haven't done that yet. Thanks. You had a, you had a question? 
Hi, uh, thanks a lot for the excellent talk. Uh, I was curious what goes into your modeling of the uh, disk that was pre-existing there and the nuclear stellar uh, disk that you uh, um, extract. Yeah, so the, the main disk, we use the spectra around the nuclear disk as a, a proxy for, the, let's say, the stellar population, and then we consider the exponential uh, extrapolated light of the main disk towards to the center. So that's how we model it. We also did different modeling. We considered the flat light distribution as well to see how much this would affect the bar age. Uh, and we have a systematic of more or less one giga year that can affect our final result. Did that answer you? Yeah, okay. Okay. So I think we now have a lunch break. Pano, you tell us where, where to go. Thank you very much. Okay, now is uh, our lunch break time. Uh, it is very close, so practically it's uh, just the, at the corner of the block, behind the block that Academy ends. So just follow people of the local organizing committee or I can just tell you that if you go down the stairs or the way to the street, then I think the easiest way you can do either right or left, go to the left and then all the way up to the end of the block, cross the lights and there you will find a door doesn't look like a restaurant, but follow us and then enter it. This is our, it's the restaurant of the University of Athens, so it is not uh, with a label or something like that. Okay, so. And also please the, the speakers of the next session come in contact with the, yes. our technicians there yes, yes, uh, to the, give the, the PowerPoint or whatever you have, <laughs> just to organize your talk. <laughs> Do not forget about that. I'm going to be the chair. So. Ε, όχι, θα τα κλείσω εγώ. Σε μια μισή ώρα, ε, πάνω. Which microphone do you want to use? The hand one or this one? Yeah, because this one, this one is better. Yeah, for me too. And then we navigate using the keyboard. Yeah, you can navigate using the keyboard. I think there is the 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 slides keeper as well. Right? Uh, here. Yeah. But it don't work with this. Uh, I prefer to to use the okay. 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 Only for laser point. Only for laser, right? Yeah. Uh, you are there? Um, yeah, it's a uh, Paula. This is the first. Yeah, it's a. Uh, yeah. But uh, if it needs to be, if it doesn't work, it can be converted to PDF. Okay. Thank 
Thank you. Uh, no. Josh. Uh, oh, sorry, it just seems like there's a plot missing. Yeah, this one yes. here. Yes, it, it wasn't supposed to be here, plot? Yeah. Ah, I guess, yeah. But I think it's it has an animation for it. Because. Oh. Um, yeah. No, there's, a, no it's, there's another one. There's another one. Yeah. Ah, okay. Mm -hmm. I'll try to sort it out during the lunch. Yeah. And then, and then we can we can I'll arrive a bit earlier for the session to start. Yeah. Is it a problem? Can you do it on the mic? Um, I can do it on Linux, but I might just convert it to PDF and send it to you. Okay. Maybe we can This one would be the yeah. yes. That one. You are special one. Yeah. So this this purple. Yeah. And change the name of the tutorial. to go through a couple of slides. Yeah, feel free to change the name. I think it's okay. Thank you. Okay. Okay. Oh. Black for some reason, it should be transparent, but like it, it gives the, the message. Yeah, I'll just explain that. It's it, yeah. Luckily, the confidence intervals are very thin, so it looks like. It. Yeah, yeah. Yeah.
Is the mic on already? Is this microphone is on already? Yeah. No, no, no. It's the recording in progress is uh, it's some message that's uh, 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 on Zoom. I think people can hear. Yeah, no, I mean, I think people can hear. Good, good. I never thought I would be, have a British flag beside my name. Yeah, well, I don't <laughs> Legality, liberty. So do you like it in general? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I really like it. Yeah, because... you, you, you have come to your place? Yeah. Ah, and uh, Francesca also? Uh, oh, okay. Oh, okay. So you say you're not separate? Yeah. 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 It's so much work. Yeah. 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 You're separate? Yeah. Yeah. You don't mind the rain. That's why we come to places like this. <laughs> Summer schools. Yeah. No, no, no. Yeah, in summer there in Durham is really nice because it's like yeah. trying to find it. Yeah, yeah. yeah, because now We are ready to start, so please sit down. Uh, just let me see who are the speakers of the session uh, after Albert, after the coffee break. Can you raise your hands? So, okay, have you given the... Uh, okay, please do that in the coffee break. Okay, so everything is okay. So, Dimitri, we can start, yeah. Okay, um, so welcome back, everyone. I hope uh, you still have energy for a few talks. Um, we will start with Albert Bosma, with, uh, with one of our lecturers. Um, so he's, he's, having, he's giving us a one hour, one hour and a half talk. And it's about rotation curves of galaxies and dark matter. And there is something about cats as well, but uh, Albert will, <laughs> will mention. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Do, you want to give you a Do you want to give a 10 minute Yeah. Okay, thank you. Well, I thank the organizers for organizing in it here in such a nice place. And, uh, anyway, I'm talking mainly about rotation curves, as you might guess from the warning by Confucius, which is that the hardest thing in life is uh, finding a black cat in a dark room, especially if there is no cat. Now, the, if you substitute cat uh, with dark matter, uh, you're at the same position. We don't know what dark matter is, and we don't know whether it is. Okay, uh, I will quote a, a lot of, from the work of my thesis. Uh, I'll show you in the next slide why. Uh, and so this is a galaxy seen on the same scale, and you can see the velocity field with the H1 extends much further than the velocity field with the H alpha. And so, and then even further than the old Burbage, Burbage and Pentecost uh, rotation curve, which was one of their best ones. Okay, so let's see. Okay, I, I got some honor from the, uh, the IAU, which is that uh, there's a, an astro, a minor planet named Bosnava, 
And the reason is that I'm a Dutch astronomer, known for my thesis work. And I suggested that galaxies contain significant dark matter. That's what I wrote for it. Okay, and so Bosma is, uh, is, is, uh, is somewhere here. And there is also a planet, Alba, minor planet, Alba, who, who got lost. <laughs> so there is even a, an article about the lost one. It was re found, the reason they recovered. And it has a chaotic evolution, that is just as, just as I have. So, okay. This is the cover of my thesis. And I did it, uh, I'm here in 1970 at the opening of the Westerbork telescope. And so that was done by the Queen here and decided by Jan Oort, uh, which is the, was the major astronomer in Leiden uh, and in the Netherlands uh, at the time. Okay, now in order to get the telescope, he had to write a proposal. And so he, uh, he wrote a proposal for a Benelux cross, which was a, a project which uh, was in uh, was with Belgium and the Netherlands and Luxembourg. And so the Belgians copped out anyway. But the, the aim was to, to distinguish different cosmological models. And so there was nothing about the rotation curves or whatever. And so one of the most stunning discoveries when the, this was written uh, 25 years after the, uh, the Westerbork uh, thing was open. Uh, it arose from just a careful study of rotation. And so rotation rate did continue with rapid increase. It also didn't decline. That was my thesis. Okay, this is a, a picture take, uh, <coughs> taken by somebody who, while I was uh, talking about rotation curves to somewhere else. This picture is taken by Lia Artemisula of uh, me, uh, Thijs van der Hulst and Herman Fischer. Thijs van der Hulst uh, made a, a long career in astronomy and Herman Fischer unfortunately had to, had to cover up. Okay, uh, this is also something uh, you shouldn't wander into uh, the philosophy of science, although it helps if you know about it. But the knowledge of the history of science is even more important. That was what Stephen Weinberg was saying. Some people claim that the Rubik Port card, which is sometimes presented like this, uh, settled the dear, uh, dark matter question. Uh, it was pointed out here by Joel Pinnock uh, that these points are actually radio points. And so, uh, but even so. Uh, and so I actually took Freeman's value for M31 and calculated an exponential dispersion curve. And it, you see, you can just, you know, eyeball fit it. And uh, you find that the Rubin and Ford uh, data don't show any uh, trace of uh, <clears throat> that you would attribute to dark matter. It's only the radio points which, uh, which do it. And so the actual answer to this is, uh, is from in Freeman, and he actually discussed it for two galaxies in an appendix. So if they are correct, it must be additional matter which is undetected either, must be at least as large as the mass of the detected galaxy. And the distribution must be quite different. So that was a long shot at the time. Uh, Rubens uh, et al. in 1978 had uh, just roughly, well, uh, six months after they got a copy of the thesis. Uh, uh, they had a conclusion section with Roberts and its collaborators deserved credit for first calling attention to flat rotation curves. Okay, so that should remain in you. Now, there was a thing which is called the large uh, Synod, uh, LSST and was rebaptized uh, recently into Rubin Observatory in session 116 uh, of the uh, House of Representatives and has this number and it is said that Dr. Rubin published measurement of the Andromeda galaxies as a story of gas and gets gas all the in the center too fast to be explained by the amount of light associated with this light output for, of the stars. Okay, this is in direct contradiction with that. So I don't know how the, uh, the, the, the Americans work, but I mean, uh, well, there are other reasons to believe that they don't work very well. Uh, 
Another thing is, uh, what is the expected stuff? And you see sometimes people giving, oh, yeah, you, you, you expect it fall, to fall down to zero. This is Eric Selena, who was a, a, a serious physical, physical, physical physics man in, uh, in Amsterdam. He has a special theory about uh, dark matter. And so he, he compares this Keplerian drop-off with uh, what you expect. Uh, nobody expected that anyway. But Fukuchika also had it. And this is Argon, this is a, um, uh, a physics lab. And also, they expect it to go to zero. OK. Here's the opposite. <laughs> in Schwarzschild, in 54, he has a mass full of light in M31. And so this is his model, and these are the data points uh, then available. However, in an oral history uh, of the American Institute of Physics, the uh, Ostreicher said that Martin Schwarzschild showed me that he had a rotation of the Andromeda galaxy 20 years before, and I give the same way. The mass is extended, more extended than the light, and so uh, indicated dark matter. So I don't know how, how he came to that. But, uh, yeah. But you, you often see this curve still. It's, uh, you know, if you take V squared G, G over R as a function of the radius, uh, it goes down. No, you don't expect the mass of all of a sudden to go down right? as a function of radius in the spiral. And so even the, uh, the statues uh, on the castle uh, in Aix-en-Provence, they say, oh dear. <laughs> Okay, and here, well, Ostrager said here in his uh, oral history, well, back then we had a flat rotation curve. Yeah, well, was that true, actually? Well, this, this is flat, according to, to Ostrager. This is a bad box, uh, point. So, so you have to be careful. You don't have to believe everybody, what everybody writes. Okay, and uh, yeah, and so Rubin in 2011 said that, well, Robert and Whitehurst came 50% further out, further out, okay. Yeah. Regarding the, to Ostreicher, that was not the case. Yeah. And here's another, uh, well, that is just, it's uh, an introduction, part of the introductions of a Khalifa paper, okay. They, they called Roberts 1966, but okay, that goes out to just 120, which is uh, the, the radius of, uh, of uh, Andromeda is 110. So, and well, I mean, uh, this is declining. So, yeah. This is from Shimato, and this is the integrated position velocity diagram uh, over the whole data group. So. This red part is the uh, is the two, the the hundred and twenty argument by the side. Okay, let's go back to the historical studies just to see where we came from uh, from the nineteen thirties. So this is the uh, the Hubble uh, plot of velocity distance relations, uh, and this is the first point of Lemaitre about the, the determination of the Hubble constant. Okay. Then there was this Einstein de Sitter model, and this is a, a cartoon of de Sitter in the general trade trade journal. Yeah. And he said in that uh, this was a popular article in uh, 1930. And he said that, well, the life the lifetime of the universe is about the age of the earth. And uh, that's a very uncertain uh, problem. And so, on the other hand, uh, well, uh, they were happy that the, uh, the mass of the galaxy, uh, the average galaxy would, uh, would be, according to our estimate of our own galactic system. Okay. Now, there was already uh, data by Lundmark who, who also discussed this problem that the gravitational mass includes also the dark matter that's in the anacollective objects. And the anacollective objects, so the content of the dark matter, would be extinct stars, dark nebula matter, and meteors. And so, yes. And so he, uh, he proposed a table for a couple of galaxies, uh, the total absolute magnitude. 
and also then the uh, the <coughs> the ratio dark to uh, to visible matter for the many one it's off because the uh, the uh, many one uh, luminosity is off in in this thing. anyway uh, so in the uh, Ward said that well, the mass of the galaxy could be 2.04 10 to 10, 10 to the 11. So this, this is a very much higher precision than 2 times 10 to the 11. Anyway, he found that from stellar movements, uh, uh, which can infer the mass in the solar neighborhood. And so this this is the is, uh, which is the table he had. Was, uh, at that point in time, you could still write papers with 34 tables. Let's try now, uh, but anyway, uh, so he found the difference between dynamics and counter, and so the rest was well, supposedly dark. Uh, in in our solar neighborhood, there is cold gas which was later discovered, and so radio astronomy came up. It's still uh, striking that the uh, the dark matter in the solar neighborhood is estimated pretty close to. Uh, what happened. Okay, Stricky wrote a paper in uh, German over uh, Dunkel and Materi where uh, he just took uh, a couple of uh, galaxies uh, from uh, Hubble and Hammerson and worked out the uh, velocity dispersion, which was about a thousand. And uh, <clears throat> then he said that, well, I mean, uh, there could be uh, eight hundred nebula each 10 to 9 uh, solar. Mass and so well, uh, this velocity dispersion I expect only 80 and I find a thousand, and so there must be much more dark matter than, uh, than uh, luminous matter. But he said here the same as, uh, as uh, what Ken Freeman wrote in his appendix uh, if this comes out to be true, okay, it came out to be true. So Shirky also uh, suggested gravitational lenses. And so we, there also, you can see uh, the, uh, the bullet cluster, for example. Okay, and coma, uh, this is the coma galaxies which are uh, used here. So then the center, now we know that there is uh, a lot of uh, X-ray gas mass. And this is the uh, Rosita, uh, see. Okay, so I have seen these these people now. This uh, up front, this is sort of in interesting to see how where the elbows are. <laughs> and so this this um, Professor Epstein was uh, much uncomfortable between <laughs> Einstein and Swicky. And uh, there's a lot more about Swicky. There's Freeman Dyson who wrote about Swicky and Nature in 2005 about the uh, saying that he was responsible for a change in the view of our astronomical universe. And so he said that uh, using the Smith telescope, he discovered dark matter. So he wrote about dark matter in 1933 and the 18-inch came, which is the telescope, came, uh, was ready in 1936. So. Yeah, one writes, now what Okay, and then this is uh, interesting because this is what Suki said uh, using the bad and Suki work about supernova. It's so a cosmic ray is caused by exploding stars that burst with the fire equal to 100 million suns and shrivel to a half a million di mile di diameter only. So, yes. This photograph is, is often taken and it is not realized that this pile of books is a catalog of galaxies and cluster of galaxies, which was followed by the Red Book uh, in 1971. It is about uh, compact and peculiar galaxies. Okay, so there are four dark matter problems started in the solar neighborhood based on rotation curves. Uh, Babcock at the time in 1947 wrote, uh, he didn't work on, uh, on, on this stuff at all, but he wrote that it, uh, it must be dark material. Dark matter in clusters and the main matter density in the universe. And so it was only in the end of the 70s that there was a, a theory of cosmo cosmology and galaxy formation. And well, 
uh, also a connection to high energy physics to discuss the identification. Okay, and so since dark matter hasn't been identified yet, it's something that the law of gravity could be modified. Now this is uh, Rubin's work and also how she's appreciated in some circles. So in 1985, there was an IU in India, and so in high astronomy in 1986, she wrote that by analogy, she was the solar system. You uh, astronomers long suspected that the rotation of velocity was first increased with increase in radio distances that reach maximum and fall to low velocity at right low, low distance. And well, that is not true. It just, you ex don't expect Keplerian. Uh, you, you expect Keplerian from this point where the galaxy ends, not from the beginning. Anyway, so yes, so. Yeah, so in NC 6503, uh, this plot is actually from Bruis, Behemann, Bruis, and Sand of 1991. This is described here to somebody else who did the uh, review. And uh, this is described even to Ferrer Rubin, who, who did work on, on the galaxy, yes, but uh, yeah. This is uh, retweeted by the director in, uh, in Groningen. Yeah. Anyway, when Vera died, and that the was an obituary, and uh, I wrote this uh, reply in uh, in Nature. It was published, and so. But well, there was on the asteroids. There was an article. Yeah, she did. You know, the, uh, for SC galaxies, she did twenty-one SC galaxies. Each one of that rotation go well beyond the edge of the classical galaxies. Okay, so if you look at the uh, the 21 galaxies, you can see this mark, that is, that is the uh, R25 radius. And so all the, uh, all the rotation curves don't go beyond the edge of the classical galaxy at all. The galaxy center is marked and people don't read it. This is another oral interview uh, by Sandy Faber, of Sandy Faber by somebody, Mr. Patrick McRae. And uh, yeah, I wrote a review about mass and mass light ratio. And actually, a lot of uh, people felt that that review uh, sort of settled the subject. OK, yeah. But uh, there are two key things. Uh, one was the rotation curve galaxies, but it wasn't fair as was with Bosma. Uh, oh, how do you spell that? Uh, B-O-S-M-A, yeah, sure, thank you. <laughs> but that's not the name you read in the popular event. No, because he is European. And the Americans don't think about it. So now you know how Americans think about uh, European. Well, at least one of them. <laughs> okay, now halos were actually uh, suggested by Ostrak and people based on disk stability. And the disk stability came because the uh, initial, uh, when the computers were, were powerful enough to run. Uh, uh, numerical simulation, there were uh, people like uh, Hall and also Miller, Pranik, Aston, Clark, who put out papers and they found that, it, well, at certain values of the tumor Q, uh, you get a, you've got a bar. And so they said that if the spherical potential as a fixed potential is added, the mother is more stable. So this is true, but uh, well, um, it is totally different if the halo is not a fixed potential, but participates. Okay, and Leah talked about that. But anyway, that jumped to the conclusion that if this for our galaxy, this implies the halo mass interior to the disk, which is, is about equal to the disk mass. And therefore, the halo mass exterior to the disk may be extremely large. Okay, it was based on simulation with 500 mass points and some analytical consideration. So, yeah. Okay, it came out and then it was heavily debated. There were two papers by Ostraker people in Jahil and also by Ernesto Karnasik and Saar, these are Estonians. And uh, so they, they found that, yes, uh, mass as function of radius increases. And, and here also, uh, Ernesto Karnasik and Saar. Okay. 
And this uh, later, much later review, you can also see that the mass increases and then, then flattens out at a larger, larger scale. Okay, the acceptance was certainly not instantaneously because Burbage was against it. And uh, Matana Saman said that, well, if you reanalyze the group membership, that I am overall is not convincing, and et cetera, et cetera. But, uh, well, in the end, people accepted it. Partly because of rotation curves. Okay, there were in uh, mentioned in Austrac at all the Robertson and Rots. There were, was a rotation curve that uh, declined, uh, this sort of stage line. So this, it's just the M31 rotation curve that's convincing. M81 is interacting, you know, the group seems massive, yes, so the galaxy is problematic. There are non circular motions, including warps, and I will uh, come to that. Uh, the data quality on M31 wasn't uh, wasn't very convincing, and the Rob Robertson Shostak fit models actually. So these are models uh, here called Brandt curves. Anyway, Shostak has a thesis, and he dedicated it. Uh, he did three galaxies in his thesis and dedicated the thesis to NCC for 2403 and all its inhabitants. To a bit room, coverage will find it as cost. He was, and okay, now in, uh, in SETI, a big boss, the search for extraterrestrial galaxy intelligence. And so the, the people in 2403 were intelligent enough to stay away. <laughs> and so nobody, uh, nobody contacted him. Anyway, uh, he, he was in the, at the IU in Sydney. Uh, he asked me to write something about the dark matter problem. And I wrote that, and you can, you can read it uh, here. It's on the web. Very good. I'll put it on uh, on uh, on that. Also, my my thesis is also on that anyway. So and yeah, for twenty one oh three, the model goes actually down. Well, the the data is, uh, actually goes up. So. And then this is for IC three four two, which is one of the other models here. Yeah. Uh, Huchmeyer had some pointings with the Bond telescope, and yeah, and it goes down slowly. So, but if you look at the velocity field, this is uh, much later work uh, done at the Vista VLA by Crossway. Uh, you can see that the, uh, the, the, the major axis uh, is not constant, it's not a linear line, and minor axis is, uh, has also this with it. Here is all already uh, in 1992 came uh, in Nature uh, an article about yes, radio astronomers found uh, beyond the visible limit uh, of galaxies some uh, indication that uh, there should be dark matter, and uh, this uh, was very, very clear. And this was first performed systematically by Vera Rubin. Uh, well, she wasn't a radio astronomer at all, and so didn't understand it. Okay, I wrote to Nature about it at the time, but it didn't help. Another joy was to uh, to hear people uh, using single dishes. Now, single dishes have side lobes, and so Salpeter uh, came, uh, Crum and Salpeter, and Salpeter came with a very extended rotation curve. And it was by some attributed to side lobes. The side lobe just picks up single uh, far away. And so this is from the discussion IU uh, 77 in Bad Moon's rifle. So uh, rumor has it that your flat rotation curve may be affected by side lobe problem. Comment, please. Okay, he said that, well, yeah, nobody believes that. But anyway, I mean, it's not easy that it, uh, he, uh, he looked at it. But he did with Westerbork, and so the side, there is no side low problem with Westerbork. Okay. And so Salpeter admitted when he was interviewed uh, for the, when he wrote his, uh, his uh, glory paper on in the annual reviews and uh, astronomy and astrophysics, that, uh, well, he, uh, in one of our papers, we claimed a uh, larger radius for some galaxies, and it's actually the case. So, yeah. so. Okay, some data I was involved myself. So Bosma, Allen, and Goss uh, data on 1, which uh, was around already uh, 
five or six years and so on and so forth. And then here you see uh, various uh, multi-wavelength data. So this is now the highest resolution of H1. This is the RX 3.6, so this uh, S4G, this is H-alpha, this is Galaxy UV, and the deep uh, deep optical image, uh, in, they're all in MIHOS uh, at all. Now recently, uh, the FAST, the, uh, the 500 meter telescope in, uh, in China came out with a map. Uh, okay, the angular resolution is 2.3 arc minutes, but you can see that it is extended far, far farther away. And this is a position diagram, a velocity diagram, show that rotation curve declines. Okay, back to this. Uh, the uh, Alatumra remarked that, well, there was an inversion of sequence. Uh, the, uh, the sequence in the 70s was actually spiral structure is the only uh, thing to do. If you can't do it, you do interacting galaxies and uh, oh yeah, but yeah, sure. you, you can do the rotation curves. Uh, yeah, sure, okay. And so he did uh, spiral structure, ties to the interacting galaxies and I did rotation curve. Okay, this is uh, early work on M81 was done by Rots, Arnold Rots is uh, also in Groningen and modeled by Fischer and uh, studied uh, by Oh, sorry. Uh, yeah. Oh, I must have printed deeply. Yeah. Okay. So, so this is the work of Rox on, uh, and this is the work of Van der Hulst, which is an extension. He studied this galaxy, this region, uh, centered on NGC 77. And Fisher did the density wave. No, the density wave causes a wiggle in the in the rotation curve, and so you have to correct for it. If the density wave is uh, is the spiral structure is strong, you have to correct for the peculiar motion due to the spiral. And then here the uh, rotation curve, well, quote unquote, the rotation curve goes up in one part and down in the other part. So, so you stop here and then uh, throw up your hands. This is a uh, far more deeper work uh, using the VLA by Aaron the Block at all. And you can see the spiral structure in uh, MAD1. This is overlaid uh, over the, an optical image in SCSS. And so you see the companion MAD2, 3077 in 2976. You can see this is, this is an image of cut. So if you have a long slip uh, cut, and then you find this, and you can see that uh, at one point, one side it goes up, and the other side it goes down heavily. And so, if you take long slit spectra, for example, optical spectra, you have the same effect that uh, you know you don't know the velocity field in time. Okay, I uh, I study uh, these things. So you can uh, add the net the near extra collected date database that I packed, which is. Uh, so there are, for each object, there is the, the, you can create an overview and then you find that for MAD1, there are 2,700 uh, plus uh, references. But I looked at one, and uh, yes, there is an ultra diffuse galaxy in the MAD1 group at the uh, southern part here. And uh, it is uh, totally disrupted. And this crud here is, uh, is all galactic foreground in the image. Okay, this is deep uh, M51 stuff. So, uh, Rotsital 1990, where the proposal was actually written by uh, Leah Tanasula. <laughs> so, yeah, uh, thankful to her. You see, got this through the, uh, for the time allocation. So, you see the longer, much longer tail, much longer than this. This is a deep picture by Watkins uh, at all, and you can see that uh, the, in the optical, the distortions are much bigger in the in the stars, and are much bigger on the other side. You can also see for HD 4151, which, uh, which was studied in a separate paper, App uh, gave me the underlying picture, actually, chip up. 
Now, the, the notion that there was more gas here was already in Davis 1973, but we, we had a vestibule map. If you here, this is the normal SDSS figure. And if you modify the lookup table, you can see the two faint arms. So, okay. Uh, this is some sociological uh, stuff about uh, problems. So, one problem in the organization is optimism. And so, the uh, this is, uh, oh, uh, yeah, we can do uh, 21 centimeter line work with a synthesis uh, scope, maybe in 1972. Okay, and so, so the statement is actually, well, we have a, a thousand ch uh, philosophy channels hopefully ready in 1972. And actually, we used the 80 channel receiver until 1977. And then those early signs of the digital labs, uh, labs receiver. And so, so people are optimistic in planning. And this can be seen also for the SKA. Now the SKA started out as a hydrogen array. Somebody wanted to do a rotation curve at setting about one. And so there's Peter Wilkinson wrote a paper on that and then there was a working group and, and so on and so forth. And so the, uh, they started uh, with it and so on and so forth. And then this, this was in, uh, in uh, a plan that would be ready by, uh, fully ready by 2022. And so schedule slip and also topics of what you can do with the telescope to see how to fashion. And uh, when I did uh, my first uh, astronomy job, I, I worked for three months with David Rockstar. And he told me that, oh, yeah, you have to do computing now, but be aware when computing starts, thinking stops. <laughs> and also, you see it often that when observing starts, thinking stops, people don't think anymore. Okay, the history of the VLA uh, was always uh, presented uh, very positively. Uh, yeah, well, we, uh, we submitted it uh, to uh, Congress in 1972, and it was done and over with in 1980 except that the full spectral line capability became available only in the early 1990s. Okay, now in 2005, this, this uh, plan was made at the end of 2022, and in 2017, they came with, okay, SCAR will be ready in 2028. And then in 2024, they come, uh, yeah, what well, is, is further away still, <laughs> so. Other food for thought is about philosophy. I read that at some point I was uh, unhappy about the discussions and the level of discussion in Groningen. So I read uh, Popper and Kuhn and Feyerhaven and Lakatos and so on and so forth. And so, so this is a quote from Lakatos about Popper. And he said, well, his thoughts of philosophability come here and I think it's a step back from Duhem. Duhem said this, in fact. The solution and the problem of induction, I think, is a step back from Hume. David Hume wrote about induction already. And the literary position and masterpiece is the opposite of anatomy by one of his, well, no, no, by anatomy. Yeah, it's, it's a literary masterpiece. But anyway, if you have good, if your ideas, good names, they will be accepted. And you will be named the father or, well, presently you will be named the parent. It could be even the mother. And so this was a public relation tactic successfully tried out by Lakatos when he labeled things scientific research program. And that one wrote a great acclaim among scientists and philosophers. So you can compare, for example, inflation by the, uh, the sitter phase. Now that happened. That happened to uh, uh, a member of the uh, Atlas Academy, this uh, Dinos Casanas. Uh, and so he had a, a, a letter published in the Astro Journal, Letters 1980. But the inflationary universe is always is my, mostly attributed to Booth in, in paper in 1981. And this is from this telescope or block, a Peter Cole's block in the dark. You can see that Kazana says uh, the peak is about 50, and Booth's the peak is 500. So. And it is just a cat, cat. It's a weird idea, maybe the uh, the inflation, but it's a catchy name, inflation. Yeah. 
Okay, there's also dogmatism. Uh, I felt that the world was very dogmatic about uh, centers of galaxies having explosions. And so it took us a while to, uh, to overcome that with 4736 because there was a so-called triple radio source. This was an explosion according to Van der Kuyk in 71. So, okay. Anyway, from my three says this is philosophy field of 25 spirals. And you can see them. Um, mostly on scale. Well, the scale is given for each galaxy. So not all of them are the same at all. Um, there are warps and regular galaxies this was, uh, at the time a regular galaxy. Now it's uh, OK. This, this, these are newer data by uh, collaboration of Walter de Bloch. And so on. it's called the SYNCS, the SYNCS uh, uh, project. And you can see that it's a very well-defined rotation curve. Also, if you do a cut at a major axis, it's very flat. And uh, yeah. I actually calculated the flaring uh, expected. And you can, uh, using a program uh, essentially given to me by Elia. And so you expect that this to flare in the other parts. So. And this uh, I already showed the, uh, and on the same scale, you have to, it's not on the same scale, but you have the, you know, effects of, well, the, this is the optical, you see, it's, it's a lot of other stuff. In, in Galax also, you see a lot of other stuff. This is another galaxy, 2841. Uh, this is uh, from my thesis itself. This is the uh, image which uh, is from, which I caught uh, at Palomar, actually. When, uh, I, I went to Palomar with Pete van der Kuyk to observe uh, these galaxies before my season. I showed this, uh, this picture to, to the focal Lerb when he was uh, on the visit in Groningen. And I asked him, uh, well, what is the extent of the H1 of this galaxy? Can you tell me? And, uh, and uh, well, to tell me, okay, and then show them this. <laughs> and he ran out of my uh, my office and said, "Well, I I don't understand anything about galaxies anymore." <laughs> and so, so it was a big surprise. These these large things. Now you can see the uh, structure in the H uh, H one. Uh, okay, the beautiful philosophy field from things. And then in the galaxy far UV, you can also see in the other parts the structure. The structure turns up the stars. Okay, the tilted ring model for warps was done uh, by Rockstar et al. in 1974. This, this is the, the model he made for this galaxy. And you can see that, well, in M83, the, the H1 is far more extended. And so, but it is warps. You can see that the major axis go like this. If you look at a deeper picture, you see also signs of, inter of uh, material thrown out or interactions. And so the warps are usually outside the optical image, and most of them could bind up. And then they model with a set of concentric rings, it's still the ring model, and uh, the deviations from circular motions uh, are usually small if you look at face on cases. And this is an edge on galaxies, uh, C5907 is the map of uh, Santisi in 1976. Okay, now there was a discussion in IU uh, uh, 77. Ken Freeman asked that, uh, oh, people use the Rockstar ring procedure to explain circular velocities for warp galaxies. Procedures are obviously not dynamical self-consistent and they could be easily wrong. Uh, the velocity, circle of velocity, could be easily wrong with 10 or 20 kilometers per second. And that could be uh, a problem for calculating the mass to light ratio in the other parts. What is your advice? And he asked Alec Tumor. And Alec Tumor said, well, just one word, wait. Okay, you're still waiting because he still didn't come up with, uh, with what you should do. But in the meanwhile, the procedure is, 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 is done a lot. Okay, this was an interesting paper coming out recently. It's, it's fast. This is the uh, the five hundred foot, uh, the five hundred meter uh, diameter uh, telescope. They used a beam of three point two, and you can see far out the emission. 
And so there is a lot of uh, diffuse uh, gas outside. And to illustrate that, this is the the image for M51. This was published by Rod Sporsma van der Hulst, Dr. and Pat Crane in 1990. And I put the uh, uh, an SDSS image at the same scale. And then I put it on the same scale. And then this, this is on the same scale. The, the H1 envelope. And so it's enormous. And so there is an enormous reservoir of gas. And you see that also for uh, other galaxies, as I showed, 2841, uh, 5055, uh, this is M51 again. You can see that the, the 2881, uh, this is the, uh, yeah. This thing is the original, this feast. You can see it's uh, bigger and bigger. And the Chinese proposed to build, uh, to add to the fast array, the fast dishes here, and uh, to add in this uh, circle of forest, 40 more antennas. And so then they got 4.3 arctic resolution with roughly the same sensitivity. And so they hope to uh, to get that ready in uh, in 2030, and they might uh, might do that. Okay, these are the channel maps. This is a data cube. You can see for I could I could have shown a a movie, but I didn't. So this is the H1 uh, rotation curve beyond the optical image. So this this figure was uh, taken over by Faber and Gallagher, and was one of the uh, pieces which convince people to the dark matter exists. And some of these uh, galaxies uh, we had photometry this from the crowd and so they uh, were used so in, in previous papers by Nasco and uh, Ostrak. But some galaxies like M101 is asymmetric and M81 also. And so you don't consider the rotation curve. I wrote a review on the extent of galaxies. Uh, and uh, Well, you can see that the H1 of an optical diameter in, for spirals is uh, mostly bigger than one. And for a regolith, it's uh, even more bigger than one. And there is a, a direct relation between the amount of H1 and the logarithm of the diameter. Now this is from Rubin, uh, uh, Ford and Tonar, as uh, they had paper in 1978 as well. And you can see the optical spectra, and they are also flat, and so on and so forth. And so people said that, well, yes. Uh, and so the Rubin in 19, 2003 said that I think that Bosman's plot plus the visual spectra convinced many as soon as the rotation curves were flat. Or flat was the exception. But there were still non believers. Yeah, that's true. Okay, and then she, she, in the conference proceeding right up of 2003, she actually spells that out. So you can read it if you, if you want to. So this is the rotation curve they had in 78. Then there came a set of rotation curve of SC galaxies in 1980. And uh, then these are, uh, are the biggest ones. And you can see the, the dashes here are the extent of the R25. This is for SB and this for S, SA galaxies as well. Okay, comes uh, the IU in uh, 100 in Besançon, organized by, uh, by Lia Atanasula. Agus Kalni stood up and he said, uh, yeah, well, uh, I can't fit uh, rotation curves without the need for that matter. And he showed this, this plot. And uh, well, it ended up like this in the uh, conference proceedings. And recently there was a Twitter uh, saying, ah, they don't make conferences like this anymore <laughs> because of the conference proceedings with uh, discussion sessions uh, aren't there anymore. Anyway, uh, Steve Kent confirmed this and uh, so this is from his, his work is on one galaxy in C1620, the rotation curve, which goes out uh, to the edge of the galaxy and the surface density of light. 
And so you can see that, uh, well, sometimes it doesn't fit. Some Most of the time it fits or one or two points high. Now, I went through this uh, some time ago. Uh, but uh, lately, uh, I show this a lot. The, 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 there are rotation curve, optical rotation curve by Bowers, Bowers, and Prendergast, which go to half the radius of the optical, half the optical radius. Then the SC galaxies are proven so like this, the SA and HB uh, like, like this and like this. So if you pile it up, it's like this, it's 0.8 of the optical radius on average and the H1 data, the radius synthesis data come much, much further out. And if you want to uh, have the exponential disk, it slowly gets Keplerian and it goes like this. But it doesn't go to zero at all, obviously. And so the extent of the rotation curves matters. You can see that also. You can for twenty eight forty uh, one, if you go as far as uh, as for twenty sixteen sixteen twenty, then you can fit without any dark matter component. And the, the weak point in uh, in the Rubin et al. work is that they don't have any photometry to estimate the light distribution. And so. Ken did that uh, for galaxies with optical data and then need them for H1 data. He concludes that H1 data needs is needed to study the dark matter distribution. We also had a paper in 87 with Stavros Papayanu. And yeah, well, the, if you take into account the issue of this, this stability, you can uh, get the, the, the generacy and the dispersed built halo decomposition uh, reduced. And so also we said that, uh, well, if you, those cases that show otherwise, so that you don't need a halo are due to the artificial short ranges of the rotation curve data. And that's the argument I frequently make is uh, that a lot of this, this work of Rubin and Ford uh, shows that. And so, this is the individual galaxies uh, by Kent from his paper. And you can see that, you know, okay, there are some, some funny points here. And here, and here, this, this is my uh, estimate at the time. For some, uh, he had already two models. For two galaxies, he has two models with sailors. Okay, others looked also at the, uh, the largest galaxy done by uh, by Romain Natal, uh, UTC 285, you can see that, uh, well, uh, the extent increases with the, uh, the speed of the rotation curve. Okay, there was also a discussion about that, Natal and Dwarf Spirals, and this was a wonderful paper where he considered only the velocities of three stars in Draco and one in Usa Minor. And so, from the three stars in, uh, in, in Draco, he inferred that there uh, should be a velocity dispersion much higher than expected. And so, yes, and so there should be dark matter. Okay, it was also taken up by Lin and Faber and stuff. So. And so one of the constituents of dark matter was not black cats, but neutrinos, that you can actually uh, Detect with a in a tank with a C two Cl four uh, via this reaction, and so the oscillations change the electron neutrinos in uh, in muon or tau neutrinos. And that, this work won Nobel Prize in two thousand two for Davis and Koshiba, and but for Tahita and McDonald for the determination of the mass. But there was a claim for massive neutrinos by the human of in nineteen eighty. And so he got a lot of uh, citations in the beginning, but uh, well, at some point people realized that it was just a fake claim. So, okay, this is a little bit about the gravitational lenses. So this, this, these are the lenses. You can see the objects distorted. And so this is the bullet bullet cluster. So the X-ray image is pink and it's superposed on visible light image and 
the matter distribution uh, in blue uh, calculated from uh, gravitational density. There's also uh, a galaxy which has an Einstein cross in the center. And so Trot et al. Uh, determined on the basis of this, these locations that the bulge is maximum, uh, meaning there is not, not much dark matter in the bulge area. Uh, this is the karma cluster, this is the optical image, uh, it's the X-ray. Also in the 90s, there was a paper by Ostrak and Steinhardt uh, arguing that the, uh, the Hubble constant was, was roughly here, uh, and this is the universe, and so the omega matter is, uh, is about 0.3. That has been uh, more or less co confirmed by the Planck collaboration and <clears throat> supernova measurements and, uh, and so on and so forth. And so we, we live in this, this kind of universe. Yeah. There's an argument about the shape of the dark halo uh, using uh, this uh, polar ring galaxies, the one in Schweitzer at all, and then also measurements in Sackett at all. Second of all, I argue that, uh, well, it's not entirely clear that the uh, the halo is uh, exactly around. So initially it was thought to be around, but not anymore. So the, the halo should be adequately modeled, which uh, I already explained this morning by Leah. But uh, I show it again because, uh, well, it's part of my regular talk. Okay, there's also neutral gas around galaxies, which is uh, extra planar gas. And so there's a study for NC891, for example, and uh, well, you can see uh, there's also a machine uh, got a deep image. You can also see that. So there's an interest to look at the deep images of galaxies, any galaxy you look at. And so this is all the H1, and this is the H1 with the, the anomalous velocity gas. And the halo rotation is lagging, it's behind, it's, it's lower. And depends on the distance. So again, it's in papers in 2011. This is a more recent paper on NCC 2403, and uh, this is on scale. The, the, the is the image, deep image, uh, galaxy image, and this is the uh, the the wise image with the wise telescope is an in, infrared telescope. It's three point six uh, micro. You can see that uh, well for the galaxy, the major axis, the minor axis, uh, the the major axis uh, is is twiddling like this, indicative of a war. Now, if you overlay the outline of the uh, wise image, then you get this white curve. And so if you uh, study only the bright parts of spiral galaxies, you, you look at a different sort of kinematics. And so you could miss key aspects of the kinematics at, at far away radii if you just study the bright parts of the galaxy. Uh, well, we, we will hear about uh, from uh, the, the next speaker uh, after uh, T. Uh, I got from her website this image, so I cranked it up a bit. And then it's, it's, the image just covers the, uh, the image of the velocity field just covers this. So you don't go for go, this, this is a bit peculiar, but you don't go, go much further than the optical image. So one has to be careful. Another fun part was to uh, to study the question of the uh, is the shape of the dark halo is it a, a is it an isothermal sphere or an N of W uh, thing which uh, which has a, a, a cusp. And Navarro, Frank, and White were uh, very adamant that that was the case and. Uh, we, we did several uh, papers. So there's a paper by the block, uh, Makov, uh, Ru uh, Bosman, and Rubin in 2001. And uh, Erwin and I put out uh, some observations uh, locally in, uh, in the south of France. And we got this uh, combined with the older data. And so, and then O et al did it further. Adams and all the points, uh, the red points here. 
and Odo and more. And so the situation is essentially summarized in, in Oman and Tor here. It's a vexing problem, apparently, that the rotation curve rises slowly and is expected to rise fast for N of W. And so don't use N of W if you want to be careful. And this is for a galaxy, a dwarf galaxy, I see 2574, uh, a lot of pixels. This is in G band, just 5 UV, 3.6. Plus the field, the uh, H1 residuals, and the bulk velocity field, and so on. Uh, well, yeah. now in Nihau, it's, uh, it's one, one group of uh, modelers tried it, and, but they don't come far enough in the radius range in the inside. They don't come to small enough radius. Then, okay, the uh, these are the people, David F. Statue-White and Frank, who, who looked at uh, cosmology and so on. You, you will hear more about uh, cosmology later. And I read, uh, yes, uh, I read the, uh, I looked at some abstracts of the uh, citations to this paper and, uh, okay, uh, yeah, sure. They established with this another, uh, it was the soon established the dark energy problem. And so what is it? Well, it is good for a Nobel Prize, but it's, uh, it is also like the, the dark cat in a black room. Uh, well, it could be that there is no cat. And it could be that the dark energy is nothing. And so nobody knows what it is. And so anyway, I was uh, struck by this uh, title. And so I looked at it. And it's fun to look at dark matter deficient dwarf galaxies. And so you can see uh, early type dwarfs and later type dwarfs and so on and so forth. And these are the spectra itself. So yeah. the spectra you can find on, uh, on the uh, extra collected distance database of Tully. Uh, if you want a, sp uh, a spectrum of a galaxy with uh, of surfaces, a single disk. Okay, a bit about cancel stuff. Um, but it's Q23 BX620, so galaxy is setting is 2.2. And so, so they had a, a rotation curve, it's just declining. Uh, although this in, doesn't indicate declining. But it's also funny, the, the, the behavior of the, of the major axis is twiddling. This was twilling here, twilling here. So I looked at it a bit and I found this, well, I knew about this uh, old work of the uh, first described at all in 2006. And so here they have uh, an outline which is uh, much, much, more, much longer than the, the other data. And the model fit is just a straight model fit, which is uh, which doesn't account for the minus 50 uh, green uh, thing. I mean, it's twiddling like anything. It indicates a bar. Okay, and so yes, uh, well, I know about flux fields. So, and so I selected, uh, this is a warped galaxy. And this is a, a barred galaxy and C5383. And this is a deep fixture. You can see that it not only has the uh, the bar and some little arms coming out. There's actually a deeper arm system here. And this is this is the real scale of the thing. Yeah. So and Leah uh, actually uh, worked on spiral structure of galaxies and calculated uh, what the velocity field of that galaxy is from, viewed from different positions. And so you can different depending on the position and you can get funny shapes of the rotation curve. And she modeled in another paper uh, and you see 5383. So where the H1 extends far beyond the optical range. And so I, I'm a bit puzzled now that uh, this new data uh, doesn't, doesn't resemble the other data unless it is a question of sensitivity. And so they detected only this part in the, in, in the beginning, and now they go deeper. 
but this still looks like there could be a bar, bar galaxy. Okay. Okay, there's a, there are also projects uh, in, uh, in the US for set uh, larger than one galaxy with VOA. And so Fernandez in 2016, I had a paper. And uh, at the IU uh, in, uh, in, in August, uh, Julia Bluebird presented only results for four galaxies. It's so very difficult to write. And so this is, this is one drawing of it in a, in a presentation. Yes. I mean, it's uh, a lot of work, there's a lot of computing problems. Okay, what is the dark matter? Well, we don't know. So we only know that the ostensive designation of dark matter changed. It means it was meant to be faint of extinct stars, dark nebula material, and so on. And so now we think it's non baryonic material or related to energy physics. And so this leads to physicists wanting to do astronomy. It's not evident. This is uh, from Kathy Prendergast, who is the daughter of Kevin Prendergast, who worked with Bobby Zuberger and Prendergast. He was at Columbia University. Uh, he was director at some point, and they uh, they wanted to fusion the physics and astronomy departments. And uh, well, he didn't want it. And he articulates that the methodological distinction between physics and astronomy is that anything big enough to see is unique. And so you have to and to decide what is important and what is unimportant. Physicists don't face this question. All protons are the same, and everything about them is important. Always seek the simple solution in which the phenomenon appears. We cannot do it. And the other thing is, again, you know, galaxies are like people. So each people is, person is different. Yeah. Sorry. Yeah, and so Sadoulet was one of, one of the persons uh, who were joined in the, the, the race to, to find uh, a trace on Earth of the, uh, of the dark matter scattering. Uh, he wrote in a Nobel Symposium uh, an overview of, of you know, 20 or 40 years of uh, history. So this is a standard model of uh, particle physics. And well, Nothing has been detected beyond the Higgs boson at, at Geneva with the LHC. We now know that the, the bulge of the galaxy looks like this. Uh, because in this long, we know that the bar is seen from the Gaia work like this. Now, Lean and Satya think uh, that uh, there is dark matter eye annihilation and Bartos at all think, well, there could be stars in the galactic bones, which you see. And you can do it. You can study the pulsars, and you, with the sky in the future, you can, uh, you can solve this, this, this distinction. You can find more pulsars, uh, millisecond pulsars and so on, in the galactic center to see whether uh, it contributes to the signal. Uh, which can be confused with uh, the annihilation signal. Okay, this is the WIMP scattering uh, diagrams, which you see WIMP mass and uh, WIMP cross, cross section and so on and so forth. And so this is on the same scale, it goes deeper. Uh, this is the cross section as function of uh, target mass, and target mass becomes bigger as function of time. But the, the, the fear is there is a nightmare scenario that there is no new particle after the explosion. So nobody knows. So nobody knows what, what the dark matter is, uh, whether it's just a wind or something else. Even the, uh, the detection predictions change. This, this is on the same scale. It, it was this in, uh, in, in Batona 2010 and in Bahnachi 2017, it was this. Okay. People considered uh, primordial black holes. There's a paper by Carr, which is uh, you know, where the exclusion is. And so, but, People talk about fuzzy dark matter and so on. Yeah. Okay, MOND, people talk also about MOND, which is a modified uh, Newtonian uh, thing. And uh, there were some calculations by Bateman, Bruis, and Sanders about some galaxies uh, using MOND. And uh, 
if you just take the m over l for for this galaxy you find this this is a dashed line curve if you change the distance then you get a good fit but the distance is is uh, is a factor two compared to what you expect and so well uh, if you could get an independent distance up to 2841 would be nice to to settle this but anyway then related to this, uh, Mikov is, uh, is a Mond fan. The Mond was uh, done by Milgram in 1983 or so. And so they have the Spark project, Lely et al. It's uh, a lot of H1 rotation curves and 3.6 photometry That's from uh, S4G, mainly. And so uh, this is the bin lay type galaxies. You could see that the binning makes it everything quite small. But the late type galaxies, you can also plot one by one on top of the other. And then you can see that the dwarfs uh, are rather diverse in, in character. I mean, you know, and they separate out. And so so I'm, I'm not terribly impressed by some of the arguments given in this part. But, uh, you know, the, well, the, the mass models are better because they're taking account to the gas. And so they have uh, data for about uh, 150 galaxies or so. Okay, uh, another thing that comes up is with the new surveys, the Wallaby surveys with uh, ASCA, which is a precursor of the SKA. And so there are a couple of papers which, is, uh, which have detection of, of clouds which don't have an apparent optical counterpart. This this cloud has a totally different velocity, the the purple thing, as the galaxy itself. And there was already an article about DDO 154, dark galaxy, which is just the galaxy in H1, and on the same scale optical, this is the infrared, and so yeah, you know, it's very 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 minor. And so there are in Obern at all. There's a, another case. It's this this thing is a very faint galaxy, but. Uh, yeah, and so there will be more coming when Wallaby uh, progresses. So, although the progress with Wallaby has the same problem as uh, the progress at the VLA and the pro problem at uh, Westerberg at the time I was there using it, this is a computing problem. Computers are not up to snuff. And so, okay, another question asked is. Can we replace the rotation curve with the velocity which derived from the integral profile? Because the current H1 surface be produce a lot more H1 profiles than I can do for rotation curves. Partly also due to angular resolution effect. And so in this uh, work, is, uh, this is essentially the thesis work of uh, Anastasia Ponomarev. You can see that there is a difference between uh, when you use two W fifty compared to V max or V flat, and so there is a difference. And again, it's, it's, it's the same same thing. So people are people are interested in using the width of the integral profile. They can look at this paper already. Now, Anastasia plotted uh, the rotation curves of the galaxies uh, she studied. Uh, the red curves are the declining ones and the uh, the, the rising ones. So, yeah, you can see there's a difference. This is a part of the Wallaby uh, results. There's a paper by Dagadol which shows this, this, this kind of uh, sigma H1 construction of radius and the rotation curves. And this is this is a an, an, uh, a helper's plot for the observers. Uh, who are interpreting this data to, to just see how how well behaved it is. But also from the Leduma survey at Meerkat, uh, that was uh, from uh, around the Amman Pandari, uh, uh, a contribution at the Channel Assembly. They find also flat rotation curves. So you can expect a lot more to come when SK comes on. I looked at uh, Westerberg on the web, which is uh, you can look backwards and fish out uh, information on, on galaxies. So essentially it's 3992, I think. Yeah, so. 
but this it's, it's very difficult now to find that seriously on the web. So yeah. But anyway, you can compare this, 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 this. You can see this is uh, this is the green light telescope, and this is the rest of the data integrate. So so you can see that uh, it's not entirely the same. Yeah. Oh yes, if you this this you don't see very well. If you on sharp mask mask it, you could get a very good graph. Okay, and so there's another galaxy I just just looked at. You can see the wonderful galaxies. Yeah. Okay, and even at a at the cycle the protocluster core has a velocity field. It's it's, it's interesting enough. You can see that the, yeah. So that's the end. No instruments bring fresh opportunities for discovery. So the deepest picture of uh, M5055 well, is now this one. It's on the same scale as this one. And so uh, many discoveries recorded here were done by young people. And so just look ahead and wonder, don't look back. And wonder is the origin of all great achievements. Without it, love, life is trapped and so is stay away. Thank you. Thank you very much, Albert, for this insightful talk. Uh, clearly, science is not disconnected from sociological aspects. Um, do we have time for questions? Why? Why? Oh, okay, Daniel. So thank you for this uh, overview. Um, I was just um, missing, you said nothing about cold gas, while the H1 is just telling you there is more mass there because you see spiral arms, you have the FUV uh, telling you there are stars forming in this H1. So much more physics is going on in these galaxies. And, until we understand this outer disk better, I think we should keep in mind that there could be more cold gas in the outer disk. And you don't need much uh, factor two or three more gas, and then the rotation curves are fit. So, and DDO154 is a nice example of that. To just multiply the the gas by a factor, and then you find the rotation curve. Yeah. Yes, yes. It's, it's, it's a big question. This stage one is there, and we don't understand the physics. Why it is there? You see? So, <laughs> more physics, please. <laughs> yeah. I fully, fully agree with that. That's beautiful. But the thin one you, you're, you're proposing is, has one difficulty which could be in the back of our heads and very much so because you have cold gas then but it's really darn cold not not simple little bit and then this thing is incredibly unstable i tried it and it's it breaks You have the number of spiral arms, you have worked on that, telling you what is the mass density there with the velocity dispersion of the H1. And you see it's a multiple of the H1. So it's local, it's not a halo. It's local in that sense also. So, you know, you yeah. have something which, I, I'm not saying it's wrong, please. Yeah. I'm, I'm saying that it needs a lot of thought because of this, you know, you know you've got something New in a way. But already the information we have is enough to say we have a local mass there that we don't understand. It is able to form stars. 
that yes. we not in the traditional way in molecular clouds. Absolutely. CO, uh, this is exactly what I'm saying. I mean, you know, this is very thin these days. It's not something which is, you know, you just go on with it. I yes. Mean, it's, it's very we we don't we don't know clouds. exactly the physics, but we, we know already if we believe gravity is just normal gravity, we have more mass local. Not, not uh, if you don't know what, what really is the velocity dispersion of this unseen mass, you cannot tell that. Yeah, yeah, for sure. No, it's I, a, I, I, I am really liking this because after, after uh, Albert's talk, I, I was a bit pessimistic, but it seems that there is still a lot of... Uh, uh, to do, to understand uh, more. I would encourage observers to go deeper in this outer disk because there is a good question. What is this H1 doing there? <laughs> All right, we, we, we can uh, discuss this further as well. Is there anyone else with questions? I have a couple, <laughs> but... Uh... Let me ask something that I was trying in papers, etc., to identify that I'm never being sure. The part of the rotation curve that is rising when we have a bar, does it identify with the bar or part of the bar is already in the starting to level off or decline part? A rising part of the rotation curve and bar, what is the relation? Is the we have the rising, we have the rising part of the rotation curve, and we have the bar. Is the bar entirely in the rising part of the rotation curve, or it depends? There are cases where it does, or other cases where already starts leveling off. Well, I would have said it's your second thing, but it hasn't been proven yet. So we we haven't tried that much. We should be looking more of it, and that is roughly what Donald Lyndon Bell tried to do, but in didn't work quite. <laughs> So the, the question I had was about the, you, when you show the Lely results of the radio acceleration relation, yes. the plot that you show on the right were in the individual galaxies, right? Yes. Um, I don't know if you can show the plot. Uh, Yeah, 
Uh, no, a little bit. Uh, 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 the one that uh, this one, this one. This one, yeah. Right. yeah. So, can the scatter on the right-hand panel be explained by by uncertainty in the observations alone, or this is intrinsic scatter, the intrinsic difference between galaxies? Uh, Right, but I mean the difference between the, the lines is intrinsic or is or is just uncertainty in the in the measurements. It's intrinsic. Yeah, no, if, if it's intrinsic, yeah, absolutely, I agree. Yeah. So this weakens the argument in the right hand, in the, the left one. Right, right. <laughs> Okay, um, I think we are ready for coffee break. So uh, let's uh, thank Albert again. And we reconvene at 5 p.m. All right, um, welcome back everyone. So now we have three talks, half an hour talks from our young researchers. And we're gonna start with Bianca Yulia Chokan. Uh, and she's going to show us some beautiful MUSE data from the MUSE uh, Hubble Ultra Deep Field. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Hello everybody. Uh, first of all, I would like to thank the organizers for giving me the opportunity to present my uh, research today. So I'm going to talk about a project I've been working on uh, in uh, cross collaboration with Nicolas Boucher et al. at Kral in Lyon, namely dark matter properties of intermediate redshift star forming galaxies based on very deep and beautiful MUSE data. So first of all, what is the motivation behind my work? Just a second. I don't So we all know that the matter content of the universe is dominated by dark matter from subgalactic cosmological scales. And as we nicely heard before, historically, maybe one of the most compelling evidence for the existence of dark matter uh, has come from observations of rotation curves of these galaxies that remain flat out of dark galaxies distances instead of showing the periodic trees. And these flat rotation curves uh, could not be explained by Newtonian gravity of baryonic matter alone, and thereby they implied the existence of some mysterious unseen dark matter, which somehow eluded all, all our direct and indirect uh, detection experiments so far. So nevertheless, we do have the lambda for dark matter concordance model which, as you all might know, is a very successful framework for explaining the large-scale structures of the universe 
as it is nicely shown here in the metal power spectrum, and it also nicely explains their evolution with cosmic time. However, on scales smaller than one megaparsec, uh, there are some tensions with lambda CDM, or the problems of lambda CDM, some of which are listed in this uh, nice plot here. And in the following, I will concentrate on the so-called core cost problem. So uh, N-body simulations predict that dark matter assembles into halos that develop a steeply rising inner density profile. So CASP profile, which is well parameter parameterized by a navarro franken white profile. And such a CASP profile is shown by the blue dotted curve in this plot here to play in the dark matter profile and the rotation curve. However, observations of low surface brightness galaxies, low mass galaxies have demonstrated that the systems are actually more consistent with having uh, condensate cores at their centers. So this uh, red curve is the diagram here. And this discrepancy between simulations and observations uh, either hints at the inadequacy of n-body to dark matter only simulations to capture the dynamics of dark matter on small scales due to absence of phenomena related to baryonic physics, or the fact that the modification of the whole Cold dark lambda, uh, cold dark matter paradigm is needed. So, luckily, some solutions to the core cast problem have been put forth in the literature. In the lambda CDM context, uh, baryonic processes such as stellar feedback, uh, central stellar bar, clumps in falling due to dynamical friction, as well as AGM feedback at the higher mass uh, range have been shown to be able to transform uh, uh, core, uh, casts into cores. So, for example, hydrodynamical uh, simulations, including baryonic physics, uh, have shown that uh, uh, core formation is highly dependent on the stellar mass to halo mass ratio, as it is shown in this plot here, showing uh, gamma, the dark matter inner slope, as a function of the stellar mass halo mass ratio. So, these hydrodynamical um, uh, simulations have uh, demonstrated that core formation is most efficient uh, in galaxies with masses between 10 to the 9 to 10 to the 10 solar masses. However, more exotic solutions, let's, let's say, uh, to the forecast problem have also been proposed. For example, alternative dark matter models such as cell interaction dark matter as well as axion like fuzzy dark matter have been shown to be able to produce core uh, dark matter density distributions in galaxies and explain the diversity of uh, rotation curves. So, uh, the dark matter halo properties of uh, local galaxies have been studied in depth. And here I chose to highlight the um, study of our DNA sample. So, what I did here was to use seven different halo profiles for their distance of decomposition. And what they found is that the Navarro Franken white profile always does a bad job. And uh, uh, the aim was to ultimately investigate this in table scaling relations. At high redshift, the situation is a bit different because it is very complicated to study the halo properties of uh, galaxies without resorting to stacking techniques and without very deep observations. And uh, uh, the papers that I highlight here mainly draw together in the high mass end, they impose Navarro Franken white profiles in their. Uh, dynamical modeling, and they mainly investigate the uh, dark matter fractions in their systems. So what we tried to do with this project was to go a bit beyond the state of the art. So what we did was to uh, perform uh, this halo decomposition for a large sample of intermediate redshift galaxies spanning a large mass range using six different halo profiles uh, with the aim to study uh, dark matter halo scaling relations as well as their evolution with cosmic time. Um, so the data on which uh, this project is based uh, comes from the new Hubble Alpha Deep Physics Field Survey, which uh, contains some of the deepest IP observations that were performed with integration times up to 140 hours. And here uh, I show the observations that I have performed. Additionally, I also use uh, Hubble and uh, uh, J JWST uh, photometric data in my study. So we applied some selection criteria to uh, select the galaxies with this color composition. Namely, we require our galaxies to have an integration margin of 30. We exclude all the mergers from our sample. 
and we also make the signal to noise part so this defective signal to noise accounting for the compactness of the galaxy with respect to the uh, PSF. And finally, we also require our galaxies to be rotationally supported. So here you can see the partition relation for the uh, uh, PDF sample, and we ended up excluding all the duration of the points for our, from our uh, samples for galaxies which are uh, dispersion supported. So in the end, we ended up with a sample of 136 galaxies for the discrete decomposition. And then here you can see the correction distribution as well as the mass distribution. And as you can notice, the mass peaks around the mass range where pore formation is expected to be most efficient in galaxies. Um, this brings us to the methodology that we have used. So we measured the morphokinematics and performed the discalo decomposition using a 3D forward modeling approach, employing the GALPAC 3D tool developed by Prabhusha et al. So just briefly, this tool compares the 3D parametric model directly to the uh, 3D IFU data cube, taking in account the instrumental line spread function and the point spread function, and it thereby yields the intrinsic structural and kinematical parameters of the gas test. So for our this halo decomposition, we employed the parameter, 3D parametric model, which accounts for the distribution of dark matter, a stellar disk, a gas disk, in some cases a bulge component, as well as the corrections for pressure support or asymmetric drift, as you might know, that refers to the stellar component, whereas this refers to the gas component. And uh, for the dark matter halo, we used six different density profiles. Namely, the generalized density profile of the Sintio et al. 2014, which I will call DC14 from now on. So, this profile uh, accounts for the response of dark matter to stellar feedback and we can fit both both tasks. We also use the classical Navarro City White profile, Becker Tower profile, which is also derived from hydrodynamical simulations in the stellar feedback scenario, the Burkert profile, the Four Navarro profile, and the Nasco profile. And our models have between 13 and 19 uh, key parameters, depending on the use halo model and whether we include the bulge or not. And we only use priors uh, on the inclination, which we have from our photometric uh, data, and stellar masses, except for the DC 14 halo profile, where we don't use any priors on the stellar mass. So all of the other priors are inclusive. And we optimize all these parameters simultaneously uh, directly on the IFU data cube using an MC and C fitting routine with the pi multilensed by Bushner multi 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 uh, We wanted to make sure that our methodology is correct, and to do so, uh, we applied it on uh, mock data cubes. So, MUSE mock data cubes uh, generated from idealized disk simulations. And in the following, I want to draw your attention to this figure uh, here to show you. Data density profile in red, and in green, this is the one we measure with Galpac 3D. So those are the density profiles. Um, I should mention that for this test, uh, we use the distinct halo profile, and here you can see the scalar uh, distribution of the shape parameters of this profile in blue, um, and the real uh, values which we input into the simulation are shown in red. And as you can notice, we can actually recover. Uh, the true value within max sigma and in the lower part here we can see the k values. So this information is the stellar mass, but again our recovered values agree within the errors with the input uh, simulation values. Uh, a further test of our methodology was to uh, derive the stellar disk uh, uh, rotation curves independently from photometric data. And to do so, we used a multi Gaussian expansion model in the MPLM at all, employing the MPC from John Murray package from Apelar uh, et al. And for this, we used the uh, HCMW mobility. And the results are shown here. And you can see the rotation curve decomposition for one galaxy of sample. We increase the orange, which is the result from the Galpac 3D applied in the new data. And this is a good example. Using the NGE modeling on the photometric data. 
and that you can also use it to configure the web, except for the innermost regions. And this is most likely due to the different spatial resolution. So in the end, you have the division between the scalar rotation curve, also in some distribution method, for 85 sample. The largest discrepancies are about 10 or 20 kilometers per second, but they are between zeros. So this brings us to the main results of this study. Here I'm just showing some examples of morphogenetic maps put together. And here I showed the rotation curve, the composition curve, the same again as we have seen before. Um, and the results are in the density profile and the behavior of the So we observe a great diversity of rotation curve shapes in our intermediate redshift samples, similar to what is observed in the local universe. Given that we have used six different halo profiles to um, perform our disk halo decomposition, we now want to see which uh, profile is the best. And to do so, we perform the Bayesian model comparison by computing bias, fa bias factor for each pair of halo models. So this factor is defined as the difference between the model evidence uh, of the two competing models. And this model evidence is defined as the integral of the posterior of the parameter chain accounts both for the goodness of the fit and the model complexity. So it penalizes for a more complex models. And the results are, are shown here. So what we found is that compared to Navarro, Frank and White, Burkert, Deckel, Inasco, and Cor Navarro, Frank and White, the DC Fold team model performs as well or better in more than 60-70% of the sample. So in the reminder of my talk, I will mainly show the results of the new this halo model. So we did some consistency checks for DC14 by comparing the parameters we obtained from our genetic modeling to the ones obtained independently from photometric data. So here you can see the comparison between uh, the stellar masses obtained from the DCT and the ones obtained uh, from the uh, photometric modeling. And as you can notice, uh, the agreement is very good. We agree within 0.5 dex. And again, as you mentioned, we didn't use any trial to discover marks. Um, here you can see gamma, the dark matter inner slope, as a function of the um, masses from LGD fitting for our sample, and the data points are color coded according to the neural masses. And this color curves show the DC14 uh, expectations. And as you can notice from the gradient of the data points, the dark matter inner slope values we uh, measure are in accordance to the expectations. Uh, from uh, this injury at all. Uh, then we checked whether core formation is uh, correlated with the star formation uh, activity of the sample, given that we found that 66% of our galaxies have core density profiles with gamma below 45. However, as you can notice from this plot, we showed gamma as a function of the offsets from the star formation sequence. We see no correlation between the two parameters. However, this is not necessarily expected because models state that core formation occurs in galaxies which have a long stochastic sequence of star forming episodes. So uh, a very bursty star formation history. So in order to really confirm or refute this feedback induced, uh, kind of feedback induced core formation, we would need the star formation histories of our sample, which are not available yet. <laughs> Um, as next, we investigated the stellar mass halo modulation for the UPL galaxy. And as you can notice, our results are in the qualitative agreement for the close to NGL situation, namely with the larger scatter. Uh, and here I show the results obtained with all the different halo models, and as you can notice, the DC halo is the largest modulation. Again, reinforcing the idea that this. Uh, model represents the data best. Then we investigated the concentration halo modulation, and as you can notice, it's a complete mess. 
However, I should mention that in order to calculate the concentration, we need the period radius of our galaxies, and in some cases, this requires a significant extrapolation. So, the concentration values that we measure for the subset of our galaxies are not as accurate as the one uh, one could measure in the local universe from each one. Of them. And uh, the situation using the other halo models is even worse. Um, then we chose to, to look at the uh, of this period So as you can notice, the information is in much tighter with the concentration by the information. And our sample of colors uh, is in agreement with the observation results of the universe, lots of different galaxies, so this is the sample of information. Uh, the plot on the right. Our observational results can further well beyond massive correlation of planet parts, and this uncorrelated results are the specification of the plasma matter, which is the hierarchical cluster. What is maybe interesting to note about this plot is the fact that we see a gradient. And we wanted to see whether this is predicted at all in the literature. Um, and what we tried to do was to use this. So with this one, when we predict the mass accretion history of the halo, we use the logic, when we predict the mass accretion history, we use the redshift of the uh, predict the concentration to which we have. And then then from that mass from the period mass of the halo, get the concentration of the electrons, we can predict the uh, tail radius and the density. And for our first two weeks, we can predict the logic. And the first is even easier to do that. Okay, so that we have to do that every week. And then for the first and the first two weeks, we can do that. Okay, for the rest of the week, we can keep doubling the speed by an hour. So as far as we know, this is the first time this evolution with redshift has been confirmed observationally. And finally, we also did some uh, comparisons to the local fast sample. So here you can see the table of mass relation and the table of density for the mass relation to the other We want to find the similar to the EFO, the coefficients, the maximum coefficients to be Local spark sample. And at last, we also investigated the dark matter fractions in our galaxy. And what we found is that 90% of the sample has dark matter fractions larger than 50% of the radii. And also, that the dark matter fraction, stellar mass surface density relation, is a manifestation of the Kali Fisher relation. So, this is evident from this. So the curve here, which is uh, a core model derived from calibration. So this brings me to my conclusion. Uh, we found that the generalized halo profile from the Cynthia at all uh, represents the data best. We found that 60%, 66% of our uh, intermediate redshift star forming galaxies have core star method density distributions. However, we found no correlation between Core formation and the current star formation activity of the sample. 
uh, the stellar halo mass relation that we derive uh, uh, observationally aligns well with the uh, relations uh, from Becherodi and Girelli at all. However, the concentration halo mass relation uh, reveals in terms of scattering. We also observationally confirm the anti-correlation between the halo sphere radius and the characteristic density. And we find tentative evidence that the characteristic density evolves with redshift while the halo sphere radius remains constant. And finally, we found that 89% of our sample has dark matter fractions exceeding 50% within their effective radii. And with this, I thank you for your attention. Thank you very much, very nice work. Uh, do we have questions? All right, let's move over there. Hi, very nice talk. Uh, at some point you mentioned that in some cases you include the bulge component, right? Yes. How do you decide if to include or not that? How do you decide if to include or not the bulge component? Okay. I didn't mention this in my talk because it was the work of a collaborator of mine. But as I said, we also did the HSP and database as we do as a one uh, collaborator with the Tertiary database to resolve mass maps using all the available uh, bands. And from those resolved mass maps, we did a uh, bulge to this decomposition to estimate the bulge to total ratio galaxies now sample which have a PT larger than 0.2. I also added the bulge component, but from 136 galaxies, if I remember correctly, there are about 30 that have the bulge total ratio larger than 0.2, so they are subdominant in our sample given this redshift and the mass groups that we put. So I hope that answers the question. Any more questions? So I, I probably missed something very basic uh, in the beginning, but you're using emission lines to measure the velocity? Yes. yes. Which? O2, H alpha, O3, and H beta. Okay, okay. And, and what's, what's the forward outlook uh, for outlook. this work? Yeah, so what, what comes next? What comes next? We are trying to increase our data. Use collaboration to get very good data from the Very good. Uh, let's thank uh, Bianca again. Thank you. Okay, so the next talk is by Juan Espejo Salcedo, and we're going to remain at high redshifts. Uh, he's going to talk to us about angular momentum measurements of high redshift galaxy disks. Okay. Hello, everyone. Thank you, Panos, and thanks, organizers, for putting this together. So I am a second year postdoc at MPE in Garhin, Germany, but I'm going to talk about the work I did during my PhD in Australia, which was uh, measuring angular momentum at high redshift. Uh, below, you can see some of my collaborators. My supervisor was Carl Glazebrook, but this is work that has been recently submitted, so it will be out in the archive very soon. Uh, first of all, some context. You don't need a lot of context for this, but uh, this is just a schematic view of what a telescope would see at different cosmic epochs. We see that galaxies have changed. That these galaxies have changed from these complex morphologies full of uh, bulges, sorry, uh, clumps, to these order rotating spirals in the local universe. 
So we're trying to understand that transition. How is it possible that galaxies change so much? Is it environment? Is it uh, the kinematics? So um, this happens, this evolution happens mainly from the cosmic noon epoch, which is uh, usually referred to, to this redshift one, two, three, uh, to the local universe. Again, you see these clumping morphologies, and then you see this order rotation. So what is driving this evolution? That's, I guess, the main question. There are many ingredients in the mix. There are uh, a lot of, um, let's say, uh, properties of the galaxies that interplay to have this evolution happen. Uh, but some of the main ones are the molecular gas content of the galaxies and the angular momentum. I mentioned molecular gas because that is the one that has to do a lot with the environment of these galaxies, and it has to do with the accretion of uh, gas along cosmic filaments and CGM. But I will focus on the kinematics. So first of all, just to put things in perspective, why uh, gas content has to do with this? Well, if you have high gas fractions, which is the case at the, at the cosmic known epoch, uh, you will eventually get fragmentation and the formation of instabilities. So you will have a, a bunch of clumps. This can be quantified using the Tumbre uh, parameter, which basically quantifies is a ratio between rotational support and gravitational collapse. So if you have large gas fractions, that implies a large uh, density of the gas, then you have low Q. Low Q means instability, so then you have that fragmentation, so you have clumps. But what about angular momentum? That's a quantity I'm more interested about. Well, first of all, we know that this is a very fundamental quantity in the universe. Systems tend to rotate, that's just the nature of, of things. Uh, in terms of galaxies, it can give you an alternative to the Hubble sequence. So you can classify galaxies not just by the way they look, but also by the kinematic state. Uh, the rotation of a galaxy sets the size and thickness of a disk, and it can induce other scaling relations. So it's a very fundamental quantity in galaxy evolution. So this is a little, uh, a very oversimplified um, explanation of galaxy formation. Fred Hoyle, who should get a lot of credit for tidal torque theory, um, you know, in this, in this framework, you have some protohalos of dark matter, and because of gravitational collapse, they come together. So you end up having um, um, a halo with a net rotation. And regardless of how slow that rotation is, when gas cools and collapses onto the center of the halo, you end up having a rotationally supported disk because of the conservation of angular momentum and because it inherits the angular momentum of the halo. So that's how you get a galactic disk. This is obviously oversimplified and this is in isolated conditions. Um, now, we know from observations, but also from simulations that angular momentum is a quantity that increases with cosmic time. Um, there are many processes that can explain this. And if you go back to these two criteria, you can see that if you uh, quantify the stability of a disk in terms of global quantities, you see you end up having a relationship between angular momentum and Q. So if you have higher angular momentum, you have more stable disk. So that it plays together with it, uh, this view of this evolution of galaxies from clumpy systems to, to ordered uh, disks. You can, all, you can put them all together, uh, relate the gas fractions and the uh, angular momentum and try to get a more, uh, let's say, a proper understanding of the stability of a system, but this requires a lot of measurements that we don't really have yet at high pressure. So how do we measure angular momentum? This is a complicated quantity to measure because it's, uh, you know, it's a three body system, 3D body system. So you actually need to measure the velocity and the mass uh, in the whole uh, system. Initially, it's an integrated quantity that you need to uh, have in the three dimensions, but that's not the reality. We, we get a projection in the sky of the systems. So you can estimate the mass profile, which in this case it's, um, here we go. So rho, which is the mass distribution, you can estimate it from photometry. You have need to use some assumptions. And for the velocities, you can use integral field spectroscopy. Integral field spectroscopy allows you to measure the velocity in each of the pixels that you can uh, resolve. Now at high redshift, this was only doable with the biggest telescopes, with the BLT and CAC, and also for the photometry with HST. Now it's possible with JWST. Um, the, the issue is that these galaxies are very faint, so you need really big dishes to, to do this. Uh, and then you have other problems, which I'll talk about in the following slides. Now, this here is an approximation that has been used in many studies. Uh, it's commonly known as, as the fault relation. So it's, you can estimate the stellar specific angular momentum of the system by multiplying three factors. So Kn basically comes from the Cersic profile of the system. 
the effective radius and a velocity at a certain uh, radius. With these three quantities, you can estimate J. Of course, this is an approximation. So when a system is very complicated and there's not a lot of symmetry, then we have some problems. Now, most of the current kinematic studies have been done using KMOS. KMOS is a great instrument that has given us statistics for hundreds of galaxies. We have been able to measure the kinematics, understand how they are supported by either rotation or, or velocity dispersions. Uh, but the problem is that this is a sync limited instrument. Sync limited means that the, the, the information you get is uh, kind of suffers from the turbulence of the atmosphere. So you end up having a uh, uh, large beam size, which means the resolution is rather low. Uh, of course, you can still do a lot of great science with it, with it but they, they can't really resolve the properties of the galaxies properly. So there are a lot of uncertainties in these types of relationships. Now, what can you do? Well, you can use adaptive optics. Adaptive optics, for those who are not familiar with it, it's a set of very highly sophisticated techniques in which you basically correct for the aberrations caused by the atmosphere. And you do that by using either a guide star or a laser to sense the turbulence of the atmosphere, correct that with a computer, use a deformable mirror, and fix that in real time. It's really fantastic. It's amazing. I have an animation later if you want to see it. Uh, but overall, what you can do with adaptive optics is that you can increase the resolution. So on the left, you can see what the galactic center looks like with and without AO. Now for galaxies at high redshift, that implies that, so for example, you have a, a galaxy with sync limited. This is the size of the beam. This is another one. In this case, once you use adaptive optics, you, you can see that the size of the beam decreases quite a lot, and then you can start distinguishing on other features. So that actually gives you much better information about the kinematics of the system. Uh, the problem with adaptive optics is that uh, it, it comes with a cost. Usually the throughput of the light is lower, so the signal to noise is effectively lower. So these observations are more expensive, they are more complex. And that's why the majority of the surveys at high redshift, which are here in, in circles, are sync limited. So no AO means sync limited. As you can see, the size of the circle uh, indicates the size of the surveys. And only a few, the squares, are uh, with adaptive optics. Very few systems. Um, yeah, and then you have the numbers there. So the technique that I used during the PhD was basically combining the two. There was a set of uh, galaxies for which we had both natural seeing observations with KMOS, but also we tried to get the adaptive optics counterparts of the same galaxies. Why? Because with those, you increase the resolution, you can distinguish better the kinematic state of the system, and you can measure rotation curves much better. Because in the inner part, even though the, throughput, the signal to noise is lower, you can distinguish better uh, the, the features in the inner part. And with sync limited, you can go further out. So this way you can study rotation curves with more detail. The combination method, I won't go into too many details, but it's uh, similar to Galpac 3D or Dismal Pi, in which you do some kinematic modeling. In my case, I developed my own code in which I create a model cube. I convolve separately for the two different resolutions. And then I um, extract velocities and compare to the input data. This is all from H alpha uh, mission and kinematics. And then you de derive the best model. This is the, the code that is up on GitHub if you want to have, have a look. So the combination has great advantages. As I mentioned before, you can distinguish better the, the rotation curves in the inner part of a galaxy where the signal is lower. You can apply the proper smoothing and dealing with the different PSFs. Uh, you, you can deal better with the alignment of the images, etc. So it, it really gives you a lot of power in terms of you know, getting the proper kinematic measurement of these systems. This is for the PSF modeling. When you have adaptive optics, you have to model it well. So the Eridis kernel or model represents the AO correction, so the diffraction limited part of the PSF. And the MOFAD gives you the leftover um, aberrations from the atmosphere. So this is just one example of how we the, dealt with the PSFs. So let, let, let's go back and let's actually talk about the questions that, you know, that I was trying to answer. So, First of all, with this technique and what I was trying to do, can we assess better the incidence of disks or mergers? Can we actually distinguish which galaxies are properly disks and which ones were polluting the same limited surveys? Can we measure angular momentum with, with precision? Is this technique going to help and give us better estimates of J? We assume that's the case. And then I highlight the third one because this is something that came with as a, a surprise. It was a result that happened and I will show you why which is the slope in the J versus M relation. This is the, the commonly known as the fall relation. Uh, 
Uh, and it's because we found a slope that deviates from the commonly found slope. Uh, this is just an example again of the, uh, the, the method for the photometry, for the, um, the mass light profile, we can estimate it from the HST photometry. And then from the 3D integral, you can eventually uh, calculate J in this form. But this assumes that you have axisymmetry. And that's why in this case, you can only apply this for disks. So this is a critical part of my work, distinguishing which galaxies are actually disks in which these approximations hold. And then you can apply this method to measure their angular momentum content. I had a very great sample. I was very happy about this because I had access to great facilities like Keck, HST data, and also VLT. Before I joined MPE, they kindly provided the data for me. So that was amazing. And overall, I had 41 galaxies uh, in total in this redshift uh, range. And I, I was able to identify 26 disks. Um, this is sort of consistent with the previous studies that were finding disk fractions of the redshift. Uh, but these were the only systems where I could actually reliably calculate the angular momentum, 26 out of uh, 41. Now, this is the result that I was highlighting before, which is whenever you study angular momentum, you usually study this relation because it's a very important relation in, in galaxies. It sort of follows naturally from the Taliquishi relationship and it provides benchmarks for simulations. Uh, if you simulate galaxies, they are supposed to follow this relation that you have established observationally really well. In the local universe, it's been established that the slope of this relationship is uh, two thirds. This has been using great surveys with H1 that go very far in the outskirts of the galaxies. Uh, in my case, I found a very shallow slope. The slope that I found is uh, 0.26. Initially, I thought maybe there was a systematic maybe was an issue with my data, but eventually I realized that perhaps this is pointing into something uh, interesting. Maybe the slope of the pole relation is different at high redshift. Uh, is this an issue with resolution, the method? Is it because these galaxies are clumpy, et cetera? So as I found this result, I went to the literature and I realized that there was something that was uh, usually done at high pressure. So if you can see in these uh, studies at the bottom, many of them um, sometimes measure the normalization of the slope, but, but, but fix the slope to follow the same slope as in the local universe. I think that's a reasonable assumption because in the local universe it's been found, even at redshift, even 0.8 or one, it's been found to follow a similar relation. So they did this. In other studies, they also allowed the slope to vary when they did the fit, but the vast majority of them were using the approximation that I mentioned at the beginning, right? And again, this is a reasonable assumption. You cannot resolve the properties of these galaxies with great details, so you have to use some assumptions. So in my case, I was using both adaptive optics and natural sync data. I was using only the disks, and I was not using uh, that approximation, but instead using an integrated uh, measurement. So I hope my measurements are a bit more accurate. So that's why I was, I, I, I thought, okay, maybe this is pointing to something that's worth following up on. Uh, I did some experiments. And for example, if, if I include the irregular systems, so the 41 galaxies in the fit, immediately I get a steeper slope. That's the red line, okay? If I use the approximation, again, I get a steeper slope. So this is at least indicating that those methods and that, that there is indeed some bias in those methods. I'm not saying my method is perfect, but this is pointing into something. Maybe the fact that we, if we include all the irregular systems, many of them which are have low masses, immediately that uh, steepens the, the slope. So I think that that is an interesting uh, experiment. I'm not going to go into detail into these two slides, but the other thing I did was quantify the clumpiness of all these galaxies. We tried to see if there was a correlation between clumps and the slope. Um, I didn't really find anything in terms of the clumps or the concentration. So concentration, I didn't call it bulge to total ratio because I, I think for these type of data and for the limitations that I had, I think it was, it's hard to call it like that. So I just measured the concentration by measuring the flux in the inner part of the galaxy. And again, I didn't find a clear correlation in terms of the, the slope. However, I found some things that uh, were expected. For example, the fact that galaxies with larger bulges or more concentration tend to have lower angular momentum, but that was, again, expected. This was not an isolated result. So I saw this study from uh, Du et al. 2022, uh, following the illustrious TNG simulations, they were studying the fault relation and they find that a high redshift, a high redshift the slope tends to get, become shallower as well. Uh, arguing that 
perhaps the growth of these like structures uh, established that set zero uh, only happened at ratio be, uh, below one. Now, this was a bit of a tricky thing to do in the paper, but it was we're trying to argue from, you know, from physical interpretation, um, how is this possible? Why would galaxies at higher redshift have a different scaling in the pole relation? Um, so following some assumptions of CDM halos and using abundance matching, I calculated the, the, the halo mass of these systems and the angular momentum retention factor, which is basically just the ratio between the stellar angular momentum and the angular momentum of the halo. And in both cases, as a, as a function of halo mass and stellar mass, it seems like um, the low mass halos tend to retain more angular momentum. And this perhaps could be explained by the fact that there's so much gas accretion happening at high redshift. And these the dissipative effects that are enhanced because of these large reservoirs, combined with the fact that maybe outflow, uh, outflow uh, sorry, uh, feedback driven outflows could remove angular momentum from the low mass galaxies. That could perhaps explain why the low mass halos are able to retain more angular momentum. And perhaps that's the reason why we are finding a, a different slope. Of course, we have 26 disks. So this is a, something that is limited by the data. But if we have the best quality of the data that we have so far, and we want to improve it, perhaps this is interesting following up on. So, uh, in that regard, we're trying to do even more sophisticated modeling. So try to do parametric modeling, try to impose proper priors into the modeling. This MALPI is now public. This is a kinematic fitting code, similar to Calpac 3D in the parametric nature. So please feel free to use it or ask me or Stavros some questions about it. Uh, increase the sample sizes and even with better data. Now the Galfis project at MPE, in which we use ARIS for the PLT, it's a great near infrared uh, IFU, so we improve the spectral resolution and the spatial resolution. And now with JWST, I'm also part of a project in which we are measuring the kinematics of galaxies of redshift one and redshift three. So I think it's important to further investigate th that slope and not assume the same slope follows the, the, the local relations. Um, of course, there's a lot to do. And I think uh, at least the feedback that I've gotten from the paper has been quite positive so far. So I'm excited about that. And I think this is eventually, but probably in the long future, try to understand better the disk instabilities, uh, combining the angular momentum and the gas fractions of some of these systems. But that will require more time and more large surveys. Uh, I will leave you with my conclusions and any questions? Thank you, very nice talk. Uh, we have plenty of time for discussion, so I hope people have questions. Yes, good, three questions, very good. Hi, amazing talk, okay. Um, one question you said, okay, if I understood correctly, that if you have a lower mass galaxy, it tends to retain its angular momentum. So naively, I would think that if you have stellar feedback in a low mass galaxy, why would this, the, why the, the, the feedback driven outflows would take away low angular momentum gas? I mean, what I would expect is that if you have a, a, a low mass galaxy, that maybe the, the feedback driven outflow would destroy uh, the disk structure, or I don't know, they, they would take away angular momentum. Whereas if you have like a more massive galaxy, uh, the stellar feedback would not do such a harm. I don't know. I mean, yeah. I'm completely naively thinking this. No, I think that's, that's a very good question. Um, I would say that perhaps this has to do with the, the potential in these galaxies in which if you have um, galaxies with enough uh, stellar mass and, and halo mass, the, the feedback driven outflows will um, redistribute angular momentum, but it wouldn't completely remove that material from the galaxy. So you have some fountains, you have some um, outflows that eventually come back into the galaxy. And it's one of the reasons why angular momentum increases with, with cosmic time. It's, it's argued that perhaps the, some of this material comes back into the halo and gains angular momentum when it comes back. But if you have a low mass halo, perhaps this is enough to remove the material with low angular momentum, but not completely destroy the galaxy. So again, it's, 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 it's a, interesting interpretation that we're trying to argue with this and 
try to be very careful with the, in the paper trying to say, look, this is just a bit of a interpretation. We have limited data, but this could be the mechanism. Thank you very much. Thank you for a nice talk. Uh, I just wondered if you ever discussed some environmental effects of angular, oh, on the angular momentum of galaxies, because it seems like a cosmic web uh, controlling the angular momentum of galaxies. Yes, so the, the, these systems were chosen to be isolated systems. They are not in environments. So from the observational point of view, we didn't have much to, to play with. Uh, and in terms of, yeah, the, the, I guess the, the theory the discussion, I think there's there's little we can say, especially given the, the complexities of these high redshift systems, without knowing any prior information about their environment. So, yeah. Okay, thank you. Uh, it's more a clarification than a question. So J star is the angular momentum of the stars? Uh, yes. So, that good question. So, I forgot to mention, but it's a this is all based on H alpha. So this is the ionized gas kinematics. So we are following the assumption that this is also tracing the kinematics of the stars. Now we know that that is not necessarily entirely true. And even in local universe, there are many studies showing some systematic differences. But at high redshift, it's what we can do. We can't really get stellar kinematics. Maybe perhaps with JWST, now it's possible with some galaxies, but not at this redshift, because you need very uh, good uh, continuum detections. So it's the assumption that the ionized gas is tracing the stellar kinematics. Yeah. Okay. So I had a question related to the first question you got also, and also related to this being emission lines. Um, mm -hmm. So the, the dynamics of ionized gas will also depend on, on other physical processes like uh, star, form, star formation, uh, winds and, mm -hmm. and and feedback that you mentioned already. But, uh, so is there something that you have to worry about in the measurements? Uh, yeah. Is there any correction that you can do? Or how do you compare this to the true angular momentum of the stars, for example? Did you see any, did you see any effect that you, could pin, that you could say this is probably due to to other physical processes? Well, so for example, we didn't really have any evidence of outflows in these systems. And I think now with better data with ARIS, because we're following up on some of these galaxies, we're starting to see that you know, there are some parts of the galaxy that have more complex kinematic features. With the data that we had back then and the spe spectral resolution especially, it was hard to, to distinguish those things. So I think this is still relying on those basic assumptions. And I don't think we could say more than that. Than that. I think that, that's the problem. That's the limitation. Even though this was spectacular data using KEC, BLT, HST, it still has a lot of limitations. I mean, this is 9 billion years ago. So the, the data currently is still is good. But we need to take certain assumptions. And that's the type of thing that we want to be careful with, you know, going, uh, quoting the proper uncertainties and saying that uh, there are limitations on this. So, so for example, one thing that you could do is, is to look at the the galaxies that are forming more stars and see if there is an effect on, the, on those galaxies that, that you see. Because if, if you have very bright young stars, you will have more stronger stellar winds, stronger stellar feedback, and that, that could be affecting the measurements. So for example, you found, you found that the, the most massive galaxies have lower angular momentum, right? Yeah. Yeah. So maybe these these galaxies are forming lots of stars right now, lots of stars right now, mm -hmm. and and then the measurement of the of the of the rotation of the angular momentum from the ionized gas is affected by these stellar winds. Yeah. Yeah. I, I mean, I, and in principle, that's possible. You can resolve the star formation based on the the distribution of H alpha. Uh, yeah, we didn't do that. I think that's that's a good that's a good idea. Um, well, but the one thing we did, uh, at least as a, as, a, as a check, was to compare the continuum light from the broadband imaging from HST with the H alpha maps, H alpha intensity maps. And there was a very good correlation there, at least showing that there, was not, there were no regions that were perhaps, as you said, more, uh, let's say, much more active. Uh, but it was just like a visual comparison. But I think that, that's a good point. Yeah. Question. Hi, oh, thank you for the talk, it was very clear. I was wondering about the clumping morphology because I think uh, with James Webb data, apparently um, 
they've been finding more disks and higher redshifts, right? So if you still expect this transition to happen around redshift one to three, or if this clump morphology can be just observational limitations, you know? And if that's the case, how do you think this could affect your results? Mm -hmm. Well, I think the motivation remains in the sense that, that we are still, even though we're still finding rotational supported systems and, we, and with JWST, our disk fractions remain super high, even at higher redshift. I think the, the morphology itself, it still shows these clumpy morphologies. And I think the, the, the question of, you know, what is driving this evolution to smooth disks and what are the main ingredients and how, what's the role of angular momentum in this mix, I think remains. So I don't think it would change much, but I agree that, that now with JWST, I guess the question is changing as, as to when, when does it really happen? Like when are galaxies this clumpy? Because it's, it, JWST is just showing us that it's higher and higher redshift. Everything is higher redshift, more massive, more complex, more, you know. Any further questions? If not, let's thank Juan again. Okay. Okay, so this is the last talk of the day, uh, but you're not ready yet because there's going to be a lot of math, uh, I heard. Uh, not, not as much anymore, but it'll uh, be fine. Yeah. Right. So we have Paula Gerginescu now talking to us uh, about action-based dynamical modeling of M31 like stellar halos. We have five minutes left. Um, thanks everyone for having me here. I'm Paula and I'm a postdoc at Durham University, but I just started there two weeks ago. So today I'll be talking about some of the work that I've been doing as part of my PhD at the University of, of Surrey. So um, Gaia has offered us invaluable information about our own Milky Way and we now have the most precise map of position of, uh, and velocities of stars within the Milky Way. So why am I interested in then looking at the Andromeda galaxy? Well, for, 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 for starters, uh, the, our Milky Way is just one of the many disky spiral galaxies uh, in our universe. So from that point of view, Andromeda offers us a complementary uh, uh, data point to study how uh, spiral galaxies evolve and how, um, yeah. So it just gives us an additional data point, but because of its proximity, and we are not hindered by the fact that we are inside the galaxy. So now we have a panoramic view of both the disk and the halo. And it just so happens that it is, the disk is also at a very nice inclination on the sky. So it gives us an almost edge on view of the disk, which is always very good when we study external, uh, when we study disks in, ex in external galaxies. So Andromeda is like the next obvious step that bridges near and far field um, uh, galactic studies. So um, that is why I'm focusing on this galaxy in my PhD, but I never actually got to apply it to real data in M31, but that's a different story. Um, so what do I want to learn about, about uh, galaxies like this? Is it's, I want to constrain the total um, mass distribution of the galaxy, both seen and unseen. So I'm also particularly interested in constraining the total dark matter distribution, but as well as not just like how much dark matter mass it is, but also the flattening of the stellar halo and like the scale radius and the scale uh, density. But I also want to characterize the phase space distribution of my tracer population of stars, which in my case is the stellar halo. And uh, I do this using a dynamical modeling approach, which uses distribution functions, which are 
functions of actions. And I will get into that in a second. But what I want to do is I want to learn the underlying gravitational potential, so the total galactic potential that these stars, um, uh, that this, the stellar halo stars live in, because there's the stellar orbits are shaped by how this gravitational potential looks like. But we have to make, when we do dynamical modeling, we do have to make quite a few assumptions to make our problem determinable. But one of the main assumptions is that of uh, dynamical equilibrium, which I will get back to um, uh, a bit later in my talk. So for the rest of the talk, I will be talking about what distribution functions are, what action angle variables are, and why they are good variables to use as coordinates of your phase space, and therefore as to have as arguments of our distribution function. And then I will show you some of the main results of uh, ap applying them to M31-like stellar halos within the Auriga simulation suite. So what is a distribution function? Because there's so many stars in galaxies, it's not worthwhile to keep track of orbits of each individual star. So it is then advisable to try to come up with a more statistical approach. So the distribution function essentially gives you the probability of finding a star at a certain point in phase space. So if your phase space is defined by position and velocities, then you have a six dimensional phase space, x, y, z, v, x, v, y, v, z, and then your star will be at a certain uh, time at a certain position in this phase space. And, the, uh, and um, if you look at an infinitesimally small volume and you count how many uh, in this phase space and you count how many stars you have, and then would divide it by the total number of stars in your system, you get a measure of the value of your distribution function at that point. And because um, distribution functions are probabilistic in nature, the way they evolve, they do it such that they uh, uh, preserve the probability. So the probability flow uh, the, the, yeah, so the flow of the probability fluid in phase space must obey the continuity equation. And from that, we get to one of the very important equations in galactic dynamics, which is mainly the collisionist Boltzmann equation. But the main takeaway from this, this one is that I want you to see that it relates the distribution function to the total potential in the galaxy to the kinematics of the tracers within the galaxy. And next, I will talk about the action angle variables. And the motivation uh, beyond this is, is trying to find the right coordinate system to use. Because if you use a suitable coordinate system, it often greatly simplifies the physics problems you're trying to, to use. And we, when we have uh, observations of stars, we have access to position and velocities of stars. But these change with time and not, are not always as helpful. So choosing something that is an integral of motion uh, might be a bit more um, helpful and it can give us uh, more insight into the system we're trying to investigate. So actions are integrals of motions and they also, it, um, their, their um, canonical coordinates counterpart, the angle variables, their time evolution will give you the frequency of the orbit of oscillation, which we're many times more interested in than the exact shape of the orbit. Um, and action ang uh, actions are also constant along an orbit. So that means that um, a set of actions uh, is enough to describe an entire orbit. When you do it in position and velocity space, you kind of need like not infinite many points, but you need like the whole trajectory. But, but yeah, um, integrals of these actions are just usually three numbers in axis symmetric system is enough to describe an entire orbit. And this is the way we calculate them. So you need to take my word for it, but that this is the best way to calculate the expression of actions. Um, so for example, if uh, we were to look at something called the radial action, the way you would compute this is you would loop or, um, along your whole orbit. And then if we're looking to calculate, say, a radial action, then your Q would be the radial um, uh, coordinate and then P would be the conjugate momentum. So the momentum along the R direction. And then, uh, the, uh, and then they have to obey Hamilton's equations, but because they're uh, integrals of motion, the time evolution of the action must give you zero. And the angle coordinate counterpart, the, its time evolution will give you the frequency, one of the fundamental frequencies of your orbit. Um, and for axis symmetric system, which are of interest for galaxies, because many galaxies exhibit this axis symmetric symmetry, they have, oh, well, the PDF has kind of mushed things together, but um, they have a somewhat straightforward physical interpretation in that, that the JR action gives you a measure of how radial your orbit is. Uh, the vertical action gives you a measure of how 
far up above your plane of symmetry, which is the Z0 plane, your star wanders. And J5 quantifies the degree of prograde or retrograde motion, but it also is a measure of, um, it's equal to the angular momentum above the Z uh, axis. And another very nice property of actions is that they are adiabatically invariant. So that means that if your very your potential in an adiabatic way, actions are preserved. So that makes them a good starting point for perturbation theory. So you can determine like how your system, what the actions uh, that describe your system are when you assume like, for example, equilibrium, and then you can perturb your system and then um, try to understand how, uh, how that changes the behavior uh, of it, but actions are preserved. So that's quite useful to use then. Um, and when we're looking at just the last bit of intuition for this would be if we look at um, orbit. So let's take the purple orbit as a reference. It has a set of JR, JZ, J phi actions. But for example, if we keep JZ and J phi constant, but now we vary, um, uh, sorry, we keep JZ and J phi constant, but we vary JR. So let's say we half it. Uh, then what happens is that the radial extent changes only, but the wandering about the Z plane stays the same. And now if we impose a condition that JR has to be um, zero, then we get circular orbits. And now we do the same exercise, but now we just vary uh, JZ, but keep JR constant. We see that we change the vertical extent that this orbit reaches. And this motivates the use of actions as arguments of dfs. You can have the, x in, the distribution functions in terms of just position and velocities, but actions tend to be a bit more useful. Um, and now finally applying it to um, one of the, the papers of my PhD in which I look at M31 like stellar halos within the Riga simulation suite. And what I mean by M31 is that they had a similar mass to M31, but more importantly, they had a very busy major history as opposed to the Milky Way and the recent major merger that created structures that pollute, pollute that introduces uh, many structures that are in, not in dynamic equilibrium or non-phase makes many strings within the stellar halo because that would challenge your dynamic equilibrium assumption that I talked about in the beginning. And I wanna see how suitable these uh, DF modeling tools still are for these kind of halos. And uh, in this work, first, I assume that I know the full 60 phase space information of the star. So I assume that I know exactly the position and velocities. And my underlying model assumes that the potential of the galaxy is um, well approximated by just uh, having a bolded disk and a dark matter halo that has the following shapes. So I'm gonna be interested in constraining parameters such as the scale radius of the dark matter, the scale density, also the flattening of the dark matter, but also the total mass of the bulge and the disk. And this is the distribution function that I will use. It doesn't matter exactly why it looks the way it does, but what it, it has been designed to be a double power law that is suitable for um, structures that are uh, spheroidal slash more dispersion dominated. And the parameters that I'm interested in are these weights here that control the weights of the action. So this essentially allow you to control at the same time, the density and the kinematics of your tracer population. But it also allows, it's flexible enough to also allow, allow for an overall rotation of your components. We can have stellar halos that have um, rotation, but it also doesn't make assumptions about things such as spherical symmetry. So essentially at the same time, when you vary these coefficients, you vary everything, including the flattening of your system. And um, we use a Bayesian fitting approach to fit for these parameters of interest. So we use MCMC and the data input is position and velocities that are converted to actions given a, a potential. And the likelihood in our Bayesian approach is the distribution function itself because we motivated that it has a probabilistic nature. So it makes sense to use it as our likelihood. And I've analyzed quite a few our Riga halos, but uh, I'm just gonna show you the results for halo 23 because the, the trend is preserved for all of them. So essentially we get the same level of um, goodness of fit. So for halo 23 on the left hand side, you can see the dark matter distribution, uh, the enclosed mass profile of the dark matter. And then on the left hand side of that of the total mass of the galaxy. Uh, and the blue line is the true profile from the Auriga simulation. And then the black line is the um, line of best fit, if you will. And then the gray lines are the confidence intervals. So we see that we do recover the mass distributions like quite well to quite, quite good accuracy within 10% error. 
Um, and this is the kinematics of the tracers used. So um, this is the velocity dispersions in the cylindrical coordinates. And I think here you can notice that we have um, yeah, the best fit line gives a good fit of the overall shape and it, and it can reproduce well like the um, initial, like the velocity dispersion at uh, what would be r equals zero, but not exactly. But the blue line shows some features that are undulations and spikes that are not reproduced by our model. But these are actually signs of structures that have not phase mixed yet or are not in dynamical equilibrium. So they will not be reproduced by a model. They cannot be reproduced of our model. And that's one of the shortcomings of assuming dynamical equilibrium, but it still reproduces the overall trend slash envelope quite um, well. So that's, that is good. And um, I don't know how much time I have left. But yeah, okay, cool. Then I can talk about the next thing that I've done that's gonna soon come out is the second paper of the series in which now we, that we know that our uh, dynamical model works well in principle in an idealized case of knowing your full 60 phase space information. Now we want to see what happens when you have missing coordinates, which is the case for external galaxy. So now we can only have access to essentially your position on the sky, which I assume that then you know your XV position, the XY position, and only like the, I assume that you have spectra. So you do know your um, velocity along the line of sight. So that's the only information you have. But I also wanted to see what effect the inclination of the galaxy on, uh, with respect to the line of sight has on your recovered properties. And um, here is, here, are, here is applying the same dynamical model to the same Auriga 23 halo and looking at the total, this is the, um, no, this is the dark matter enclosed mass for the Auriga 23. And we can see that the fits are getting worse than compared to the full 60 phase space. And that is to be expected, but it's not just that. Inclination plays a role as well. So you get better fits when you see the you get the best fits for your dark matter profile when you see the galaxy, when you look at the galaxy edge on and the worst ones when you look at the galaxy face on, you get something intermediate at an intermediate angle in the middle. And um, it, when we look at the kinematics, we also see that the inclination plays a role, but it's more intuitive to understand what happens here because for example, if we look at the velocity dispersion along the Z direction, what do we expect is to get the best constraint when we look at the, so, yeah, so for the vertical velocity component, when it is aligned with our line of sight, then we expect to get the best constraint, which we do, which is the blue line there at the top, and the worst constraint when it's completely misaligned with your line of sight. So that means that our model works because that's the trend that we find. Uh, but it doesn't necessarily explain why the enclosed mass um, is, varying like the the goodness of it for the enclosed mass is varying in um in, in, in the way the way it does in these plots when you vary the inclination as well but it still recovers the fit we still get a pretty good um uh account of like the dark matter mass budget within the galaxy so um the takeaway from my talk which ended up a bit earlier than I plan to, is that the developed action-based dynamical models, which, um, yeah, what I've done throughout my PhD, seems that it's complex and flexible enough to fit for M31-like stellar halos and M31-like galaxies, which are, have quite disturbed stellar halos. So even though the dynamical equilibrium assumption is quite challenged, and we do use stars that are part of substructure, as well as stars that are part of what we would consider a smooth stellar halo, it doesn't affect the fit very much. Um, uh, the fact that they're not in dynamical equilibrium, so that is good. But because I know this is a workshop about disks and I have not talked about this very much, this same methodology can be applied uh, just as well to disk, but you just have to change your distribution function to one that is suitable um, for uh, disks. And there are analytical ones that are already available to be used. And uh, missing phase space information also plays a role and inclination effects are important. And it is good to do tests, mock tests, uh, and to study these effects on cosmological simulations before applying them to real data. And also uh, uh, the dynamical models use uh, make minimal assumptions about stuff uh, like spherical symmetry. So we don't assume that we can use um, individual tracers, so it avoids binning of the data. So that means you can maximize the information that you get from the data sets. And that's particularly valuable in external galaxies where data is already quite 
scars. Um, and you make no assumptions about what you expect your velocity distribution to be like. So in principle, by varying the coefficients of your action, the distribution function, and if, you, if you're in phase space, your velocity ellipsoids can take any arbitrary shape. So you don't make any assumptions about, um, about uh, that either or about uh, the mass distribution either. But, uh, yeah, thank you. Very clear, Paula. Thank you very much. Uh, do we have questions? Yes, Daniel. So, could you elaborate uh, about the choice of the distribution function? Because it's it's a choice, so because training. Uh, so um, I don't see why we, we have to do right. to take this this choice. Uh, yeah, so this double power law has been designed in such a way that it um, is suitable for dispersion dominated systems. So you can either, so it's more of like um, the original paper that derives this is a bit of a guesswork. So it's not, it's trying to say that, okay, I want my system to not, for example, if I were to design it to fit for a disk, I would want to impose certain constraints on how the vertical velocity dispersion should look like in asymptotic cases with respect to, to, to the radial one. So essentially, if you have a very thin disk, you will want it to be very small compared to the radial one. Here, um, you want it to, uh, you want to allow it to at the same time have um, like any arbitrary velocity distribution shape, but also it allows for the density profile to like take any arbitrary shape. So essentially, in principle, you could use this to fit for a disk. Um, it would just make it would just cr make sure that the, the velocity dispersions uh, that are suitable to your data would satisfy the relations that they have to satisfy. Mm -hmm. So this is the I think this is one of the most general ones. This this one can fit for any shape, essentially, and or any kinematics. Take uh, just an expansion and with different orders and then. Uh... Why would this approach not be? Oh, uh, why well, you don't take an exponential for an expansion? So, oh, an exponential uh, uh, expansion um, of uh, in power of of j or so. Um, I guess you can do that, but I don't think. Uh, I mean, this is this is a power law, so you could expand this power law. I think, mm -hmm. yeah, you can use an expansion of your power law. Yeah. Uh, so we, I don't think you need to necessarily do that, but you also have components that. You don't want to be um, power law like. So, for example, the one that can trace the overall rotation of your um, of your component. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but you can expand that. Yeah. Okay, we have uh, Francesca first. Uh... Thanks, Paula. Really, really interesting. Um, I'm inter I was interested in the second um, part where you were talking about when you don't have the full 60 phase space information. Um, so you, you mentioned the effect of inclination, yes, here. So I, I'm wondering, could you elaborate a little bit why, I mean, when you're talking about the effect of inclination, I'm guessing you're talking about the inclination of the disk, but you're using um, distribution function for the halo and mm -hmm. the, the halo stars as the tracer. So why does, um, the inclination of the disk affects so much. Yeah, so essentially why that it's not the inclination of the disk, that's more like the plane of symmetry. Why does how I look at the stellar halo matter? And that's a good question because I did not expect it to matter. But it turns out the stellar halo is not as spherically symmetric as you would think it is. And when the spheric assumption of spherical symmetry is broken, then the way you look at the direction along you look at your component matters because some you get some information when you look at it uh, from one direction and then you don't get that information when you look at it from another direction but then you get other information so essentially if you were to do something like an mri scan of your stellar of your component that is not spherically symmetric you will be able to reconstruct it but in this case that is not true because the spherical symmetry um is broken so can i ask a follow-up question yeah would this um change if you made a cut at larger or smaller radii for example where the shape of the halo might change um sorry if, um, where the shape of that might change with the shape of the halo might change so if you if you maybe cut i don't know if you took only the outer halo or the inner halo where it might be more or less spherical 
could this um, be alleviated to some extent? Yeah, so it depends what question you're trying to answer. So in this case, if you want to look at the enclosed mass profile and you can confidently pick a portion of your stellar halo that you can say it has exhibits a greater degree of spherical symmetry and rotation doesn't matter. It can have overall rotation and still be spherically symmetric and then try to, and then decide that I'm only going to model this part using my DF, then yeah, I think it wouldn't um, matter. But when you use a DF's approach like this, at the same time you constrain the potential, but also the distribution of your stellar tracers. And I try to go as far out as possible to, uh, because I'm interested in like the entire halo. But yeah, essentially, if yeah, you can pick um, your more inner part of your halo, that it's not guaranteed that that will be more spherically symmetric. But let's assume that it is, and you have more data available there. And then yeah, you can just have fewer free parameters in the, your DF to fit, and that might improve the way you constrain the total enclosed mass. But uh, it's not necessarily clear, yeah. Okay, thanks. And am I correct then in, in interpreting this as basically if you have an if you're looking at it from the edge on kind of perspective, then the best you can do when you don't have full 60 face space information is still of the order of like 10 percent ish. Is that correct? Your errors? Are yeah, I mean, the best fit line is mm, so for the yeah, so for the blue case, so for when you look at it face on, that's the worst and that's over. 50%, but uh, within confidence intervals. But yeah, for the edge on case, then yeah, it's still within 10. I mean, the confidence intervals are very, very broad here, but this is up to two sigma, but your best fit line, yeah, lies within still within 10, 20%, which is still reasonable, I'd say, yeah. Thanks. Hi, uh, I, I think I missed something at the beginning. So you started saying that you include some components there was a disk and a bulge am i wrong um uh, the, the potential has a, a disk and a bulge component yeah so probably it's a dumb question i do not actually not actually understand how does it work so because if you assume uh, a distribution function in principle you can integrate over velocity get the density and from the poisson equation the gravitational potential um, yeah so I think I know what wasn't clear there. No, the distribution function is only for the trace, tracers because you have uh, you use stars that uh, live in this potential that you want to constrain, but they act as tracers. So the distribution function describes this tracer population, but the potential in which you calculate the action must reflect the total potential in which the stars live, and that will have the disk and the bulge and the dark matter halo. Yeah, sorry, that wasn't clear. Thank you. Any further questions from anyone? So I have the pleasure to have the last question. So um, would you say, is it doable to try and do this with, uh, with IFU data of nearby galaxies? Like for example, if you have a resolution of 100 parsecs, let's say for nearby galaxies with mu's, so you have, you know, you have the line of sight velocity and a position where you have Lots of stars there. And I'm, I'm, I'm working on that, yeah. Sorry? I'm working to see ah, you're working how on well that. it does All with right. IFU data. Essentially, you have to marginalize once more. So what you do when you go from 60 to 3D, you just marginalize over your unknown coordinates. And you marginalize your likelihood over your unknown coordinates. What you have to do here is in an additional integral and marginalize over even more of your, because now you have, you don't know your, you don't have like individual velocities, but you have distribution of velocities. Um, but and I, I want to see how well you can do that, but that will be applied to disks, where it's a, it's a bit more straightforward to, to do. But um, the problem here is a bit more technical. The problem here will be the fact that when you do marginalization, so essentially you compute an integral, you would then, if you can, yeah, you, when you compute that integral, at each integral step, you have to compute actions. And actions are very expensive to compute, especially in a, uh, in, in, in a potential that is not spherically symmetric. And then that means that the computational times to get a fit are like unreasonable. I'm talking about months and still not getting a fit. So that was one of the issues I had through my PhD. And then what do you do? Um, you sacrifice your, the resolution of your integral in a way. Then you don't have infinite resolution. You don't have like a thousand, ten thousand steps in your integral. You go to, you have fewer, but then, then why the results were so slow to come out is then, then I wanted to test 
how low I can get in the resolution step of my integral and still get meaningful results. And that is something that I think will be problematic for IFU type data with action-based modeling unless I can find a way to speed up action computation. Um, and I've been talking to some people that seem to get things to be sped up a bit, but it's still, yeah, that, that conceptually is not difficult to make the jump from what I have to that. But um, tech, from a technical point of view, it would just be very expensive. Sounds promising, <laughs> nevertheless. Uh, so. Yeah. Well, just a comment or a question. However, when you work with action angle variables, somehow you imply that you uh, deal with nearly integrable systems, right? Sorry? You deal with nearly integrable systems. Yeah, locally. So yeah. in the real galaxies, this is not everywhere a uh, good approximation. You have areas that uh, chaos is yes. there and then... Exactly, yeah. and that was a concern, yeah. but... And that's what I was trying to see when I was doing all these mocks and cos uh, tests on cosmological simulation. Does it still do well? And it does. And action-based me methods have been used also for the disk of the Milky Way. There has been a lot, like a, some work done on that. And ev like, we wouldn't be able to get the results if the system was as non-integrable as I think it is. So what it, when you compute actions, what happens is that your action computation tool assumes that locally, your potential is of a Steckel form and then computes the would-be action in the Steckel potential. If the, the system would be so far off from a Steckel potential, then you would get non-actions or your results would be meaningless. Like you would get fits, but they will not resemble the galaxy you're trying to model at all. And this is why I've never got to apply it to the real data because I wanted to be sure that what I do get is like accurate or meaningful. And that's why I went from mocks that were in dynamical equilibrium are very easy mocks to deal with. And then I went to cosmological simulations and then I investigated the missing coordinates effect. And now, now it can be, now, now we can go to real data. But yeah, no, that, that was a good question. That, that, yeah, I was worried about the same things. Yeah. All right, so just, just to conclude my thought before, I, one of the applications I was thinking is to, to measure the vertical thickness of the disk, for example, in a galaxy that is not, uh, that you, where you don't see it, maybe with action angles. Then you want a galaxy that is face on. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. but then, um, yeah, if, if, the, the second paper with the missing coordinates effect looks at what happens when you model a disk, a disk at various inclinations and what happens to the total enclosed mass profile that you get uh, from the galaxy. So when you view it edge on and the disk is very thin, then you get the best constraint. And when you see it face on, it's very bad for your total enclosed mass and that's a bit worrying. But what you want to look at is that the disk itself, so not the, you, you don't want to constrain the total potential of the galaxy. Yeah. And then if you want to look, yeah, if you want to look at the, the rate, the, the sigma Z essentially, um, then you want it to be as face on as possible. That's, yeah. Okay, uh, I guess there are no more questions. So this is it for today. Uh, this is the end of the first day and then I'll see you tomorrow morning. Thank you. Always I remind you that the speakers uh, give the talk to the technicians uh, to arrange all details for their presentation. Always you are a little bit earlier here to talk with uh, our colleagues. What? Somebody is charging his uh, mobile, or is just the?